Chapter One of A Girl the Limber Lost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patience Charles. A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. To all girls of the Limber Lost in general, and one Jeanette Helen Porter in particular. Characters. Elnora, who collects moths to pay for education and lives the golden rule. Philip Ammon, who assists in moth hunting and gains a new conception of love. Mrs. Comstock, who lost a delusion and found a treasure. Wesley Sinton, who always did his best. Margaret Sinton, who mothers Elnora. Billy, a boy from real life. Edith Carr, who discovers herself. Hart Henderson, to whom love means all things. Polly Ammon, who pays an old score. Tom Levering, engaged to Polly. Terence O'More, freckles grown tall. Mrs. O'More, who remained the angel. Terence, Alice, and little brother, the O'More children. Chapter 1 Wherein Elnora goes to high school and learns many lessons not found in her books. "'Elnora Comstock, have you lost your senses?' demanded the angry voice of Catherine Comstock as she glared at her daughter. "'Why, mother?' faltered the girl. "'Don't you why, mother me?' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You know very well what I mean. You've given me no peace until you've had your way about this going to school business. I fixed you good enough, and you're ready to start. But no child of mine walks the streets of Onabasha looking like a play-actress woman.' You wet your hair and comb it down modest and decent, and then be off, or you'll have no time to find where you belong. Elnora gave one despairing glance at the white face, framed in a most becoming riot of reddish-brown hair, which she saw in the little kitchen mirror. Then she untied the narrow black ribbon, wet the comb and plastered the waving curls close to her head, bound them fast, pinned on the skimpy black hat, and started for the back door. "'You've gone so plumb daffy you're forgetting your dinner,' jeered her mother. "'I don't want anything to eat,' replied Elnora, without stopping. "'You'll take your dinner, and you'll not go one step. "'Are you crazy? "'Walk nearly three miles and no food from six in the morning until six at night. "'Pretty figure you'd cut if you had your way about things. "'And after I've gone and bought you this nice new pail and filled it as special for the first day.' Elnora came back with a face still whiter and picked up the lunch. "'Thank you, mother. Good-bye,' she said. Mrs. Comstock did not reply. She watched the girl down the long walk to the gate and out of sight on the road, in the bright sunshine of the first Monday of September. "'I bet a dollar she gets enough of it by night,' Mrs. Comstock said positively. Elnora walked by instinct, for her eyes were blinded with tears. She left the road where it turned south at the corner of the Limberlost, climbed a snake fence, and entered a path worn by her own feet. Dodging under willow and scrub oak branches, she at last came to the faint outline of an old trail made in the days when the precious timber of the swamp was guarded by armed men. This path she followed until she reached a thick clump of bushes. From the debris in the end of a hollow log, she took a key that unlocked the padlock of a large, weather-beaten old box, inside of which lay several books, a butterfly apparatus, and an old cracked mirror. The walls were lined thickly with gaudy butterflies, dragonflies, and moths. She set up the mirror, and once more pulling the ribbon from her hair, she shook the bright mass over her shoulders, tossing it dry in the sunshine. Then she straightened it, bound it loosely, and replaced her hat. She tugged vainly at the low brown calico collar and gazed despairingly at the generous length of the narrow skirt. She lifted it as she would have liked it to be cut if possible. That disclosed the heavy leather high shoes at sight of which she looked positively ill and hastily dropped the skirt. She opened the pail, took out the lunch, wrapped it in the napkin and placed it in the small pasteboard box. Locking the case again, she hid the key and hurried down the trail. She followed it around the north end of the swamp and then struck into a footpath crossing a farm in the direction of the spires of the city to the northeast. Again she climbed a fence and was on the open road. For an instant she leaned against the fence, staring before her, 
then turned and looked back. Behind her lay the land on which she had been born to drudgery and a mother who made no pretense of loving her. Before her lay the city, through whose school she hoped to find means of escape and the way to reach the things for which she cared. When she thought of how she looked, she leaned more heavily against the fence and groaned. When she thought of turning back and wearing such clothing and ignorance all the days of her life, she set her teeth firmly and went hastily toward Onabasha. At the bridge crossing a deep culvert at the suburbs, she glanced around, and then kneeling she thrust the lunch box between the foundation and the flooring. This left her empty-handed as she approached the great stone high school building. She entered bravely and inquired her way to the office of the superintendent. There she learned that she should have come the week before and arranged for her classes. There were many things incident to the opening of school, and one man unable to cope with all of them. "'Where have you been attending school?' he asked, as he advised the teacher of the cooking department not to telephone for groceries until she saw how many she would have in her classes, wrote an order for chemicals for the students of science, and advised the leader of the orchestra to try to get professional to take the place of the bass violist reported suddenly ill. "'I finished last spring at Brushwood School, District Number 9,' said Elnora. "'I've been studying all summer. I'm quite sure I can do the first-year work if I have a few days to get started.' "'Of course, of course,' assented the superintendent. "'Almost invariably country pupils do good work. "'You may enter first year, and if you don't fit, we will find it out speedily. "'Your teachers will tell you the list of books you must have, "'and if you will come with me, I will show you the way to the auditorium. "'It is now time for opening exercises. "'Take any seat you find vacant.' "'He was gone. "'Elnora stood before the entrance and stared into the largest room she ever had seen.' The floor sloped down to a yawning stage on which a band of musicians, grouped around a grand piano, were tuning their instruments. She had two fleeting impressions. That was all a mistake. This was no school, but a grand display of enormous ribbon bows, and the second, that she was sinking and had forgotten how to walk. Then a burst from the orchestra nerved her, while a bevy of daintily clad, sweet-smelling things, that might have been birds, or flowers, or possibly gaily dressed happy young girls, pushed her forward. She found herself plodding across the back of the auditorium, praying for guidance to an empty seat. As the girls passed her, vacancy seemed to open to meet them. Their friends were moving over, beckoning and whispering invitations. Everyone else was seated, but no one paid any attention to the white-faced girl stumbling half-blindly down the aisle next to the farthest wall. So she went on to the very end facing the stage. No one moved, and she could not summon courage to crowd past others to several empty seats she saw. At the end of the aisle, she paused in desperation as she stared back at the whole forest of faces, most of which were now turned upon her. In one burning flash came the full realization of her scanty dress, her pitiful little hat and ribbon, her big heavy shoes, her ignorance of where to go or what to do and from a sickening wave which crept over her, she felt she was going to become very ill. Then, out of the mass, she saw a pair of big brown boy eyes, three seats from her, and there was a message in them. Without moving his body, he reached forward and, with a pencil, touched the back of the seat before him. Instantly, Elnora took another step which brought her to a row of vacant front seats. She heard the giggle behind her, the knowledge that she wore the only hat in the room burned her. Every matter of moment, and some of none at all, cut and stung. She had no books. Where should she go when this was over? What would she give to be on the trail going home? She was shaking with a nervous chill when the music ceased, and the superintendent arose and, coming down to the front of the flower-decked platform, opened a Bible and began to read. Elnora did not know what he was reading, and she felt that she did not care. Wildly, she was racking her brain to decide whether she should sit still when the rest left the room, or follow, and ask someone where the freshman went first. In the midst of the struggle, one clean-cut sentence fell on her ear. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Elnora began to pray frantically. Hide me, O oh God, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Again and again she implored that prayer, and before she realized it was coming, everyone had risen and the room was emptying rapidly. 
Elnora hurried after the nearest girl and in the press at the door touched her sleeve timidly. "Will you please tell me where the Freshmen go?" she asked huskily. The girl gave her one surprised glance and drew away. "Same place as the fresh women," she answered, and those nearest her laughed. Elnora stopped praying suddenly and the color swept into her face. "I'll wager you are the first person I meet when I find it," she said and stopped short. "Not that! Oh, I must not do that!" she thought in dismay. "Make an enemy the first thing I do. Oh, not that!" She followed with her eyes as the young people separated in the hall some climbing stairs, some disappearing down side halls, some entering doors nearby. She saw the girl overtake the brown-eyed boy and speak to him, and he glanced back at Elnora, and now there was a scowl on his face. Then she stood alone in the hall. Presently, a door opened, and a young woman came out and entered another room. Elnora waited until she returned and hurried to her. "'Would you tell me where the freshmen are?' she panted. Straight down the hall, three doors to your left, was the answer as the girl passed. One minute, please, oh please, begged Elnora. Do I knock, or just open the door? Go in and take a seat, replied the teacher. What if there aren't any seats, gasped Elnora. Classrooms are never half-filled. There will be plenty, was the answer. Elnora removed her hat. There was no place to put it, so she carried it in her hand. She looked infinitely better without it. After several efforts, she at last opened the door and, stepping inside, faced a smaller and more concentrated battery of eyes. "'The superintendent sent me. He thinks I belong here,' she said to the professor in charge of the class, but she never before heard the voice with which she spoke. As she stood waiting, the girl of the hall passed on her way to the blackboard, and suppressed laughter told Elnora that her thrust had been repeated." "'Be seated,' said the professor, and then because he saw Elnora was desperately embarrassed, he proceeded to loan her a book and to ask her if she had studied algebra. She said she had a little, but not the same book they were using. He asked her if she felt that she could do the work they were beginning, and she said she did. That was how it happened, that three minutes after entering the room she was compelled to take her place beside the girl who had gone last to the board, and whose flushed face and angry eyes avoided meeting Elnora's. Being compelled to concentrate on her proposition, she forgot herself. When the professor asked that all pupils sign their work, she firmly wrote, Elnora Comstock, under her demonstration. Then she took her seat and waited with white lips and trembling limbs, as one after another the professor called the names on the board, while their owners arose and explained their propositions, or flunked if they had not found a correct solution. She was so eager to catch their forms of expression and prepare herself for her recitation, that she never took her eyes from the work on the board until clearly and distinctly, "'Alnora Cornstalk,' called the professor. The dazed girl stared at the board. When tiny curl added to the top of the first curve of the M in her name had transformed it from a good old English patronymic that any girl might bear proudly to cornstalk. Elnora stared speechless. When and how did it happen? She could feel the wave of smothered laughter in the air around her. A rush of anger turned her face scarlet and her soul sick. A hot answer was on her lips. The voice of the professor addressed her straightly. This proposition seems to be beautifully demonstrated, Miss Cornstalk, he said. Surely you can tell us how you did it. That word of praise saved her. She could do good work. They might wear their pretty clothes, have their friends make life a greater misery than it ever before had been for her, but not one of them should do better work or be more womanly. That lay with her. She was tall, straight, and handsome as she arose. Of course I can explain my work she said in natural tones. What I can't explain is how I happened to be so stupid as to make a mistake in writing my own name. I must have been a little nervous. Please excuse me. She went to the board, swept off the signature with one stroke, then without a tremor she rewrote it clearly. My name is Comstock, she said distinctly. She returned to her seat and following the formula used by the others, made her first high school recitation. The face of Professor Henley was a study. As Elnora took her seat, he looked at her steadily. "'It puzzles me,' he said deliberately. 
how you can write as beautiful a demonstration, explain it as clearly as ever has been done in any of my classes, and still be so disturbed as to make a mistake in your own name. Are you very sure you did that yourself, Miss Comstock? It is impossible that anyone else should have done it, answered Elnora steadily. I am very glad you think so, said the professor. Being freshmen, all of you are strangers to me. I should hate to begin the year with you feeling there was one among you small enough to do a trick like that. The next proposition, please. When the hour was gone, the class filed back to the study room, and Elnora followed in desperation because she did not know where else to go. She could not study, as she had no books, and when the class again left the room to go to another professor for the next recitation, she went also. At least they could put her out if she did not belong there. Noon came at last, and she kept with the others until they dispersed on the sidewalk. She was so abnormally self-conscious, she fancied all the hundreds of that laughing throng saw and jested at her. When she passed the brown-eyed boy walking with the girl of her encounter, she knew, for she heard him say, Did you really let that gawky piece of calico get ahead of you? The answer was indistinct. Elnora hurried from the city. She intended to get her lunch, eat it in the shade of the first tree, and then decide whether she would go back or go home. She knelt on the bridge and reached for her box, but it was so very light that she was prepared for the fact that it was empty before opening it. There was just one thing for which to be thankful. The boy, or tramp, who had seen her hide it, had left the napkin. She would not have to face her mother and account for its loss. She put it in her pocket and threw the box into the ditch. Then she sat on the bridge and tried to think, but her brain was confused. Perhaps the worst is over, she said at last. I will go back. What would Mother say to me if I came home now? So she returned to the high school, followed some of the pupils to the coat room, hung her hat, and found her way to the study where she had been in the morning. Twice that afternoon, with aching head and empty stomach, she faced strange professors in different branches. Once, she escaped noticed. The second time, the worst happened. She was asked a question she could not answer. "'Have you not decided on your course and secured your books?' inquired the professor. "'I have decided on my course,' replied Elnora. "'I do not know who to ask for my books.' "'Ask?' the professor was bewildered. "'I understood the books were furnished,' faltered Elnora. "'Only to those bringing an order from the township trustee,' replied the professor. "'No, oh no!' cried Elnora. "'I will get them tomorrow.' and gripped her desk for support, for she knew that was not true. Four books, ranging perhaps at a dollar and a half apiece. Would her mother get them? Of course she would not, could not. Did not Elnora know the story by heart? There was enough land, but no one to do clearing and farm. Tax on all those acres, recently the new gravel road tax added, the expense of living and only the work of two women to meet all of it. She was insane to think she could come to the city to school. Her mother had been right. The girl decided that if only she lived to get home, she would stay there and lead any sort of life to avoid more of this torture. Bad as what she wished to escape had been, it was nothing like this. She never could live down the movement that went through the class when she inadvertently revealed the fact that she had expected her books to be furnished. Her mother would not get them. That settled the question. But the end of misery is never in a hurry to come. For before the day was over, the superintendent entered the room and explained that pupils from the country were charged a tuition of twenty dollars a year. That really was the end. Previously, Elnora had confessed a dozen wild plans for securing the money for books, ranging all the way from offering to wash the superintendent's dishes to breaking into the bank. This additional expense made the thing so wildly impossible that there was nothing to do but hold up her head until she was out of sight. Down the long corridor, alone among hundreds, down the long street, alone among thousands, out into the country she came at last. Across the fence and field, along the old trail once trodden by a boy's bitter agony, now stumbled a white-faced girl, sick at heart. She sat on the log and began to sob in spite of her efforts at self-control. At first, it was physical breakdown. Later, thought came crowding. Oh, the shame, the mortification! Why had she not known of the tuition? How did she happen to think that in the city books were furnished? Perhaps it was because she had read they were in several states. But why did she not know? Why did not her mother go with her? Other mothers, 
but when had her mother ever been or done anything at all like other mothers? Because she never had been, it was useless to blame her now. Elnora felt she should have gone to town the week before, called on someone and learned all these things herself. She should have remembered how her clothing would look before she wore it in public places. Now she knew and her dreams were over. She must go home to feed chickens, calves, and pigs, wear calico and coarse shoes, and pass a library with a verdant head all her life. She sobbed again. "'For pity's sake, honey, what's the matter?' asked the voice of the nearest neighbor, Wesley Senton, as he seated himself by Elnora. "'There, there,' he continued, smearing tears all over her face in an effort to dry them. "'Was it so bad as that now? Maggie has been just about wild over you all day. She's got nervouser every minute. She said we were foolish to let you go. She said your clothes were not right, you ought not to carry that tin pail, and that they would laugh at you. By gum, I see they did.' "'Oh, Uncle Wesley,' sobbed the girl. "'Why didn't she tell me?' "'Well, you see, Elnora, she didn't like to. "'You got such a way of holding up your head and going through with things. "'She thought some way that you'd make it till you got started. "'Then she begun to see a hundred things we should have done. "'I reckon you hadn't reached that building before she remembered "'that your skirt should have been pleated instead of gathered, "'your shoes been low and lighter for hot September weather, and a new hat. "'Were your things right, Elnora?' The girl broke into hysterical laughter. Right, she cried. Right, Uncle Wesley, you should have seen me among them. I was a picture. They'll never forget me. No, they won't get the chance, for they'll see the same things tomorrow. Now that is what I call Spunk Elnora, downright grit, said Wesley Senton. Don't you let them laugh you out. You've helped Margaret and me for years at harvest and busy times. What you've earned must amount to quite a sum. You can get yourself a good many clothes with it. "'Don't mention clothes, Uncle Wesley,' sobbed Elnora. "'I don't care now how I look. "'If I don't go back, all of them will know "'it's because I'm so poor I can't buy my books.' "'Oh, I don't know as you're so drad and poor,' "'said Sinton meditatively. "'There are three hundred acres of good land "'with fine timber as ever grew on it. "'It takes all we can earn to pay the tax, "'and Mother wouldn't cut a tree for her life.' "'Well, then, maybe I'll be compelled to cut one for her,' "'suggested Sinton. Anyway, stop tearing yourself to pieces and tell me. If it isn't clothes, what is it? It's books and tuition, over twenty dollars in all. Hum, first time I ever knew you to be stumped by twenty dollars, Elnora, said Sinton, patting her hand. It's the first time you ever knew me to want money, answered Elnora. This is different from anything that ever happened to me. Oh, how can I get it, Uncle Wesley? Drive to town with me in the morning and I'll draw it from the bank for you. I owe you every cent of it. You know you don't owe me a penny, and I wouldn't touch one from you unless I really could earn it. For anything that's passed, I owe you and Aunt Margaret for all the home life and love I've ever known. I know how you work, and I'll not take your money. Just alone, Elnor. Just alone for a little while until you can earn it. You can be proud with all the rest of the world, but there's no secrets between us, is there, Elnor? No, said Elnor. There are none. You and Aunt Margaret have given me all the love there has been in my life. That is the one reason above all others why you shall not give me charity. Hand me money because you find me crying for it. This isn't the first time this old trail has known tears and heartache. All of us know that story. Freckles stuck to what he undertook and won out. I stick too. When Duncan moved away, he gave me all Freckles left in the swamp, and as I have inherited his property, maybe his luck will come with it. I won't touch your money, but I'll win some way. First, I'm going home and try mother. It's just possible I could find second-hand books, and perhaps all the tuition need not be paid at once. Maybe they would accept it quarterly. But, oh, Uncle Wesley, you and Aunt Margaret keep on loving me. I'm so lonely, and no one else cares. Wesley Sinton's jaws met with a click. He swallowed hard on bitter words and changed the thing he would have said three times before it became articulate. Elnora, he said at last, if it hadn't been for one thing, I'd have tried to take legal steps to make you ours when you were three years old. Maggie said then it wasn't any use, but I've always held on. You see, I was the first man there, honey, and there are things you see that you can't ever make anybody else understand. She loved him, Elnora. She just made an idol of him. There was that oozy green hole with a thick scum broke and two or three big bubbles slowly rising that were the breath of his body. 
There she was in spasms of agony, and beside her the great heavy log she tried to throw him. I can't ever forgive her for turning against you and spoiling your childhood as she has, but I couldn't forgive anybody else for abusing her. Maggie has got no mercy on her, but Maggie didn't see what I did, and I've never tried to make it very clear to her. It's been a little too plain for me ever since. Whenever I look at your mother's face, I see what she saw, so I hold my tongue and say, in my heart, give her a mite more time. Some day it will come. She does love you, Elnora. Everybody does, honey. It's just that she's feeling so much she can't express herself. You be a patient girl and wait a little longer. After all, she's your mother, and you're all she's got but a memory, and it might do her good to let her know that she was fooled in that. It would kill her, cried the girl swiftly. Uncle Wesley, it would kill her. What do you mean? Nothing, said Wesley Senton soothingly. Nothing, honey. That was just one of them fool things a man says when he is trying his best to be wise. You see, she loved him mightily, and they'd been married only a year, and what she was loving was what she thought he was. She hadn't really got acquainted with the man yet. If it had been even one more year, she could have borne it, and you'd have got justice. Having been a teacher, she was better educated and smarter than the rest of us, and so she was more sensitive-like. She can't understand she was loving a dream. So I say it might do her good if somebody that knew could tell her, but I swear to gracious I never could. I've heard her out the edge of that quagmire calling in them wild spells of hers off and on for the last sixteen years and imploring the swamp to give him back to her, and I've got out of bed when I was pretty tired and come down to see she didn't go in herself or harm you. What she feels is too deep for me. I've got to respect in her grief and I can't get over it. Go home and tell your ma, honey, and ask her nice and kind to help you. If she won't, then you got to swallow that little lump of pride in your neck and come to Aunt Maggie like you've been a-coming all your life. I'll ask, Mother, but I can't take your money, Uncle Wesley. Indeed, I can't. I'll wait a year and earn some and enter next year. There's one thing you don't consider, Elnora, said the man earnestly, and that's what you are to Maggie. She's a little like your ma. She has to given up to it, and she's struggling on brave. But when we buried our second little girl, the light went out of Maggie's eyes, and it's not come back. The only time I ever see a hint of it is when she thinks she's done something that makes you happy, Elnora. Now you go easy about refusing her anything she wants to do for you. There's times in this world when it's our bounden duty to forget ourselves and think what will help other people. Young woman, you owe me and Maggie all the comfort we can get out of you. There's the two of our own we can't ever do anything for. Don't you get the idea into your head that a fool thing you call pride is going to cut us out of all the pleasure we have in life beside ourselves. Uncle Wesley, you are a dear, said Elnor, just a dear. If I can't possibly get that money any way else on earth, I'll come and borrow it of you, and then I'll pay it back if I dig ferns from the swamp and sell them from door to door in the city. I'll even plant them so that they will be sure to come up in the spring. I have been sort of panic-stricken all day and couldn't think. I can gather nuts and sell them. Freckles sold moths and butterflies, and I've a lot collected. Of course I'm going back tomorrow. I can find a way to get the books. Don't you worry about me. I am all right. Now what do you think of that? inquired Wesley Sinton of the swamp in general. Here's our Elnora. Come back to stay. Head high and ride as a trivet. You've named three ways in three minutes that you could earn ten dollars, which I figure would be enough to start you. Let's go to supper and stop worrying. Elnora unlocked the case, took out the pail, put the napkin in it, pulled the ribbon from her hair, binding it down tight again, and followed out to the road. From afar she could see her mother in the doorway. She blinked her eyes and tried to smile as she answered Wesley Senton, and indeed she did feel better. She knew now what she had to expect, where to go, and what to do. Get the books she must. When she got them, she would show those city girls and boys how to prepare and recite lessons, how to walk with a brave heart. And they could show her how to wear pretty clothes and have good times. As she neared the door, her mother reached for the pail. I forgot to tell you to bring home your scraps for the chickens, she said. Elnora entered. There weren't any scraps, and I'm hungry again as I ever was in my life. I thought likely you would be, said Mrs. Comstock, and so I got supper ready. We can eat first and do the work afterward. What kept you so? I expected you an hour ago. Elnora looked into her mother's face and smiled. It was a queer sort of a little smile and wouldn't have reached the depths with any normal mother. 
"'I see you've been bawling,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I thought you'd get your fill in a hurry. "'That's why I wouldn't go to any expense. "'If we keep out of the poorhouse, we have to cut the corners close. "'It's likely this brushwood road tax will eat up all we've saved in years. "'Where the land tax is to come from, I don't know. "'It gets bigger every year. "'If they are going to dredge the swamp ditch again, "'they'll just have to take the land to pay for it. "'I can't, that's all.' We'll get up early in the morning and gather and hold the beans for winter and put in the rest of the day hoeing the turnips. Elnora again smiled that pitiful smile. Do you think I didn't know that I was funny and would be laughed at? She asked. Funny, cried Mrs. Comstock hotly. Yes, funny, a regular caricature, answered Elnora. No one else wore calico, not even one other. No one else wore high heavy shoes, not even one. No one else had such a funny little old hat. My hair was not right, my ribbon invisible compared with the others. I did not know where to go or what to do, and I had no books. What a spectacle I made for them. Elnora laughed nervously at her own picture. But there's always two sides. The professor said in the algebra class that he never had a better solution and explanation than mine of the proposition he gave me, which scored one for me in spite of my clothes. Well, I wouldn't brag on myself. That was poor taste, admitted Elnora. But, you see, it is a case of whistling to keep up my courage. I honestly could see that I would have looked just as well as the rest of them if I had been dressed as they were. We can't afford that, so I have to find something else to brace me. It was pretty bad, Mother. Well, I'm glad you got enough of it. Oh, but I haven't, hurried in Elnora. I just got to start. The hardest is over. Tomorrow they won't be surprised. They will know what to expect. I am sorry to hear about the dredge. Is it really going through? Yes, I got my notification today. The tax will be something enormous. I don't know as I can spare you, even if you are willing to be a laughing stock for the town. With every bite, Elnora's courage rose, for she was a healthy young thing. You've heard about doing evil that good might come from it, she said. Well, mother mine, it's a little like that with me. I'm willing to bear the hard part to pay for what I'll learn. Already I have selected the ward building, which I shall teach in about four years. I am going to ask for a room with a south exposure, so that the flowers and moths I bring in from the swamp to show the children will do well. You little idiot, said Mrs. Comstock. How are you going to pay your expenses? Now that is just why I was going to ask you, said Elnora. You see, I have had two startling pieces of news today. I did not know I would need any money. I thought the city furnished the books, and there is an out-of-town tuition also. I need ten dollars in the morning. Will you please let me have it? Ten dollars, cried Mrs. Comstock. Ten dollars? Why don't you say a hundred and be done with it? I could get one as easy as the other. I told you, I told you I couldn't raise a cent. Every year expenses grow bigger and bigger. I told you not to ask for money. I never meant to, replied Elnora. I thought clothes were all I'd need and I could bear them. I never knew about buying books and tuition. Well, I did, said Mrs. Comstock. I knew what you would run into, but you are so bulldog stubborn and so set in your way, I thought I would just let you try the world a little and see how you liked it. Elnora pushed back her chair and looked at her mother. Do you mean to say, she demanded, that you knew when you let me go into a city classroom and reveal the fact before all of them that I expected to have my books handed out to me? Do you mean to say that you knew I had to pay for them? Mrs. Comstock evaded the direct question. Anybody but an idiot mooning over a book or wasting time prowling the woods would have known you had to pay. Everybody has to pay for everything. Life is made up of pay, pay, pay. It's always and forever pay. If you don't pay one way, you do another. Of course I knew you had to pay. Of course I knew you would come home blubbering. But you don't get a penny. I haven't one cent and can't get one. Have your way if you are determined, but I think you will find the road pretty rocky. Swampy, you mean, Mother, corrected Elnora. She arose, white and trembling. Perhaps some day God will teach me how to understand you. He knows I do not now. You can't possibly realize just what you let me go through today, or how you let me go, but I'll tell you this. You understand enough that if you had the money and would offer it to me, I wouldn't touch it now, and I'll tell you this much more. I'll get it myself. I'll raise it and do it some honest way. I'm going back tomorrow, the next day, and the next. You need not come out. I'll do the night work and hoe the turnips. 
It was ten o'clock when the chickens, pigs, and cattle were fed, the turnips hoed, and the heap of bean vines was stacked by the back door. End of chapter one. Chapter two of A Girl of the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. Wherein Wesley and Margaret go shopping and Elnora's wardrobe is replenished. Wesley Sinton walked down the road a half mile and turned in at the lane leading to his home. His heart was hot and filled with indignation. He had told Elnora he did not blame her mother, but he did. His wife met him at the door. Did you see anything of Elnora, Wesley? she questioned. Most too much, Maggie, he answered. What do you say to going to town? There's a few things has to be got right away. Where did you see her, Wesley? Along the old Limberlost Trail, my girl, torn to pieces, sobbing. Her courage always has been fine, but the thing she met today was too much for her. We ought to have known better than to let her go that way. It wasn't only clothes. There were books and entrance fees for out-of-town people that she didn't know about. While there must have been jeers, whispers, and laughing, Maggie, I feel as if I'd been a traitor to those girls of ours. I ought to have gone in and seen about the school business. I'm no man to let a fatherless girl run into such trouble. Don't cry, Maggie. Get me some supper and I'll hitch up and see what we can do now. What can we do, Wesley? I don't just know, but we've got to do something. Kate Comstock will be a handful, while all Nora will be too. But between us, we must see that the girl is not too hard-pressed about money and that she is dressed so she is not ridiculous. She saved us the wages of a woman many a day. Can't you make her some decent dresses, Maggie? Well, I'm not just what you call expert, but I could beat Kate Comstock all to pieces. I know that skirts should be pleated to the band instead of gathered, and full enough to sit in and short enough to walk in. I could try. There's patterns for sale. Let's go right away, Wesley. Well, set me a bite of supper while I hitch up. Margaret Sinton started for the cupboard when she remembered that Wesley had worked all day and was hungry as usual, so she built a fire, made coffee, and fried ham and eggs. She set out pie and cake and had enough for a hungry man by the time the carriage was at the door, but she had no appetite. She dressed while Wesley ate, put away the food while he dressed, and then they drove toward the city through the beautiful September evening, and as they went, they planned for Elnora. The only trouble was, not whether they were generous enough to get what she needed, but whether she would accept what they got and what her mother would say. They went to a large dry goods store, and when a clerk asked what they wanted to see, neither of them knew, so they stepped to one side and held a whispered consultation. "'What had we better get, Wesley?' "'Dresses,' said Wesley promptly. "'But how many dresses, and what kind?' Plus, if I know, exclaimed Wesley, I thought you would manage that. I know about some things I'm going to get. At that instant, several school girls came into the store and approached them. There, exclaimed Wesley breathlessly. There, Maggie, like them. That's what she needs. Why, like they have. Margaret stared. What did they wear? They were rapidly passing. They seemed to have so much, and she could not decide so quickly. Before she knew it, she was among them. I beg your pardon, but won't you wait one minute? She asked. The girl stopped with wondering faces. It's your clothes, explained Mrs. Sinton. You look just beautiful to me. You look exactly as I should have wanted to see my girls. They both died of diphtheria when they were little, but they had yellow hair, dark eyes, and pink cheeks, and everybody thought they were lovely. If they had lived, they'd been near your age now, and I'd want them to look like you. There was nothing but sympathy in every girl face before Margaret Sinton. Why, thank you, said one of them. We are very sorry for you. Of course you are, said Margaret. Everybody always has been. And because I can't ever have the joy of a mother in thinking for my girls and buying pretty things for them, there is nothing left for me but to do what I can for someone who has no mother to care for her. I know a girl who would be just as pretty as any of you, if she had the clothes, but her mother does not think about her, so I got to mother her son myself. She must be a lucky girl, said another. Oh, she loves me, said Margaret, and I love her. 
I want her to look just like you do. Please tell me about your clothes. Are these the dresses and hats you wear to school? What kind of goods are they, and where do you buy them? The girls began to laugh and cluster around Margaret. Wesley Sinton strode down the store with his head high in pride of her, but his heart was sore over the memory of two little faces under brushwood sod. He inquired his way to the shoe department. "'Why, every one of us have on gingham or linen dresses,' they said, "'and they are our school clothes.' For a few moments there was a babel of laughing voices explaining to the delighted Margaret that school dresses should be bright and pretty, but simple and plain, and until cold weather they should wash. "'I'll tell you,' said Ellen Brownlee, "'my father owns this store and I know all the clerks. I'll take you to Miss Hartley. You tell her just how much you want to spend and what you want to buy, and she will know how to get the most for your money.' I've heard Papa say she was the best clerk in the store for people who didn't know precisely what they wanted. That's the very thing, agreed Margaret. But before you go, tell me about your hair. Elnora's hair is bright and wavy, but yours is silky as hackled flax. How do you do it? Elnora? asked four girls in concert. Yes, Elnora's the name of the girl I want these things for. Did she come to the high school today? questioned one of them. "'Was she in your classes?' demanded Margaret without reply. Four girls stood silent and thought fast. Had there been a strange girl among them, and had she been overlooked and passed by with indifference because she was so very shabby? If she had appeared as much better than they, as she had looked worse, would her reception have been the same? "'There was a strange girl from the country in the freshman class today,' said Ellen Brownlee, "'and her name was Elnora.' "'That was the girl,' said Margaret. "'Are her people so very poor?' questioned Ellen. "'No, not poor at all, come to think of it,' answered Margaret. "'It's a peculiar case. Mrs. Comstock had a great trouble, and she let it change her whole life and make a different woman of her. She used to be lovely. Now she is forever saving and scared to death for fear they will go to the poorhouse. But there is a big farm covered with lots of good timber. The taxes are high for women who can't manage to clear and work the land.' There ought to be enough to keep two of them in good shape all their lives if they only knew how to do it. But no one ever told Kate Comstock anything and never will, for she won't listen. All she does is droop all day and walk the edge of the swamp half the night and neglect Elnora. If you girls would make life just a little easier for her, it would be the finest thing you ever did. All of them promised they would. Now tell me about your hair, persisted Margaret Sinton. So they took her to a toilet counter, and she bought the proper hair soap, also a nail file, and cold cream for use after windy days. Then they left her with the experienced clerk, and when at last Wesley found her, she was loaded with bundles, and the glint of other days was in her beautiful eyes. Wesley carried some packages also. "'Did you get any stockings?' he whispered. "'No, I didn't,' she said. "'I was so interested in dresses and hair ribbons and a—a—' uh, uh, a hat, she hesitated and glanced at Wesley. Of course a hat, prompted Wesley. Then I forgot all about those horrible shoes. She's got to have decent shoes, Wesley. Sure, said Wesley. She's got decent shoes, but the man said some brown stockings ought to go with them. Take a peep, will you? Wesley opened a box and displayed a pair of thick-soled, beautifully shaped brown walking shoes of low cut. Margaret cried out with pleasure. But do you suppose they are the right size, Wesley? What did you get? I just said for a girl of sixteen with a slender foot. Well, that's about as near as I could come. If they don't fit when she tries them, we will drive straight in and change them. Come on now, let's go at home. All the way they discussed how they should give Elnora their purchases and what Mrs. Comstock would say. I'm afraid she will be awful mad, said Margaret Sinton tremulously. She'll just rip, replied Wesley graphically. But if she wants to leave the raising of her girl to the neighbors, she needn't get fractitious if they take some pride in doing a good job. From now on, I calculate Elnora shall go to school. And she shall have all the clothes and books she needs if I go around on the back of Kate Comstock's land and cut a tree, or drive off a calf to pay for them. Why, I know one tree she owns that would put Elnora in heaven for a year. Just think of it, Margaret. It's not fair. One third of what is there belongs to Elnora by law, and if Kate Comstock raises a row, I'll tell her so and see that the girl gets it. 
You go to see Kate in the morning and I'll go with you. Tell her you want Elnora's pattern that you are going to make her a dress for helping us. And sort of hint at a few more things. If Kate box, I'll take a hand and settle her. I'll go to law for Elnora's sake of that land and sell enough to educate her. Why, Wesley Sinton, you're perfectly wild. I'm not. Did you ever stop to think that such cases are so frequent there have been laws made to provide for them? I can bring it up in court and force Kate to educate Elnora and board and clothe her until she's of age, and then she can take her share. Wesley, Kate would go crazy. She's crazy now. The idea of any mother living with as sweet a girl as Elnora and letting her suffer till I find her crying like a funeral, it makes me finding mad, all uncalled for, not a grain of sense in it. I've offered and offered to oversee clearing her land and working her fields. Let her sell a good tree or a few acres. Something is going to be done right now. Elnora's been fairly happy up to this, but to spoil the school life she's planned is to ruin all her life. I won't have it. If Elnora won't take these things, so help me, I'll tell her what she is worth and loan her the money and she can pay me back when she comes of age. I'm going to have it out with Kate Comstock in the morning. Here we are. You open up what you got while I put away the horses and then I'll show you. When Wesley came from the barn, Margaret had four pieces of crisp gingham, a pale blue, a pink, a gray with green stripes, and a rich brown and blue plaid. On each of them lay a yard and a half of wide ribbon to match. They were handkerchiefs and a brown leather belt. In her hands, she held a wide-brimmed, tan, straw hat, having a high crown banded with velvet strips, each of which fastened with a tiny gold buckle. It looks kind of bare now, she explained. It had three quills on it here. Did you have them taken off? asked Wesley dubiously. Yes, I did. The price was two and a half for the hat, and those things were a dollar and a half apiece. I couldn't pay that. It does seem considerable, admitted Wesley, but will it look right without them? No, it won't, said Margaret. It's going to have quills on it. Do you remember those beautiful peacock wing feathers that Phoebe Sims gave me? Three of them go on just where those came off, and nobody will ever know the difference. They match the hat to a moral, and they are just a little longer and richer than the ones that I had taken off. I was wondering whether I had better sew them on tonight while I remember how they set, or wait till morning. Don't risk it, exclaimed Wesley anxiously. Don't you risk it. Sew them on right now. Open your bundles while I get the thread, said Margaret. Wesley sent out the shoes. Margaret took them up and pinched the leather and stroked them. My, but they are pretty, she cried. Wesley picked up one and slowly turned it in his big hands. He glanced at his foot and back to the shoe. It's a little bit of a thing, Margaret, he said softly. Like as not, I'll have to take it back. It don't look as if it could fit. It don't look like it dared do anything else, said Margaret. That's a happy little shoe to get the chance to carry as fine a girl as Elnora to high school. Now, what's in the other box? Wesley looked at Margaret doubtfully. Why, he said, you know there's going to be rainy days, and those things she has now ain't fit for anything but to drive up the cows. Wesley, did you get high shoes too? Well, she ought to have them. The man said he would make them cheaper if I took both pairs at once. Margaret laughed aloud. Those will do her past Christmas, she exulted. What else did you get? Well, sir, said Wesley, I saw something today. You told me about Kate getting that tin pail for Elnora to carry to high school, and you said you told her it was a shame. I guess Elnora was ashamed, all right, for tonight she stopped at the old case Duncan gave her and took out that pail where it had been all day and put a napkin inside it. Coming home, she confessed she was half-starved because she hid her dinner under a culvert and the tramp took it. She hadn't had a bite to eat the whole day, but she never complained at all. She was tickled to death that she hadn't lost a napkin. So I just inquired around till I found this, and I think it's about the ticket. Decent looking and handy as you please. See here now. Wesley opened the package and laid a brown leather lunch box on the table. Might be a couple of books or drawing tools or most anything that's neat and genteel. You see, it opens this way. It did open, and inside was a space for sandwiches, a little porcelain box for cold meat or fried chicken, another for salad, a glass with a lid which screwed on, held by a ring in a corner, for custard or jelly, a flask for tea or milk, a beautiful little knife, fork and spoon fastened in holders, and a place for a napkin. Margaret was almost crying over it. How I'd love to fill it, she exclaimed. Do it the first time just to show Kate Comstock what love is, said Wesley. 
Get up early in the morning and make one of those dresses tomorrow. Can't you make a plain gingham dress in a day? I'll pick a chicken and you fry it and fix a little custard for the cup and do it up brown. Go on, Maggie, you do it. I never can, said Margaret. I'm slow as the itch about sewing, and these are not going to be plain dresses when it comes to making them. There are going to be edgings of plain green, pink, and brown to the bias strips, and tucks and pleats about the hips, fancy belts and collars, and all of it takes time. Then Kate Comstock's got to help, said Wesley. Can the two of you make one and get that lunch tomorrow? Easy, but she'll never do it. You see if she don't, said Wesley. You get up and cut it out, and as soon as Elnora's gone, I'll go after Kate myself. She'll take what I'll say better alone, but she'll come and she'll help make the dress. These other things are our Christmas gifts to Elnora. She'll no doubt need them more now than she will then, and we can give them just as well. That's yours, and this is mine, or whichever way you choose. Wesley untied a good brown umbrella and shook out the folds of a long brown raincoat. Margaret dropped the hat, arose, and took the coat. She tried it on, felt it, cooed over it, and matched it with the umbrella. "'Did it look anything like rain tonight?' she inquired so anxiously that Wesley left. "'And this last bundle,' she said, dropping back in her chair, the coat still over her shoulders. "'I couldn't buy this much stuff for any other woman and nothing for my own,' said Wesley. "'It's Christmas for you too, Margaret.' He shook out fold after fold of soft gray satiny goods that would have looked lovely against Margaret's pink cheeks and whitening hair. "'Oh, you old darling!' she exclaimed and fled sobbing into his arms. But she soon dried her eyes, raked together the coals in the cooking stove, and boiled one of the dress patterns in salt water for a half hour. Wesley held the lamp while she hung the goods on the line to dry. Then she set the irons on the stove so they would get hot the first thing in the morning." End of chapter 2《The Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Wherein Elnora Visits the Bird Woman and Opens a Bank Account. At four o'clock next morning, Elnora was shelling beans. At six, she fed the chickens and pigs, swept two of the rooms of the cabin, built a fire, and put on the kettle for breakfast. Then she climbed the narrow stairs to the attic she had occupied since a very small child, and dressed in the hated shoes and brown calico, plastered down her crisp curls, ate what breakfast she could, and pinning on her hat, started for town. "'There's no sense in your going for an hour yet,' said her mother. "'I must try to discover some way to earn those books,' replied Elnora. "'I am perfectly positive I shall not find them lying along the road, "'wrapped in tissue paper and tagged with my name.' "'She went toward the city as on yesterday. "'Her perplexity as to where tuition and books were to come from was worse, "'but she did not feel quite so badly. "'She never again would have to face all of it for the first time. "'There had been times yesterday when she had prayed to be hidden or to drop dead.' and neither had happened. "'I guess the best way to get an answer to prayer is to work for it,' muttered Elnora grimly. Again she took the trail to the swamp, rearranged her hair, and left the tin pail. This time she folded a couple of sandwiches in the napkin and tied them in a neat, light paper parcel which she carried in her hand. Then she hurried along the road to Onabasha and found a bookstore. There she asked the prices of the list of books that she needed, and learned that six dollars would not quite supply them. She anxiously inquired for second-hand books, but was told that the only way to secure them was from last year's freshmen. Just then, Elnora felt that she positively could not approach any of those she supposed to be sophomores and ask to buy their old books. The only balm the girl could see for the humiliation of yesterday was to appear that day with a set of new books. "'Do you wish these?' asked the clerk hurriedly, for the store was rapidly filling with school children wanting anything from a dictionary to a pen. "'Yes,' gasped Elnora. "'Oh, yes, but I cannot pay for them just now. Please let me take them, and I will pay for them on Friday, or return them as perfect as they are. Please trust me for them a few days.' The clerk looked at her doubtfully and took her name. "'I'll ask the proprietor,' he said. When he came back, Elnora knew the answer before he spoke. "'I'm sorry,' he said, "'but Mr. Hahn doesn't recognize your name. "'You are not a customer of ours, "'and he feels that he can't take the risk. "'You'll have to bring the money.' 
Elnora clumped out of the store with the thump of her heavy shoes beating as a hammer on her brain. She tried two other houses with the same result, and then in sick despair came into the street. What could she do? She was too frightened to think. Should she stay from school that day and canvass the homes appearing to belong to the wealthy and try to sell beds of wild ferns as she had suggested to Wesley Sinton? What would she dare ask for bringing in and planting a clump of ferns? How could she carry them? Would people buy them? She slowly moved past the hotel and then glanced around to see if there was a clock anywhere, for she felt sure the young people passing her constantly were on their way to school. There it stood, in the bank window in big black letters staring straight at her. Wanted. Caterpillars, cocoons, chrysalids, pupa cases, butterflies, moths, Indian relics of all kinds. Highest scale of prices paid in cash. Elnora caught the wicket at the cashier's desk with both hands to brace herself against disappointment. Who is it wants to buy cocoons, butterflies, and moths? she panted. The bird woman, answered the cashier. Have you some for sale? I have some. I do not know if they are what she would want. Well, you had better see her, said the cashier. Do you know where she lives? Yes, said Elnora. Would you tell me the time? Twenty-one after eight, was the answer. She had nine minutes to reach the auditorium, or be late. Should she go to school, or to the bird woman? Several girls passed her walking swiftly, and she remembered their faces. They were hurrying to school. Elnora caught the infection. She would see the bird woman at noon. Algebra came first, and that professor was kind. Perhaps she could slip to the superintendent and ask him for a book for the next lesson, and at noon— Oh, dear Lord, make it come true, prayed Elnora. At noon, maybe she could sell some of those wonderful shining wing things she had been collecting all her life around the outskirts of the Limberlost. As she went down the long hall, she noticed the professor of mathematics standing in the door of his recitation room. When she came up to him, he smiled and spoke to her. I've been watching for you, he said, and Elnora stopped bewildered. For me, she questioned. Yes, said Professor Henley. Step inside. Elnora followed him into the room, and he swung the door behind them. At teacher's meeting last evening, one of the professors mentioned that a pupil had betrayed in class that she had expected her books to be furnished by the city. I thought possibly it was you. Was it? Yes, breathed Elnora. That being the case, said Professor Henley, it just occurred to me as you had expected that you might require a little time to secure them, and you are too fine a mathematician to fall behind for want of supplies. So I telephoned one of our sophomores to bring her last year's books this morning. I'm sorry to say they are somewhat abused, but the text is all here. You can have them for two dollars and pay when you get ready. Would you care to take them? Elnora sat suddenly because she could not stand another instant. She reached both hands for the books and said never a word. The professor was silent also. At last Elnora rose, hugging those books to her heart as a mother grasps a lost baby. One thing more, said the professor. You can pay your tuition quarterly. You need not bother about the first installment this month. Any time in October will do. It seemed as if Elnora's gasp of relief must have reached the souls of her brogans. Did anyone ever tell you how beautiful you are? she cried. As the professor was lank, tow-haired, and so near-sighted that he peered at his pupils through spectacles, no one ever had. No, said Professor Henley, I've waited some time for that, for which reason I shall appreciate it all the more. Come now, or we shall be late for opening exercises. So Elnora entered the auditorium a second time. Her face was like the brightest dawn that ever broke over the Limberlost. No matter about the lumbering shoes and skimpy dress just now, no matter about anything, she had the books. She could take them home. In her garret she could commit them to memory if need be. She could show that clothes were not all. If the bird woman did not want any of the many different kinds of specimens she had collected, she was quite sure now she could sell ferns, nuts, and a great many things. Then, too, someone moved over this morning, and several girls smiled and bowed. Elnora forgot everything save her books and that she was where she could use them intelligently. Everything except one little thing away back in her head. Her mother had known about the books and the tuition, and had not told her when she agreed to her coming. At noon, Elnora took her little parcel of lunch and started to the home of the bird woman. 
she must know about the specimens first and then she would go out to the suburbs somewhere and eat a few bites she dropped the heavy iron knocker on the door of the big red log cabin and her heart thumped at the resounding stroke is the bird woman at home she asked of the maid she is at lunch was the answer please ask her if she will see a girl from the limberlost about some moths inquired elnora i never need ask if it's moths laughed the girl orders are to bring any one with specimens right in come this way elnora followed down the hall and entered a long room with high panelled wainscoting old english fireplace with an overmantel and closets of peculiar china filling the corners at a bare table of oak yellow as gold sat a woman elnora often had watched and followed covertly around the limberlost the bird woman was holding out a hand of welcome i heard she laughed a little pasteboard box or just the bare word specimen passes you at my door if it is ma's i hope you have hundreds i've been very busy all summer and unable to collect and i need so many sit down and lunch with me while we talk it over from the limberlost did you say i live near the swamp replied elnora since it's so cleared i dare go around the edge in daytime though we are still afraid at night what have you collected asked the bird woman as she helped elnora to sandwiches unlike any she ever before had tasted salad that seemed to be made of many familiar things but you were only sure of celery and apples and a cup of hot chocolate that would have delighted any hungry schoolgirl elnora said thank you and set the things before her but her eyes were on the bird woman's face i am afraid i am bothering you for nothing and imposing on you she said that collected frightens me i've only gathered i always loved everything outdoors and so i made friends and playmates of them when i learned that the moths die so soon i saved them especially because there seemed no wickedness in it i have thought the same thing said the bird woman encouragingly then because the girl could not eat until she learned about the moths the bird woman asked elnora if she knew what kind she had not all of them answered elnora before mr duncan moved away he often saw me near the edge of the swamp and he showed me the box he had fixed for freckles and gave me the key there were some books and things so from that time on i studied and tried to take ma's right but i'm afraid they are not what you want are they the big ones that fly mostly june nights asked the bird woman yes said elnora great gray ones with reddish markings pale blue green yellow with lavender and red and yellow what do you mean by red and yellow asked the bird woman so quickly that the girl almost jumped not exactly red explained elnora with tremulous voice a reddish yellowish brown with canary colored spots and gray lines on their wings how many of them it was the same quick question well i had over two hundred eggs said elnora but some of them didn't hatch and some of the caterpillars died but there must be at least a hundred perfect ones perfect how perfect cried the bird woman i mean whole wings no down gone and all their legs and antennae faltered elnora young woman that's the rarest moth in america said the bird woman solemnly if you have a hundred of them they are worth a hundred dollars according to my list i can use all that are whole what if they are not pinned right quavered elnora if they are perfect that does not make the slightest difference i know how to soften them so that i can put them into any shape i choose where are they when may i see them they are in freckles old case in the limberlost said elnora i couldn't carry many for fear of breaking them but i could bring a few after school you come here at four said the bird woman and we will drive out with some specimen boxes and a price list and see what you have to sell are they your very own are you free to part with them they are mine said elnora no one but god knows i have them mr duncan gave me the books in the box he told freckles about me and freckles told him to give me all he left he said for me to stick to the swamp and be brave and my hour would come it has i know most of them are all right and oh i do need the money could you tell me asked the bird woman softly you see the swamp and all the fields around it are so full explained elnora every day i felt smaller and smaller and i wanted to know more and more and pretty soon i got desperate just as freckles did but i am better off than he was for i have his books and i have a mother even if she don't care for me as other girls as mothers do for them it's better than no one the bird woman's glance fell for the girl was not conscious of how much she was revealing 
Her eyes were fixed on the black pitcher filled with goldenrod in the center of the table, and she was saying what she thought. As long as I could go to the Brushwood School, I was happy, but I couldn't go further just when things got the most interesting, so I was bound I'd come to high school and Mother wouldn't consent. You see, there's plenty of land, but Father was drowned when I was a baby, and Mother and I can't make money as men do. The taxes get bigger every year, and she said it was too expensive. I wouldn't give her any rest until at last she got me this dress and these shoes, and I came. It was awful. Elnora stopped short and stared into the bird woman's face. Do you live in that beautiful cabin at the northwest end of the swamp? asked the bird woman. Yes, said Elnora. I remember the place and the story about it now. You entered the high school yesterday? Yes. It was pretty bad? Pretty bad, echoed Elnora. The bird woman laughed. You can't tell me anything about that, she said. I once entered a city school straight from the country. My dress was brown calico, my shoes were quite heavy. The tears began to roll down Elnora's cheeks. Did they? she faltered. They did, said the bird woman, all of it. I am quite sure they did not miss one least little thing. Then she wiped away some tears that began rolling down her cheeks and laughed at the same time. Where are they now? asked Elnora suddenly. Well, they are pretty widely scattered, but none of them have attained heights out of range. Some of the rich are poor, and some of the poor are rich. Some of the brightest died insane, and some of the dullest worked out high positions. Some of the very worst to bear have gone out, and I frequently hear from others. Now I am here, able to remember it, and mingle laughter with what used to be all tears. For every day I have my beautiful work, and almost every day God sends someone like you to help me. What is your name, my girl? Elnora Comstock, answered Elnora. Yesterday on the board it changed to Cornstock, and for a minute I thought I'd die, but I can laugh over that already. The bird woman arose and kissed her. Finish your lunch, she said, and I will get my price list and take down a memorandum of what you think you have, so I will know how many boxes to prepare. And remember this, what you are lies with you. If you are lazy and accept your lot, you may live in it. If you are willing to work, you can write your name anywhere you choose among the only ones who live past the grave in this world. The people who write books that help make exquisite music, carve statues, paint pictures, and work for others. Never mind the calico dress and the coarse shoes. Dig into the books, and before long you will hear yesterday's tormentors boasting that they were once classmates of yours. I could a tale unfold. She laughingly left the room, and Elnora sat thinking until she remembered how hungry she was, so she ate the food, drank the hot chocolate, and began the process of getting a grip on herself. Then the bird woman came back and showed Elnora a long painted slip, giving a list of graduating prices for moths, butterflies, and dragonflies. Oh, do you want them? exulted Elnora. I have a few, and I can get more by the thousand, with every color in the world on their wings. Yes, said the bird woman. I will buy them, also the big moth caterpillars that are creeping everywhere now, and the cocoons that they will spin just about this time. I have a sneaking impression that the mystery, wonder, and the urge of their pure beauty are going to force me to picture and paint our moths and put them into a book for all the world to see and know. We Limberlost people must not be selfish with the wonders God has given to us. We must share with those poor, cooped-up city people the best we can. To send them a beautiful book, that is the way, is it not, little new friend of mine? Yes, oh yes, cried Elnora, and please, God, they find a way to earn the money to buy the books, as I have those I need so badly. I will pay good prices for all the moths you can find, said the bird woman, because, you see, I exchange them with foreign collectors. I want a complete series of the moths of America to trade with the German scientists, another with a man in India, and another in Brazil. Others I can exchange with home collectors for those of California and Canada, so you see I can use all you can raise or find. The banker will buy stone axes, arrow points, and Indian pipes. There is a teacher from the city grade schools here today for specimens. There is a fund to supply the ward buildings. I'll help you get in touch with that. They want leaves of different trees, flowers, grasses, moths, insects, bird nests, and anything about birds. Elnora's eyes were blazing. Had I best go back to school or open a bank account and begin being a millionaire? Uncle Wesley and I have a bushel of arrow points gathered, a stack of axes, pipes, skin dressing tools, tubes and mortars. I don't know how I ever will wait three hours. 
"'You must go or you will be late,' said the bird woman. "'I will be ready at four. After school closed, Elnora, seated by the bird woman, drove to Freckles' old room in the Limperlost. One at a time the beautiful big moths were taken from the interior of the old black case. Not a fourth of them could be moved that night, and it was almost dark when the last box was closed, the list figured, and into Elnora's trembling fingers were paid fifty-nine dollars and sixteen cents. Elnora clasped the money closely. "'Oh, you beautiful stuff!' she cried. "'You are going to buy the books, pay the tuition, and take me to high school.' Then, because she was a woman, she sat on a log and looked at her shoes. Long after the bird woman drove away, Elnora remained. She had her problem, and it was a big one. If she told her mother, would she take the money to pay the taxes? If she did not tell her, how could she account for the books and things for which she would spend it? At last she counted out what she needed for the next day, placed the rest in the farthest corner of the case, and locked the door. She then filled the front of her skirt from a heap of arrow points beneath the case and started home. End of chapter 3「Chapter four, Wherein the Sentences are Disappointed and Mrs. Comstock Learns that She Can Laugh » With the first streak of red above the Limberlost, Margaret Sinton was busy with the gingham and the intricate paper pattern she had purchased. Wesley cooked the breakfast and worked until he thought Elnora would be gone. Then he started to bring her mother. "'Now you be mighty careful,' cautioned Margaret. "'I don't know how she will take it.' "'I don't either,' said Wesley philosophically. "'But she's got to take it some way. "'That dress has to be finished by school time in the morning.' Wesley had not slept well that night. He had been so busy framing diplomatic speeches to make to Mrs. Comstock that sleep had little chance with him. Every step nearer to her he approached his position seemed less enviable. By the time he reached the front gate and started down the walk between the rows of asters and lady slippers, he was perspiring, and every plausible and convincing speech had fled his brain. Mrs. Comstock helped him. She met him at the door. "'Good morning,' she said. "'Did Margaret send you for something?' "'Yes,' said Wesley. "'She sent me for you. She's got a job that's too big for her, and she wants you to help.' "'Of course I will,' said Mrs. Comstock. It was no one's affair how lonely the previous day had been, or how the endless hours of the present would drag. What is she doing in such a rush? Now was his chance. She's making a dress for all Nora, answered Wesley. He saw Mrs. Comstock's form straighten and her face harden, so he continued hastily. You see, Elnora has been helping us at harvest time, butchering and with unexpected visitors for years. We've made out that she saved us a considerable sum, and as she wouldn't ever touch any pay for anything, we just went to town and got a few clothes we thought would fix her up a little for the high school. We want to get a dress done today mighty bad, but Margaret is slow about sewing and she never can finish alone, so I came for you. And it's such a simple little matter, so dead easy and also between old friends like that you can't look above your boots while you explain it, sneered Mrs. Comstock. Wesley sent him. What put the idea into your head that Elnora would take things bought with money when she wouldn't take the money? Then Sinton's eyes came up straightly. Finding her on the trail last night, sobbing as hard as I ever saw anyone at a funeral. She wasn't complaining at all, but she's come to me all her life with a little hearse, and she couldn't hide how she'd been laughed at, twitted and run face to face against the fact that there was books and tuition unexpected, and nothing will ever make me believe you didn't know that, Kate Comstock. If any doubts are troubling you on that subject, sure I knew it. She was so anxious to try the world, I thought I'd just let her take a few knocks and see how she liked it. As if she'd ever taken anything but knocks all her life, cried Wesley Sinton. Kate Comstock, you are a heartless, selfish woman. You've never showed Elnora any real love in her life. If ever she finds out that thing, you'll lose her, and it will serve you right. She knows it now, said Mrs. Comstock icily, and she'll be home tonight just as usual. "'Well, you are a brave woman if you dared put a girl of Elnora's make through what she suffered yesterday, and will suffer again today and let her know you did it on purpose. I admire your nerve, but I've watched this since Elnora was born and I got enough. Things have come to a pass where they go better for her or I interfere. As if you'd ever done anything but interfere all her life. 
Think I haven't watched you? Think I, with my heart raw on my breast and too numb to resent it openly, haven't seen you and Mag sit and trying to turn Eleanor against me day after day? When did you ever tell her what her father meant to me? When did you ever try to make her see the wreck of my life and what I've suffered? No, indeed, always it's been poor little abused Elnor and cakes, kissing, extra clothes, and encouraging her to run to you with a pitiful mouth every time I try to make a woman of her. Kate Comstock, that's unjust, cried Senton. Only last night I tried to show her the picture I saw the day she was born. I begged her to come to you and tell you pleasant what she needed and ask you for what I happen to know you can well afford to give her. I can't, cried Mrs. Comstock. You know I can't. Then get so you can, said Wesley Senton. Any day you say the word, you can sell six thousand worth of rare timber off this place easy. I'll see the clearing and working the fields cheap as dirt, for all Nora's sake. I'll buy you more cattle to fatten. All you've got to do is sign a lease to pull thousands from the ground in oil as the rest of us are doing all around you. Cut down Robert's trees, shrieked Mrs. Comstock. Tear up his land. Cover everything with horrid, greasy oil. I'll die first. You mean you'll let old Nora go like a beggar and hurt and mortify her past bearing. I've got to the place where I tell you plain what I'm going to do. Maggie and I went to town last night, and we got what things El Nora needs most urgent to make her look a little like the rest of the high school girls. Now here it is in plain English. You can help get these things ready and let us give them to her as we want. She won't touch them, cried Mrs. Comstock. Then you can pay us, and she can take them as her right. I won't. Then I will tell El Nora just what you are worth, what you can afford, and how much of this she owns. I'll loan her the money to buy books and decent clothes, and when she is of age, she can sell her share and pay me. Mrs. Comstock gripped a chair back and opened her lips, but no words came. And, Sinton continued, if she is so much like you that she won't do that, I'll go to the county seat and lay complaint against you as her guardian before the judge. I'll swear to what you are worth and how you are raising her, and have you discharged or have the judge appoint some man who will see that she is comfortable, educated, and decent-looking. You, you want it, gasped Mrs. Comstock. I won't need to, Kate, said Sinton, his heart softening the instant the hard words were said. You won't show it, but you do love Elnora. You can't help it. You must see how she needs things. Come, help us fix them and be friends. Maggie and I couldn't live without her, and you couldn't either. You've got to love such a fine girl as she is. Let it show a little. You can hardly expect me to love her, said Mrs. Comstock coldly. But for her, a man would stand back to me now who would beat the breath out of your sneaking body for the cowardly thing with which you threaten me. After all, I've suffered. You dragged me to court and compelled me to tear up Robert's property. If I ever go, they carry me. If they touch one tree or put down one greasy old oil well, it will be over all I can shoot before they begin. Now see how quick you could clear out of here. You won't come and help Maggie with the dress? For answer, Mrs. Comstock looked about swiftly for some object on which to lay her hands. Knowing her temper, Wesley Sinton left with all the haze consistent with dignity, but he did not go home. He crossed the field and, in an hour, brought another neighbor who was skillful with her needle. With sinking heart, Margaret saw them coming. Kay is too busy to help today. She can't sew before tomorrow, said Wesley cheerfully as they entered. That quieted Margaret's apprehension a little, though she had some doubts. Wesley prepared the lunch, and by four o'clock the pretty dress was finished as far as it possibly could be until it was fitted on all Nora. If that did not entail too much work, it could be completed in two hours. Then the neighbor left, and Margaret packed their purchases into the big market basket. Wesley took the hat, umbrella, and raincoat, and they went down to Mrs. Comstock's. As they reached the step, Margaret spoke pleasantly to Mrs. Comstock, who sat reading just inside the door but she did not answer and deliberately turned a leaf without looking up. Wesley sent and opened the door and went in, followed by Margaret. Kate, he said, you needn't take out your mat over our little racket on Maggie. I ain't told her a word I said to you or you said to me. She's not so very strong and she's sewed since four o'clock this morning to get this dress ready for tomorrow. It's done and we came down to try it on all Nora. Is that the truth, Mag Senton? demanded Mrs. Comstock. You heard Wesley say so, proudly affirmed Mrs. Sinton. I want to make you a proposition, said Wesley. Wait till old Nora comes. Then we'll show her the things and see what she says. How would it do to see what she says without bribing her, sneered Mrs. Comstock. If she can stand what she did yesterday and will today, she can bear most anything, said Wesley. Put away the clothes if you want to, till we tell her. Well, you don't take this waste I'm working on, said Margaret, for I have to baste in the sleeves and set the collar. 
Put the rest out of sight if you like. Mrs. Comstock picked up the basket and bundles, placed them inside her room, and closed the door. Margaret threaded her needle and began to sew. Mrs. Comstock returned to her book while Wesley fidgeted and raged inwardly. He could see that Margaret was nervous and almost in tears, but the lines in Mrs. Comstock's impassive face were set and cold. So they sat and the clock ticked off the time. One hour, two, dusk, and no Elnora. Margaret long since had taken the last stitch she could. Occasionally she and Wesley exchanged a few words. Mrs. Comstock regularly turned a leaf and once arose and moved nearer her window. Just when Margaret and Wesley were discussing whether he had not best go to town to meet Elnora, they heard her coming up the walk. Wesley dropped his tilted chair and squared himself. Margaret gripped her sewing and turned pleading eyes to the door. Mrs. Comstock closed her book and grimly smiled. "'Mother, please open the door,' called Elnora. Mrs. Comstock arose and swung open the screen. Elnora stepped in beside her, bent half double, the whole front of her dress gathered into a sort of bag filled with a heavy load, and one arm stacked high with books. In the dim light, she did not see the sentence. "'Please hand me the empty bucket in the kitchen, mother,' she said. "'I just had to bring these arrow points home, but I'm scared for fear I've soiled my dress and will have to wash it. I'm to clean them and take them to the banker in the morning. And, oh, mother, I've sold enough stuff to pay for my books, my tuition, and maybe a dress and some lighter shoes besides. Oh, mother, I'm so happy. Take the books and bring the bucket. Then she saw Margaret and Wesley. Oh, glory, she exulted. I was just wondering how I'd ever wait to tell you, and here you are. It's too perfectly splendid to be true. Tell us, old Nora, said Sinton. Well, sir, said Elnora, doubling down on the floor and spreading out her skirt, set the bucket here, mother. These points are brittle and have to be put in one at a time. If they are chipped, I can't sell them. Well, sir, I've had a time. You know I just had to have books. I tried three stores, and they wouldn't trust me not even three days. I didn't know what in this world I could do quickly enough. Just when I was about frantic, I saw a sign in a bank window asking for caterpillars, cocoons, butterflies, arrow points, and everything. I went in, and it was this bird woman wants the insects, and the banker wants the stones. I had to go to school then, but if you'll believe it, Elnora beamed on all of them in turn as she talked and slipped the arrow points from her dress to the pail. If you'll believe it, but you won't hardly until you look at the books. There was the mathematics teacher waiting at his door, and he had a set of books for me that he had telephoned a sophomore to bring. How did he happen to do that, Elnora? interrupted Sinton. Elnora blushed. It was a fool mistake I made yesterday in thinking books were just handed out to you. There was a teacher's meeting last night, and the history teacher told about that. Professor Henley thought it was me. You know I told you what he said about my algebra, mother. Ain't I glad I studied out some of it myself this summer? So we just telephoned and a girl brought the books. Because they are marked and abuse them, I get the whole outfit for two dollars. I can erase most of the marks, paste down the covers, and fix them so they look better. But I must hurry to the joy part. I didn't stop to eat at noon. I just ran to the bird woman's and I had lunch with her. It was salad, hot chocolate, and lovely things, and she wants to buy most every old scrap I ever gathered. She wants dragonflies, moths, butterflies, and he, the banker I mean, wants everything Indian. This very night she came to the swamp with me and took away enough stuff to pay for the books and tuition, and tomorrow she is going to buy some more. Elnora laid the last arrow point in the pail in a row, shaking leaves and bits of baked earth from her dress. She reached into her pocket and produced her money and waved it before their wondering eyes. "'And that's the joy part,' she exulted. "'Put it up in the clock till morning, mother. That pays for the books and tuition and—' Elnora hesitated, for she saw the nervous grasp with which her mother's fingers closed on the bills. Then she went on, but more slowly and thinking before she spoke. When I get tomorrow, pays for more books and tuition, and maybe a few, just a few things to wear. These shoes are so dreadfully heavy and hot, and they make such a noise on the floor. There isn't another calico dress in the whole building, not among hundreds of us. Why, what is that? Aunt Margaret, what are you hiding in your lap? She snatched the waist and shook it out, and her face was beaming. Have you taken the waist all fancy and buttoned in the back? I bet you this is mine. I bet you so, too, said Margaret Sinton. You undress right away and try it on, and if it fits, it will be done for morning. There are some low shoes, too. 
Elnora began to dance. Oh, you dear people, she cried. I can pay for them tomorrow night. Isn't it too splendid? I was just thinking on the way home that I certainly would be compelled to have cooler shoes until later, and I was wondering what I'd do when the fall rains begin. I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts and a coat then, said Mrs. Comstock. I know you said so, cried Elnora, but you need it now. I can get every single stitch I need myself. Next summer I can gather up a lot more stuff and all winter on the way to school. I'm sure I can sell ferns. I know I can nuts. And the bird woman says the grade rooms want leaves, grasses, birds' nests, and cocoons. Oh, isn't this world lovely? I'll be helping with the tax next, mother. Elnora waved the waist and started for the bedroom. When she opened the door, she gave a little cry. "'What have you people been doing?' she demanded. "'I never saw so many interesting bundles in all my life. "'I'm scared to death for fear I can't pay for all of them "'and will have to give up something.' "'Wouldn't you take them if you could not pay for them, Elnora?' "'asked her mother instantly. "'Why, not unless you did,' answered Elnora. "'People have no right to wear things they can't afford, have they?' "'But from such old friends as Maggie and Wesley,' "'Mrs. Comstock's voice was oily with triumph.' "'From them least of all,' cried Elnora stoutly. "'From a stranger sooner than from them, "'to whom I owe so much more than I ever can pay now.' "'Well, you don't have to,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Maggie just selected these things "'because she is more in touch with the world "'and has got such good taste. "'You can pay as long as your money holds out, "'and if there's more necessary, "'maybe I can sell the butcher a calf, "'or if there's things too costly for us, of course, "'they can take them back. "'Anything they ain't used and can be returned.' They were only brought here on trial. Put on the waist now, and then you can look over the rest and see if they are suitable and what you want. Elnora stepped into the adjoining room and closed the door. Mrs. Comstock picked up the bucket and started for the well with it. At the bedroom, she paused. Elnora, were you going to wash these arrow points? Yes, the bird woman says they sell better if they are clean, so it can be seen that there are no defects in them. Of course, said Mrs. Comstock. Some of them seem quite baked. Shall I put them to soak? Do you want to take them in the morning? Yes, I do, answered Elnora, if you would just fill the pail with water. Mrs. Comstock left the room. Wesley sent and sat with his back to the window in the west end of the cabin which overlooked the well. A suppressed sound behind him caused him to turn quickly. Then he arose and leaned over Margaret. She's out there laughing like a blamed monkey, he whispered indignantly. Well, she can't help it, exclaimed Margaret. "'I'm going home,' said Wesley. "'Oh, no, you are not,' retorted Margaret. "'You are missing the point. "'The point is not how you look or feel. "'It is to get these things in Elnora's possession past dispute. "'You go now, and tomorrow Elnora will wear calico, "'and Kate Comstock will return these goods. "'Right here I stay until everything we bought is Elnora's.' "'What are you going to do?' asked Wesley. "'You'll have to watch me,' said Margaret. "'I don't know yet myself.' "'Then she arose and peered from the window.' At the well curb stood Catherine Comstock. The strain of the day was finding reaction. Her chin was in the air. She was heaving, shaking, and strangling to suppress any sound. The word that slipped between Margaret Sinton's lips shocked Wesley until he dropped on his chair and recalled her to her senses. She was fairly composed as she turned to Elnora and began the fitting. When she had pinched, pulled, and patted, she called, "'Come see if you think this fits, Kate.' Mrs. Comstock had gone around to the back door and answered from the kitchen. You know more about it than I do. Go ahead. I'm getting supper. Don't forget to allow for what will shrink in washing. I set the colors and washed the goods last night. It can be made to fit right now, answered Margaret, past the pins between her teeth. When she could find nothing more to alter, she told Elnora to see how quickly she could heat a pail of water. After she had done that, the girl began opening packages. The hat came first. Mother, cried Elnora, mother, of course you have seen this, but you haven't seen it on me. I must try it on. Don't you dare put that on your head until your hair is washed and properly combed, said Margaret. Oh, cried Elnora, is that water to wash my hair? I thought it was to set the color in another dress. Well, you thought wrong, said Margaret simply. Your hair is going to be washed and brushed until it shines like copper. While it dries, you can eat your supper and this dress will be finished. Then you can put on your new ribbon and your hat. You can try your shoes now, and if they don't fit, you and Wesley can drive to town and change them. That little round bundle on the top of the basket is your stockings. Margaret sat down and began sewing swiftly, and a little later opened the machine and ran several long seams. Elnora was back in a few minutes, holding up her skirts and stepping daintily in the beautiful new shoes. Don't soil them, honey, else you're sure they fit, cautioned Wesley. 
"They seem just a trifle large, maybe," said little Nora dubiously, and Wesley got down to feel. He and Margaret thought them a fit, and then little Nora appealed to her mother. Mrs. Comstock appeared, wiping her hands on her apron. She examined the shoes critically. "They seem to fit," she said, "but they are way too fine to walk country roads." "I think so, too," said little Nora instantly. "We had better take these back and get a cheaper pair." "Oh, let them go for this time," said Mrs. Comstock. "'They are so pretty, I hate to part with them. "'You can get cheaper ones after this.' "'Wesley and Margaret scarcely breathed for a long time. "'Then Wesley went to do the feeding. "'Elnora set the table. "'When the water was hot, "'Margaret pinned a big towel around Elnora's shoulders "'and washed and dried the lovely hair "'according to the instructions she had been given the previous night. "'As the hair began to dry, it billowed out in sparkling sheen "'that caught the light and gleamed and flashed.' Now the idea is to let it stand naturally, just as the curl will make it. Don't you do any of that nasty, untidy snarling, Elnora, cautioned Margaret. Wash it this way every two weeks while you are in school. Shake it out and dry it. Then part it in the middle and turn a front quarter on each side from your face. You tie the back at your neck with a string, so, and the ribbon goes in a big, loose bow. I'll show you. One after another, Margaret sent and tied the ribbons, creasing each of them so they could not be returned, as she explained that she was trying to see which was most becoming. Then she produced a raincoat which carried Elnora into transports. Mrs. Comstock objected. That won't be warm enough for cold weather, and you can't afford it and a coat too. I'll tell you what I thought, said Elnora. I was planning on the way home. These coats are fine because they keep you dry. I thought I would get one in a warm sweater to wear under it cold days. Then you always would be dry and warm too. The sweater only cost three dollars, so I could get it and the raincoat both for half the price of a heavy cloth coat. You are right about that, said Mrs. Comstock. You can change more with the weather, too. Keep the raincoat, Elnora. Wear it until you try the hat, said Margaret. It will have to do until the dress is finished. Elnora picked up the hat dubiously. Mother, may I wear my hair as it is now, she asked. Let me take a good look, said Catherine Comstock. Heaven only knows what she saw. To Wesley and to Margaret, the bright young face of Elnora with its pink tints, its heavy dark brows, its bright blue-gray eyes, and its frame of curling reddish-brown hair was the sweetest sight on earth, and at that instant, Elnora was radiant. So long as it's your own hair and combed back as plain as it will go, I don't suppose it cuts much ice whether it's tied a little tighter or looser, conceded Mrs. Comstock. If you stop right there, you may let it go at that. Elnora set the hat on her head. It was just a wide tan straw with three exquisite peacock quills at one side. Margaret sent and cried out. Wesley slapped his knee and sighed like a blast, and Mrs. Comstock stood speechless for a second. "'I wish you had asked the price before you put that on,' she said impatiently. "'We never can afford it.' "'It's not so much as you think,' said Margaret. "'Don't you see what I did? I had them take off the quills, and I put on some of those Phoebe Sims gave me from her peacocks. The hat will only cost you a dollar and a half.' She avoided Wesley's eyes and looked straight at Mrs. Comstock. Elnora removed the hat to examine it. "'Why, they are those reddish tan quills of yours,' she cried. "'Mother, look how beautifully they are set on. I think they are fine. I'd much rather have them than those from the store.' "'So would I,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'If Margaret wants to spare them, that will make you a beautiful hat. Dirt cheap, too. You must go past Mrs. Sims and show her. She would be pleased to see them.' Elnora sank into a chair because she couldn't stand any longer and contemplated her toe. "'Landy, ain't I a queen?' she murmured. "'What else have I got?' "'Just a belt, some handkerchiefs, and a pair of top shoes for rainy days and colder weather,' said Margaret, handing over parcels. "'About those high shoes, that was my idea,' said Wesley. "'Soon as it rains, those shoes won't do, and by taking two pairs of ones I could get them some cheaper. The low ones are two, and the high ones two fifty, together three seventy-five. Ain't that cheap? That's a real bargain, said Mrs. Comstock. If they are good shoes and they look it. This, said Wesley, producing the last package, is your Christmas present from your Aunt Maggie. I got mine too, but it's at the house. I'll bring it up in the morning. He handed Margaret the umbrella and she passed it over to Elnora, who opened it and sat laughing under its shelter. Then she kissed both of them. She got a pencil and a slip of paper and set down the prices they gave her of everything they had brought except the umbrella, added the sum, and said laughingly, "'Will you please wait till tomorrow for the money? I'll have it then, sure.' "'Elnora,' said Wesley Sinton, "'wouldn't you?' 
Oh, Nora, hustle here a minute," called Mrs. Comstock from the kitchen. "I need you." "One second, Mother," answered El Nora, throwing off the coat and hat and closing the umbrella as she ran. There were several errands to do in a hurry, and then supper. El Nora chattered incessantly, Wesley and Margaret talked all they could, while Mrs. Comstock said a word now and then, which was all she ever did. But Wesley Sinton was watching her, and time and again he saw a peculiar little twist around her mouth. He knew that for the first time in sixteen years she really was laughing over something. She had all she could do to preserve her usually sober face. Wesley knew what she was thinking. After supper the dress was finished, the plans for the next one discussed, and then the Sintons went home. Elnora gathered her treasures. As she started for the stairs, she stopped. "'May I kiss you good night, Mother?' she asked lightly. "'Never mind any slobbering,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I should think you lived with me long enough to know that I don't care for it.' "'Well, I'd love to show you in some way how happy I am and how I thank you.' "'I wonder what for,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Mag sent and picked that stuff and brought it here, and you pay for it.' "'Yes, but you seem willing for me to have it, "'and you said you would help me if I couldn't pay all,' insisted Elnora. "'Maybe I did,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Maybe I did.' I meant to get you some heavy dress skirts about Thanksgiving, and I still can get them. Go to bed, and for any sake don't begin mooning before a mere make a dunce of yourself. Mrs. Comstock picked up several papers and blew out the kitchen light. She stood in the middle of the sitting room floor for a time, and then went into her room and closed the door. Sitting on the edge of the bed, she thought for a few minutes, and then suddenly buried her face in the pillow and again heaved with laughter. Down the road plodded Margaret and Wesley Sinton. Neither of them had words to utter their united thought. "'Done!' hissed Wesley at last. "'Done, Brown! Did you ever feel like a bloomin' confounded donkey? How did the woman do it?' "'She didn't do it,' gulped Margaret through her tears. "'She didn't do anything. She just trusted to Elnora's great big soul to bring her out right, and really she was right, and so it had to bring her. She's a darling, Wesley, but she's got a tie before her. Did you see Kate Comstock grab that money?' Before six months she'll be out combing the limberlust for bugs and arrow points to help pay the tax. I know her. Well, I don't, exclaimed Sinton. She's too many for me, but there is a laugh left in her yet. I didn't suppose there was. Bet your dollar if we could see her this minute she'd be chuckling over the way we got left. Both of them stopped in the road and looked back. There's Elnora's light in her room, said Margaret. The poor child will feel those clothes and pour over her books till morning, but she'll look decent to go to school anyway. Nothing is too big a price to pay for that. Yes, if Kate lets her wear them. Ten to one, she makes her finish the week with that old stuff. No, she won't, said Margaret. She don't dare. Kate made some concessions all right, big ones for her, if she did get her way in the main. She bent some, and if Elnora proves that she can walk out barehanded in the morning and come back with that much money in her pocket, an armful of books, and buy a turnout like that, she proves that she is of some consideration, and Kate's smart enough. She'll think twice before she'll do that. Elnora won't wear a calico dress to high school again. You watch and see if she does. She may have got the best clothes she'll get for a time for the least money, but she won't know it until she tries to buy goods herself at the same rates. Wesley, what about those prices? Didn't they shrink considerable? You began it, said Wesley. Those prices were all right. We didn't say what the goods cost us. We said what they would cost her. Surely she's mistaken about being able to pay all that. Can she pick up stuff of that value around the Limberloss? Didn't the bird woman see her trouble and just give her the money? I don't think so, said Margaret. Seems to me I've heard of her paying or offering to pay them that would take the money for bugs and butterflies, and I've known people who sold that banker Indian stuff. Once I heard that his pipe collection beat that of the government at the Philadelphia Centennial. Those things have come to have a value. Well, there's about a bushel of that kind of valuables piled up in the woodshed that belongs to Elnora. At least I picked them up because she said she wanted them. Ain't it queer that she'd take the stones, bugs, and butterflies and save them? Now they are going to bring her the very thing she wants the worst. Lord, but this is a funny world when you get to studying. Looks like things didn't all come by accident. Looks as if there was a plan back of it and somebody driving that knows the road and how to handle the lines. Anyhow, Elnor is in the wagon, and when I get out in the night and the dark closes around me and I see the stars, I don't feel so cheap. Maggie, how the nation did Kate Comstock do that? You will keep on harping, Wesley. I told you she didn't do it. Elnora did it. She walked in and took things right out of our hands. All Kate had to do was to enjoy having it go her way, and she was cute enough to put in a few questions that sort of guided Elnora. But I don't know, Wesley. This thing makes me think, too. 
Suppose we'd got all Nora when she was a baby, and we'd heaped on her all the love we can't on our own, and we'd coddled, petted, and shielded her. Would she have made the woman that living alone, learning to think for herself, and taking all the knocks Kate Comstock could give, have made of her? You bet your life, cried Wesley warmly. Loving anybody don't hurt them. We wouldn't have done anything but love her. You can't hurt a child loving it. She'd have learned to work, be sensible, study, and grown into a woman with us without suffering like a poor homeless dog. But you don't get the point, Wesley. She would have grown into a fine woman with us. It just seems as if Elnora was born to be fine. But as we would have raised her, would her heart ever have known the world as it does now? Where is the anguish, Wesley, that child can't comprehend? Seeing what she's seen of her mother hasn't hardened her. She can understand any mother's sorrow. Living life from the rough side has only broadened her. Where is the girl or her boy burning with shame or struggling to find a way that will cross Elnora's path and not get a lift from her? She's had the knocks, but there'll never be any of the thing you call false pride in her. I guess we'd better keep out. Maybe Kate Comstock knows what she's doing. Sure as you live, Elnora has grown bigger on knocks than she would on love. I don't suppose there ever was a very fine point to anything, but I missed it, said Wesley, because I am blunt, rough, and have no brook learning to speak of. Since you put into words, I see what you mean. But it's dinged hard on Elnora, just the same, and I don't keep out. I keep watching closer than ever. I got my slap in the face, but if I don't miss my guess, Kate Comstock learned her lesson, same as I did. She learned that I was in earnest, that I would haul her to court if she didn't loosen up a bit, and she'll loosen. You see if she don't. It may come hard and the hinges creak, but she'll fix Elnora decent after this, if Elnora don't prove that she can fix herself. As for me, I found out that what I was doing was as much for myself as for Elnora. I wanted her to take those things from us and love us for giving them. It didn't work, and but for you, I'd mess the whole thing and stuck like a pig crossing a bridge. But you help me out. Elnora's got the clothes, and by morning maybe I won't grudge Kate the only laugh she's had in sixteen years. You've been showing me the way quite a spell now, ain't you, Maggie? Then they went out of the night and lay down together with Margaret's hand just touching Wesley's sleeve. Up in the attic, Elnora lighted two candles, set them on her little table, stacked the books, and put away the precious clothes. How lovingly she hung the hat and umbrella, folded the raincoat, and spread the new dress over a chair. She fingered the ribbons and tried to smooth the creases from them. She put away the hose neatly folded, touched the handkerchiefs, and tried the belt. Then she slipped into her little white nightdress, shook down her hair that it might become thoroughly dry, set a chair before the table, and reverently opened one of the books. A stiff draft swept the attic, for it stretched the length of the cabin and had a window on each end. Elnora arose and, going to the east window, closed it. She stood for a minute looking at the stars, the sky, and the dark outline of the straggling trees of the rapidly dismantling Limberlost. In the region of her case, a tiny point of light flashed and disappeared. Elnora straightened and wondered. Was it wise to leave her precious money there? The light flashed once more, wavered a few seconds, and died out. The girl waited. She did not see it again, and so she went back to her books. In the Limberlost, the hulking figure of a man slouched down the trail. The bird woman was at Freckles' room this evening, he muttered. Wonder what for? He left the trail, entered the enclosure, still distinctly outlined, and approached the case. The first point of light flashed in the tiny electric lamp on his vest. He took a duplicate key from his pocket, felt for the padlock, and opened it. The door swung wide. The light flashed the second time. Swiftly, his glance swept the interior. About a fourth of her ma's gone. Elnora must have been with the bird woman and given them to her. Then he stood tense. His keen eyes discovered the roll of bills hastily thrust back in the bottom of the case. He snatched them up shut off the light, relocked the case by touch, and swiftly went down the trail. Every few seconds he paused and listened intently. Just as he reached the road, the low hoot of a screech owl, waveringly prolonged, fell on his ears and he stopped. An instant later, a second figure approached him. "'Is it you, Pete?' came the whispered question. "'Yes,' said the first man. "'I was coming down to take a peek when I saw your flash,' he said. "'I heard the bird woman had been at the case today. "'Anything doing?' Not a thing, said Pete. She just took away about a fourth of the moths. Probably had the Comstock girl getting them for her. Heard they were together. Likely she'll get the rest tomorrow. Ain't picking getting bare these days? Well, I should say so, said the second man, turning back in disgust. Coming home now? 
"'No, I'm going down this way,' answered Pete, for his eyes caught the gleam from the window of the Comstock cabin, and he had a desire to learn why Elnora's attic was lighted at that hour. He slouched down the road, occasionally feeling the size of the roll he had not taken time to count. He chuckled frequently. "'Feels fat enough to pay,' he whispered. "'Bill, I beat you just about seven minutes.' The attic was too long, the light too near the other end, and the cabin stood much too far back from the road. He could see nothing, although he climbed the fence and walked back opposite the window. He knew Mrs. Comstock was probably awake, and that she sometimes went to the swamp behind her home at night. At times a cry went up from that locality that paralyzed anyone near, or sent them fleeing as if for life. He did not care to cross behind the cabin. He returned to the road, passed, and again climbed the fence. Opposite the west window he could see Elnora. She sat before a small table reading from a book between two candles. Her hair fell in a bright sheen around her, and with one hand she lightly shook and tossed it as she studied. The man stood out in the night and watched. For a long time the leaf turned occasionally, and the hair drying went on. The man drew nearer. The picture grew more beautiful as he approached. He could not see as well as he desired, for the screen was of white mosquito netting, and it angered him. He cautiously crept closer. The elevation shut off his view. Then he remembered the great willow tree shading the well and branching across the window at the west end of the cabin. From childhood, Elnora had stepped from the sill to a limb and slid down the slanting trunk of the tree. He reached it and noiselessly swung himself up. Three steps out in the big limb, the man shuddered. He was within a few feet of the girl. He could see the throb of her breast under its thin covering and smell the fragrance of the tossing hair. He could see the narrow bed with its piece calico cover, the whitewashed walls with gray lithographs, and every crevice stuck full of twigs with dangling cocoons. There were pegs for the few clothes, the old chest, the little table, the two chairs, the uneven floor covered with rag rags and braided corn husk. But nothing was worth a glance save the perfect face and form within reach by one spring through the rotten mosquito bar. He gripped the limb above that on which he stood, licked his lips, and breathed through his throat to be sure he was making no sound. Elnora closed the book and laid it aside. She picked up a towel and, turning the gathered ends of her hair, rubbed them across it, and dropping the towel in her lap, tossed the hair again. Then she sat in deep thought. By and by, words began to come softly. Near as he was, the man could not hear at first. He bent closer and listened intently. "'Ever could be so happy,' murmured the soft voice. "'The dress is so pretty, such shoes, the coat and everything.' I won't have to be ashamed again, not ever again, for the Limberlost is full of precious moths, and I always can collect them. The bird woman will buy more tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. When they are all gone, I can spend every minute gathering cocoons and hunting other things I can sell. Oh, thank God for my precious, precious money. Why, I didn't pray in vain after all. I thought when I asked the Lord to hide me there in that big hall that he wasn't doing it because I wasn't covered from sight that instant. But I'm hidden now, I feel that. Elnora lifted her eyes to the beams above her. I don't know much about praying properly, she muttered, but I do thank you, Lord, for hiding me in your own time and way. Her face was so bright that it shone with a white radiance. Two big tears welled from her eyes and rolled down her smiling cheeks. Oh, I do feel that you have hidden me, she breathed. Then she blew out the lights and the little wooden bed creaked under her weight. Pete Corson dropped from the limb and found his way to the road. He stood still a long time, then started back to the Limberlost. A tiny point of light flashed in the region of the case. He stopped with an oath. "'Another hound trying to steal from a girl!' he exclaimed. "'Most likely he thinks if he gets anything it will be from a woman who can afford it, as I did.' He went on, but beside the fences, and very cautiously. "'Swamp seems to be alive tonight,' he muttered. "'That's three of us out.' He entered a deep place at the northwest corner, sat on the ground, and, taking a pencil from his pocket, he tore a leaf from the little notebook and laboriously wrote a few lines by the light he carried. Then he went back to the region of the case and waited. Before his eyes swept the vision of the slender white creature with tossing hair, he smiled and worshipped it until a distant rooster faintly announced dawn. Then he unlocked the case again and replaced the money, laid the note upon it, and went back to concealment, where he remained until Elnora came down the trail in the morning, looking very lovely in her new dress and hat. End of chapter 4
Chapter Five of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, wherein Elnor receives a warning and Billy appears on the scene. It would be difficult to describe just how happy Elnora was that morning as she hurried through her work, bathed and put on the neat, dainty gingham dress and the tan shoes. She had a struggle with her hair. It crinkled, billowed, and shone, and she could not avoid seeing the becoming frame it made around her face. But in deference to her mother's feelings, the girl set her teeth and bound her hair close to her head with a shoestring. Not to be changed at the case, she told herself. That her mother was watching, she was unaware. Just as she picked up the beautiful brown ribbon, Mrs. Comstock spoke. You had better let me tie that. You can't reach behind yourself and do it right. Elnora gave a little gasp. Her mother never before had proposed to do anything for the girl that by any possibility she could do herself. Her heart quaked at the thought of how her mother would arrange that bow, but Elnora dared not refuse. The offer was too precious. It might never be made again. "'Oh, thank you,' said the girl, and sitting down she held out the ribbon. Her mother stood back and looked at her critically. "'You haven't got that like Mag Sitton had it last night,' she announced. "'You little idiot! You've tried to plaster it down to suit me, and you missed it. I liked it away better as Mag fixed it after I saw it. You didn't look so peeled.' "'Oh, mother, mother!' laughed Elnor with a half-sob in her voice. "'Hold still, will you?' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You'll be late, and I haven't packed your dinner yet.' She untied the string and shook out the hair. It rose with electricity and clung to her fingers and hands. Mrs. Comstock jumped back as if bitten. She knew that touch. Her face grew white and her eyes angry. "'Tie it yourself,' she said shortly, "'and then I'll put on the ribbon. But roll it back loose like Mag did. It looks so pretty that way.' Almost fainting, Elnora stood before the glass, divided off the front parts of her hair, and rolled them as Mrs. Sinton had done, tied it at the nape of her neck, then sat while her mother arranged the ribbon. "'If I pull it down till it comes tight in these creases where she had it, it will be just right, won't it?' cried Mrs. Comstock, and the amazed Elnora stammered, "'Yes!' When she looked in the glass, the bow was perfectly tied, and how the gold tone of the brown did match the luster of the shining hair. "'That's awful pretty,' commented Mrs. Comstock's soul, but her stiff lips had said all that could be forced on them for once." Just then, Wesley Sinton came to the door. "'Good morning,' he cried heartily. "'Oh, Nora, you look a picture. My, but you're sweet. If any of them city boys get sassy, you tell your Uncle Wesley and he'll horsewhip them. "'Here's your Christmas present for me,' he handed Elnora the leather lunchbox with her name carved across the strap in artistic leathering. "'Oh, Uncle Wesley!' And that was all Elnora could say. "'Your Aunt Maggie filled it for me for a starter,' he said. Now, if you're ready, I'm going to drive past your way, and you can ride almost to Onabasha with me, and save the new shoes that much. Elnora was staring at the box. Oh, I hope it isn't impolite to open it before you, she said. I just feel as if I must see inside. Don't you stand on no formality with the neighbors, laughed Sinton. Look at your box if you want to. Elnora slipped the strap and turned back the lid. This disclosed the knife fork, napkin and spoon, the milk flask, and the interior packed with dainty sandwiches wrapped in tissue paper, and the little compartments for meat, salad, and a custard cup. "'Oh, mother!' cried Elnora. "'Oh, mother, isn't it fine? What made you think of it, Uncle Wesley? How will I ever thank you? No one will have a finer lunchbox than I. Oh, I do thank you. That's the nicest gift I ever had. How I love Christmas in September!' "'It's a mighty handy thing,' assented Mrs. Comstock, taking in every detail with sharp eyes. "'I guess you're glad now you went and helped Mag and Wesley when you could, Elnora.' "'Deed, yes,' laughed Elnora. "'And I'm going again first time they have a big day if I stay out of school to do it.' "'You'll do no such thing,' said the delighted Sinton. "'Come now, if you're going.' "'If I ride, can you spare me time to run into the swamp to my box just a minute?' asked Elnora. The light she had seen the previous night troubled her. Sure, said Wesley largely. He was having such a good time, nothing could hurry him. So they drove away and left a white-faced woman watching them from the door, her heart just a little sorer than usual. I'd give a pretty to hear what he'll say to her, she said bitterly. Always sticking in, always doing things I can't ever afford. Where on earth did he get that thing, and what did it cost? 
Then she entered the cabin and began the day's work, but mingled with the brooding bitterness of her soul was the vision of a sweet young face, glad with a gladness never before seen on it, and over and over she repeated, I wonder what he'll say to her. What he said was that she looked as fresh and sweet as a posy, and to be careful not to step in the mud or scratch her shoe when she went to the case. Elnora found her key and opened the door. Not where she had placed it, but conspicuously in front lay her little heap of bills and a crude scrawl of writing beside it. Elnora picked up the note in astonishment. Dear Elnori, the Lord Almighty is hiding you all right, done you ever doubt it. This money of yourn was took for some time last night, but it is returned with interest. For God's sake, done ever he come to the swamp at night or late evening or morning or far in any time. Something worse than you know could get you. A friend. Elnora began to tremble. She hastily glanced about. The damp earth before the caves had been trodden by large, roughly shod feet. She caught up the money and note, thrust them into her gimp, locked the case, and ran for the road. She was so breathless, and her face so white, Sinton noticed it. "'What in the world's the matter, Elnor? he asked as he helped her into the carriage. "'I am half afraid,' she panted. "'Tut, tut, child,' said Wesley Sinton. "'Nothing in the world to be afraid of. What happened?' "'Uncle Wesley,' said Elnor, "'I had more money than I brought home last night, and I put it in my case. "'Someone has been there. The ground is all trampled, and they left this note.' "'And took your money, I'll wager,' said Sinton angrily. "'No,' answered Elnor. "'Read the note and—' "'Oh, Uncle Wesley, tell me what it means.' Sinton's face was a study. "'I don't know what it means,' he said. "'Only one thing is clear. "'It means some beast who doesn't really want to harm you "'has got his eye on you, "'and he is telling you, plain as he can, not to give him a chance. "'You got to keep along the roads in the open "'and not let the biggest moth that ever flew "'toll you out of hearing of us or your mother. "'It means that.' plain and distinct. Just when I can sell them, just when everything is so lovely on account of them, I can't. I can't stay away from the swamp. The Limberlost is going to buy the books, the clothes, pay the tuition, and even start a college fund. I just can't. You've got to, said Senton. This is plain enough. You go far in the swamp at your own risk, even in daytime. Uncle Wesley, said the girl in a whisper, Last night, before I went to bed, I was so happy I tried to pray, and I thanked God for hiding me under the shadow of his wing. But how in the world could anyone know it? Wesley Sinton's heart gave one great leap in his breast. His face was whiter than the girl's now. Was you praying out loud, honey? he almost whispered. I might have said words, answered Elnora. I know I do sometimes. I've never had anyone to talk to, and I've played with and talked to myself all my life. You've caught me at it often, but it always makes Mother angry when she does. She says it's silly. I forget and do it when I'm alone. But, Uncle Wesley, if I said anything last night, you know it was the merest whisper, because I'd have been so afraid of waking Mother. Don't you see? I sat up late and did two lessons. Sent him with steadying himself. I'll stop and examine the case as I come back, he said. Maybe I can find some clue. That other? That was just accidental. It's a common expression. All the preachers use it. If I was going to pray, that would be the very first thing I'd say. The color came back to Elnora's face. Did you tell your mother about this money, Elnora? he asked. No, I didn't, said Elnora. It's dreadful not to, but I was afraid. You see, they are clearing the swamp so fast. Every year it grows harder to find things, and Indian stuff gets scarcer. I want to graduate, and that's four years unless I can double on the course. That means twenty dollars tuition each year, and new books, and clothes. They won't ever be so much at one time again, that I know. I just got to hang to my money. I was afraid to tell her, for fear she would want it for taxes, and she really must sell a tree or some cattle for that, mustn't she, Uncle Wesley? On your life she must, said Wesley. You put your little wad in the bank all safe and never mention it to a living soul. It don't seem right, but your case is peculiar. Every word you say is a true word. Each year you will get less from the swamp, and things everywhere will be scarcer. If you ever get a few dollars ahead, that can start your college fund. You know you are going to college, Elnora. Of course I am, said Elnora. I settled that as soon as I knew what a college was. I will put all my money in the bank, except what I owe you. I'll pay that now. If your arrows are heavy, said Wesley, I'll drive on to Onabasha with you. But they are not. Half of them were nicked, and this little box held all the good ones. 
It's so surprising how many are spoiled when you wash them. What does he pay? Ten cents for any common perfect one, fifty for revolvers, a dollar for obsidian, and whatever is right for enormous big ones. Well, that sounds fair, said Sinton. It's more than I would want to give for the things. You can come down Saturday and wash up the stuff at our house, and I'll take it in when we go marketing in the afternoon. Elnora jumped from the carriage. She soon found that with her books, her lunch box, and the points, she had a heavy load. She was almost to the bridge crossing the culvert when she heard the distressed screams of a child. Across an orchard of the suburbs came a small boy, after him a big dog, urged by a man in the background. Elnora's heart was with the small flying figure in any event whatever. She dropped her load on the bridge and with practiced hand caught up a stone and flung it at the dog. The beast curled double with a howl. The boy reached the fence and Elnora was there to help him over. As he touched the top she swung him to the ground but he clung to her, clasping her tightly, sobbing and shivering with fear. Elnora carried him to the bridge and sat with him in her arms. For a time his replies to her questions were indistinct, but at last they became quieter and she couldn't understand. He was a mite of a boy, nothing but skin-covered bones, his burned, freckled face in a mortar of tears and dust, his clothing unspeakably dirty, one great toe in a festering mass from a broken nail, and sores all over the visible portions of the small body. "'You won't let the mean old thing make his dog get me,' he wailed. "'Indeed, no,' said Elnora, hugging him closely. "'You wouldn't send a dog on a boy for just taking a few old apples when you fed him to pigs with a shovel every day, would you?' "'No, I would not,' said Elnora hotly. "'You'd give a boy all the apples he wanted if he had any breakfast and was so hungry he was all twisty inside, wouldn't you?' "'Yes, I would,' said Elnora. "'If you had anything to eat, you would give me something right now, wouldn't you?' "'Yes,' said Elnora. "'There's nothing but just stones in the package. But my dinner is in that case. I'll gladly divide.' She opened the box. The famished child gave a little cry and reached both hands. Elnora caught them back. Did you have any supper? No. Any dinner yesterday? An apple and some grapes I stole. Whose boy are you? Old Tom Billings. Why don't your father get you something to eat? He does most days, but he's drunk now. Hush, you must not, said Elnora. He's your father. He spent all the money to get drunk too, said the boy, and Jimmy and Belle are both crying for breakfast. I'd have got out all right with an apple for myself, but I tried to get some for them, and the dog got too close. Say, you can just throw, can't you? Yes, admitted Elnora. She poured half the milk into the cup. Drink this, she said, holding it to him. The boy gulped the milk and swore joyously, gripping the cup with shaking fingers. Hush, cried Elnora. That's dreadful. What's dreadful? To say such awful words. Huh? Pa says worser than that every breath he draws. Elnora stared into the quaint little face and saw that the child was older than she had thought. He might have been forty by his hard, unchildish expression. Do you want to be like your father? No, I want to be like you. Couldn't an angel be prettier than you? Can I have more milk? Elnora emptied the flask. The boy drained the cup. He drew a breath of satisfaction as he gazed into her face. "'You wouldn't go off and leave your little boy, would you?' he asked. "'Did someone go away and leave you?' questioned Elnor in return. "'Yes, my mother went off and left me and left Jimmy and Belle, too,' said the boy. "'You wouldn't leave your little boy, would you?' "'No.' The boy looked eagerly at the box. Elnora lifted a sandwich and uncovered the fried chicken. The boy gasped with delight. "'Say, I could eat the stuff in the glass in the other box "'and carry the bread and the chicken to Jimmy and Belle,' he offered. "'Elnora silently uncovered the custard with preserved cherries on top "'and handed it and the spoon to the child. "'Never did food disappear faster. "'The salad went next and a sandwich and half a chicken breast followed. "'I'd better leave the rest for Jimmy and Belle,' he said. "'They're at least fightin' hungry.' "'Elnora gave him the remainder of the carefully prepared lunch.' The boy clutched it and ran with a sidewise hop like a wild thing. Elnora covered the dishes and cup, polished the spoon, replaced it, and closed the beautiful case. She caught her breath in a tremulous laugh. If Aunt Margaret knew that, she'd never forgive me, she said. It seems as if secrecy is literally forced upon me, and I hate it. What will I do for lunch? I'll have to go sell my arrows and keep enough money for a restaurant sandwich. 
So she walked hurriedly into town, sold her points at a good price, deposited her funds, and went away with a neat little bank book and the note from the Limberlost carefully folded inside. Elnora passed down the great hall that morning, and no one paid the slightest attention to her. The truth was, she looked so like everyone else that she was perfectly inconspicuous. But in the coat room there were members of her class. Surely no one intended it, but the whisper was too loud. Look at the girl from the Limberlost and the clothes that woman gave her. Elnora turned on them. I beg your pardon, she said unsteadily. I couldn't help hearing that. No one gave me these clothes. I paid for them myself. Someone muttered, Pardon me, but incredulous faces greeted her. Elnora felt driven. Aunt Margaret selected them, and she meant to give them to me, she explained, but I wouldn't take them. I paid for them myself. There was a dead silence. Don't you believe me? panted Elnora. Really, it is none of our affair, said another girl. Come on, let's go. Elnora stepped before the girl who had spoken. You have made this your affair, she said, because you told a thing which was not true. No one gave me what I am wearing. I paid for my clothes myself with money I earned selling moths to the bird woman. I just came from the bank where I deposited what I did not use. Here's my credit. Elnora drew out and offered the little red book. Surely you will believe that, she said. Why, of course, said the girl who first had spoken. We met such a lovely woman in Brownlee's store, and she said she wanted our help to buy some things for a girl, and that's how we came to know. Dear Aunt Margaret, said Elnor, it was like her to ask you. Isn't she splendid? She is indeed, chorused the girls. Elnor set down her lunch box and books, unpinned her hat, hanging it beside the others, and taking up the books, she reached to set the box in its place and dropped it. With a little cry, she snatched at it and caught the strap on top. That pulled from the fastening, the cover unrolled, the box fell away as far as it could, two porcelain lids rattled on the floor, and the one sandwich rolled like a cartwheel across the room. Elnora lifted a ghastly face. For once, no one laughed. She stood an instant staring. It seems to be my luck to be crucified at every point of the compass, she said at last. First two days you thought I was a pauper. Now you will think I'm a fraud. All of you will believe I bought an expensive box and then was too poor to put anything but a restaurant sandwich in it. You must stop till I prove to you that I'm not. Elnora gathered up the lids and kicked the sandwich into a corner. I had milk in that bottle, see? And custard in the cup. There was salad in the little box, fried chicken in the large one, and nut sandwiches in the tray. You can see the crumbs of all of them. A man sent a dog on the child who was so starved he was stealing apples. I talked with him, and I thought I could bear hunger better. He was such a little boy, so I gave him my lunch and got the sandwich at the restaurant. Elnora held out the box. The girls were laughing by that time. You goose, said one. Why didn't you give him the money and save your lunch? He was such a little fellow, and he really was hungry, said Elnora. I often go without anything to eat at noon in the fields and woods and never think of it. She closed the box and set it beside the lunches of other country pupils. While her back was turned, into the room came the girl for encounter on the first day, walked to the rack, and with an exclamation of approval, took down Elnora's hat. "'Just the thing I have been wanting,' she said. "'I never saw such beautiful quills in all my life. They match my new broadcloth to perfection. I've got to have that kind of quills for my hat. I never saw the like. Whose is it, and where did it come from?' No one said a word, for Elnora's question, the reply, and her answer had gone the rounds of the high school. Everyone knew that the Limberlost girl had come out ahead, and Sadie Reed had not felt amiable when the little flourish had been added to Elnora's name in the algebra class. Elnora's swift glance was pathetic, but no one helped her. Sadie Reed glanced from the hat to the faces around her and wondered. "'Why, this is the freshman section. Whose hat is it?' she asked again, this time impatiently. That's the tassel, the cornstalk, said Elnor with a forced laugh. The response was genuine. Everyone shouted. Sadie Reed blushed, but she laughed also. Well, it's beautiful, she said, especially the quills. They are exactly what I want. I know I don't deserve any kindness from you, but I do wish you would tell me at whose store you got those quills. Gladly, said Elnor. You can't get quills like those at a store. They are from a living bird. Phoebe Sims gathers them in her orchard as her peacocks shed them. They are wing quills from the males. Then there was a perfect silence. How was Elnora to know that not a girl there would have told that? 
"I haven't a doubt but I can get you some," she offered. "She gave Aunt Margaret a great bunch, and those are part of them. I'm quite sure she has more and would spare some." Sadie Reed laughed shortly. "You needn't trouble," she said. "I was fooled. I thought they were expensive quills. I wanted them for a twenty dollar velvet toque to match my new suit. If they are picked off the ground, really, I couldn't use them." "Only in spots," said Elnor. "They don't just cover the earth. Phoebe Sims' peacocks are the only ones within miles of Onabasha, and they molt but once a year. If your hat only costs twenty dollars, it's hardly good enough for those quills. You see, the Almighty made and colored those himself, and he puts the same kind on Phoebe Sims' peacocks that he put on the head of the family in the forest of Ceylon, away back in the beginning. Any old manufactured quill from New York or Chicago will do for your little twenty-dollar hat. You ought to have something infinitely better than that to be worthy of quills that are made by the Creator. How those girls did laugh! One of them walked by Elnor to the auditorium, sat with her during exercises, and tried to talk whenever she dared to keep Elnor from seeing the curious and admiring look spent upon her. For the brown-eyed boy whistled, and there was pantomime of all sorts going on behind Elnor's back that day. Happy with her books, no one knew how much she saw, and from her absorption in her studies, it was evident she cared too little to notice. It soon developed that to be inconspicuous and to work was all Elnora craved. After school, she went again to the home of the bird woman, and together they visited the swamp and took away more specimens. This time, Elnora asked the bird woman to keep the money until noon of the next day, when she would call for it and have it added to her bank account. She slowly walked home, for the visit to the swamp had brought back full force the experience of the morning. Again and again she examined the crude little note, for she did not know what it meant, yet it bred vague fear. The only thing on earth of which Elnora knew herself afraid was her mother, when, with wild eyes and ears deaf to childish pleading, she sometimes lost control of herself in the night and visited the pool where her husband had sunk before her, calling his name in unearthly tones and begging of the swamp to give back its dead. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, wherein Mrs. Comstock indulges in frills and Billy reappears. It was Wesley Senton who really wrestled with the problem as he drove about his business. He did not have to ask himself what it meant. He knew the old course and gang was still holding together. Elder members who had escaped the law had been joined by a younger brother of Jack's, and they met in the thickest of the few remaining fast places of the swamp to drink, gamble, and loaf. Then, suddenly, there would be a robbery in some country house where a farmer that day had sold his wheat or corn and not paid a visit to the bank, or in some neighboring village. The home of Mrs. Comstock and Elnora had joined the swamp. Sinton's land lay next, and not another residence or man easy to reach in case of trouble. Whoever wrote that note had some human kindness in his breast, but the fact stood revealed that he feared his strength if Elnora was delivered into his hands. Where had he been the previous night when he heard that prayer? Was that the first time he had been in such proximity? Sinton drove fast, for he wished to reach the swamp before Elnora and the bird woman would go there for more moths. At almost four he came to the case and, dropping on his knees, studied the ground, every sense alert. He found two or three little heel prints. Those were made by Elnora or the bird woman. What Sinton wanted to learn was whether all the rest were the footprints of one man. It was easily seen they were not. There were deep, even tracks made by fairly new shoes and others where a well-worn heel cut deeper on the inside of the print than at the outer edge. Undoubtedly, some of the Corson's old gang were watching the case and the visits of the women to it. There was no danger that any one would attack the bird woman. She never went to the swamp at night, and on her trips in the daytime, everyone knew that she carried a revolver, understood how to use it, and pursued her work in a fearless manner. Elnora, prowling around the swamp and lured into the interior by the flight of moths and butterflies, Elnora, without father, money, or friend save himself to defend her, Elnora was a different proposition. For the thing to happen just when the Limberlost was bringing light, hope, and the very desire of her heart to the girl, it was too bad. Sinton was afraid for her, yet he did not want to add the burden of fear to Catherine Comstock's trouble or to disturb the joy of Elnora in her work. He stopped at the cabin and slowly went up the walk. 
Mrs. Comstock was sitting on the front step with some sewing. The work looked to Sinton as if she might be engaged in putting a tuck in a petticoat. He thought of how Margaret had shortened Elnora's dress to the accepted length for girls of her age and made a mental note of Mrs. Comstock's occupation. Mrs. Comstock dropped her work on her lap, laid her hands on it, and looked into his face with a sneer. "'You didn't let any grass grow under your feet,' she said. Sinton saw her white, drawn face and comprehended. "'I went to pay a debt and see about this opening of the ditch, Kate. "'You said you were going to prosecute me.' "'Good gracious, Kate,' said Sinton. "'Is that what you have been thinking all day? "'I told you before I left yesterday that I would not need to do that, and I won't. "'We can't afford to quarrel over our Nora. "'She's all we've got. "'Now that she has proved that if you don't do just what I think you ought "'by way of clothes and schooling, she can take care of herself, "'I put that out of my head. "'When I came to see you about is a kind of scare I've had today.' I want to ask you if you ever see anything about the swamp that makes you think the old Corson gang is still alive. Can't say that I do, said Mrs. Comstock. There's kind of dancing lights there sometimes, but I suppose it was just people passing along the road with lanterns. Folks hereabout are none too fond of the swamp. I hate it like death. I've never stayed here a night in my life without Robert's revolver clean and loaded under my pillow and the shotgun, same condition by the bed. I can't say that I'm afraid here at home. I'm not. I can take care of myself, but none of the swamp for me. Well, I'm glad you are not afraid, Kate, because I got to tell you something. Elnora stopped at the case this morning, and somebody had been into it in the night. Broke the lock? No, used a duplicate key. Today I heard there was a man here last night. I want to nose around a little. Sinton went to the east end of the cabin and looked up at the window. There was no way anyone could have reached it without a ladder, for the logs were hewed and mortar filled the cracks even. Then he went to the west end. The willow faced him as he turned the corner. He examined the trunk carefully. There was no mistake about small particles of black swamp muck adhering to the sides of the tree. He reached the low branches and climbed the willow. There was earth on the large limb crossing Elnora's window. He stood on it, holding the branches had been done the night before, and looked into the room. He could see very little, but he knew that if it had been dark outside and sufficiently light for Elnora to study inside, he couldn't have seen vividly. He brought his face close to the netting, and he could see the bed with its head to the east, at its foot the table with the candles and the chair before it, and then he knew where the man had been who had heard Elnora's prayer. Mrs. Comstock had followed around the corner and stood watching him. "'Do you think some slinking hulk was up there peeking in at Elnora?' she demanded indignantly. "'There is muck on the trunk and plenty on the limb,' said Sinton. "'Hadn't you better get a saw and let me take this branch off?' No, I hadn't, said Mrs. Comstock. First place, Elnora's climbed from that window on that limb all her life, and it's hers. Second place, no one gets ahead of me after I've had warning. Any crow that perches on that roost again will get its feathers somewhat scattered. Look along the fence there and see if you can find where I came in. The place was easy to find, as was a trail leading for some distance west of the cabin. You just go home and don't fret yourself, said Mrs. Comstock. I'll take care of this. If you should hear the dinner bell at any time in the night, you come down. But I wouldn't say anything to Elnora. She best keep her mind on her studies, if she's going to school. When the work was finished that night, Elnora took her books and went to her room to prepare some lessons, but every few minutes she looked toward the swamp to see if there were lights near the case. Mrs. Comstock raked together the coals in the cooking stove, got out the lunch box, and sitting down, she studied it grimly. At last she arose. "'Wonder how it would do to show Mag Sinton a frill or two, she murmured. She went to her room, knelt by a big black walnut chest, and hunted through its contents until she found an old-fashioned cookbook. She tended the fire as she read and presently was in action. She first sawed an end from a fragrant, juicy, sugar-cured ham and put it to cook. Then she set a couple of eggs boiling and, after long hesitation, began creaming butter and sugar in a crock. An hour later, the odor of the ham mingled with some of the richest spices of Happy Araby, and a combination that could mean nothing save spice cake, crept up to Elnora so strongly that she lifted her head and sniffed amazedly. She would have given all her precious money to go down and throw her arms around her mother's neck, but she did not dare move, even to open the door for a better smell. Mrs. Comstock was up early, and without a word handed Elnora the case as she left the next morning. "'Thank you, mother,' said Elnora, and went on her way. She walked down the road, looking straight ahead until she came to the corner where she usually entered the swamp. She paused, glanced that way, and smiled. 
Then she turned and looked back. There was no one coming in any direction. She kept to the road until well around the corner. Then she stopped and sat on a grassy spot, laid her books beside her, and opened the lunch box. Last night's odors had in a measure prepared her for what she would see, but not quite. She scarcely could believe her senses. Half the bread compartment was filled with dainty sandwiches of bread and butter sprinkled with the yolk of egg, and the rest with three large slices of the most fragrant spice cake imaginable. The meat dish contained shaved cold ham, of which she knew the quality. The salad was tomatoes and celery, and the cup held preserved pear clear as amber. There was milk in the bottle, two tissue-wrapped cucumber pickles in the folding drinking cup, and a fresh napkin in the ring. No lunch was ever daintier or more palatable. Of that, Elnora was perfectly sure, and her mother had prepared it for her. She glanced around her and then to her old refuge, the sky. "'She does love me,' cried the happy girl. "'Sure as you're born, she loves me. She just hasn't found it out yet.' She touched the papers daintily and smiled at the box as if it were a living thing. As she began closing it, a breath of air swept by, lifting the covering of the cake. It was like an invitation, and breakfast was several hours away. Elnora picked up a piece and ate it. That cake tasted even better than it looked. Then she tried a sandwich. How did her mother come to think of making them that way? They never had any at home. She slipped out the fork, sampled the salad, and one quarter of pear. Then she closed the box and started down the road, nibbling one of the pickles and trying to decide exactly how happy she was. But just then she could find no standard high enough for a measure. She was to go to the bird woman's after school for the last load from the case. Saturday, she would take the arrow points and specimens to the bank. That would exhaust her present supplies and give her enough money ahead to pay for books, tuition, and clothes for at least two years. She would work early and late gathering nuts. In October, she would sell all the ferns she could find. She must collect specimens of all tree leaves before they fell, gather nests and cocoons later, and keep her eyes wide open for anything the grades could use. She would see the superintendent that night about selling specimens to the ward buildings. She must be ahead of anyone else if she wanted to furnish these things. So she approached the bridge. That it was occupied could be seen from a distance. As she came up, she found the small boy of yesterday awaiting her with a confident smile. "'We brought you something,' he announced without greeting. "'This is Jimmy and Belle, and we brought you a present.' He offered a parcel wrapped in brown paper. "'Why, how lovely of you,' said Elnor. "'I suppose you have forgotten me when you ran away so fast yesterday.' "'No, nah, I didn't forget you,' said the boy. "'I wouldn't forget you, not ever. "'Why, I was east to hurrying to take them things to Jimmy and Belle. "'My, they was glad.' Elnor glanced at the children. They sat on the edge of the bridge, obviously clad in a garment each, very dirty and unkept, a little boy and a girl of about seven and nine. Elnora's heart began to ache. Say, said the boy, ain't you going to look what we have gave you? I thought it wasn't polite to look before people, answered Elnora. Of course I will, if you would like to have me. Elnora opened the package. She had been presented with a quarter of a stale loaf of baker's bread and a big piece of ancient bologna. "'But don't you want this yourselves?' she asked in surprise. "'Gosh, no! I mean East Plain, no,' said the boy. "'We always have it. We got stacks this morning. "'Pa's come out of it now, and he's so sorry he got more and ever we can eat. "'Have you had any before?' "'No,' said Elnor. "'I never did.' The boy's his eyes brightened, and the girl moved restlessly. "'We thought maybe you hadn't,' said the boy. First you ever have, you like it real well. "'But when you don't have anything else for a long time, "'years and years, you get so tired.' "'He hitched at the string which held his trousers "'and eyed Elnora speculatively. "'I don't suppose you'd trade what you got in that box "'or East Old Bread and Bologna now, would you? "'Maybe you like it. "'I, I know, I used to know what you got "'would taste like heaven to Jimmy and Belle. "'They never had nothing like that, "'not even Belle, and she's most ten. "'No, sirree, they never tasted things like you got.' It was in Elnora's heart to be thankful that she had got even a taste in time as she knelt on the bridge, opened the box, and divided her lunch into three equal parts, the smaller boy getting most of the milk. Then she told them it was school time and she must go. "'Why don't you put your bread and bologna in the nice box?' asked the boy. "'Of course,' said Elnora. "'I didn't think.' When the box was arranged to the children's satisfaction, all of them accompanied Elnora to the corner where she turned toward the high school." Elnora and Billy led the way. Jimmy and Belle followed. Billy, said Elnora, I would like you much better if you were cleaner. 
Surely you have water. Can't you children get some soap and wash yourselves? Gentlemen are never dirty. You want to be a gentleman, don't you? Is being clean all you have to do to be a gentleman? No, said Eleanor. You must not say bad words, and you must be kind and polite to your sister. Must Belle be kind and polite to me, else she ain't a lady? Yes. Then Belle's no lady, said Billy succinctly. Elnora could say nothing more just then, and she bade them good-bye and started them home. The poor little souls, she mused. I think the Almighty put them in my way to show me real trouble. I won't be likely to spend much time pitying myself while I can see them. She glanced at the lunch-box. What on earth do I carry this for? I never had anything that was so strictly ornamental. One sure thing, I can't take the stuff to the high school. You never seem to know just what is going to happen to you while you are there. As if to provide a way out of her difficulty, a big dog arose from a lawn and came toward the gate wagging his tail. If those children ate the stuff, it can't possibly kill him, thought Elnor, so she offered him the baloney. The dog accepted it graciously, and being a pedigreed beast, he trotted around to a side porch and laid the baloney before his mistress. The woman snatched it, screaming, "'Come quick! Someone is trying to poison Pedro!' Her daughter came running from the house. "'Go see who is on the street! Hurry!' cried the excited mother. Ellen Brownlee ran and looked. Elnora was a half block away, and no one nearer. Ellen called loudly, and Elnora stopped. Ellen came running toward her. "'Did you see anyone give our dog something?' she cried as she approached. Elnora saw no escape. "'I gave it a piece of baloney myself,' she said. "'It was fit to eat. It wouldn't hurt the dog.' Ellen stood and looked at her. "'Of course I didn't know it was your dog,' explained Elnora. "'I just had something I wanted to throw to some dog, and that one looked big enough to manage it.' Ellen had arrived at her conclusions. "'Pass over that lunch box," she demanded. "'I will not,' said Elnora. Then I will have you arrested for trying to poison our dog, laughed the girl as she took the box. One chunk of stale bread, one half-mile of antique bologna contributed for dog feed, the remains of cake, salad, and preserves in an otherwise empty lunch box, one ham sandwich yesterday. I think it's lovely you have the box. Who got your lunch? Same, confessed Elnora, but there were three of them today. Wait until I run back and tell Mother about the dog and get my books. Elnora waited, and that morning she walked down the hall and into the auditorium beside one of the very nicest girls in Onabasha, and it was the fourth day. But the surprise came at noon when Ellen insisted upon Elnora lunching at the Brownlee home, and convulsed her parents and family and overwhelmed Elnora by a greatly magnified but moderately accurate history of her lunch box. "'Gee, but it's a box, Danny,' cried the laughing girl. "'It's carved leather and fastens with a strap that's got her name on it.' Inside are trays for things all complete, and it bears evidence of having enclosed delicious food, but Elnora never gets any. She's carried it two days now, and both times has been empty before she reached school. Isn't that killing? It is, Ellen, in more ways than one. No girl's going to eat breakfast at six o'clock, walk three miles, and do good work with no lunch. You can't tell me anything about that box. I sold it last Monday night to Wesley Senton, one of my good country customers. He told me it was a present for a girl who was worthy of it, I see he was right. He's so good to me, said Elnora. Sometimes I look at him and wonder if a neighbor can be so kind to one, what a real father would be like. I envy a girl with a father unspeakably. You have cause, said Ellen Brownlee. A father is the very nicest thing in the whole round world, except a mother, who is just as nice. The girl, starting to pay tribute to her father, saw that she must include her mother, and said the thing before she remembered what Mrs. Sinton had told the girls in the store. She stopped in dismay. Elnora's face paled a trifle, but she smiled bravely. "'Then I am fortunate in having a mother,' she said. Mr. Brownlee lingered at the table after the girls had excused themselves and returned to school. "'There's a girl Ellen can't see too much of, in my opinion,' he said. "'She is every inch a lady, and not foolish notion or action about her. I can't understand just what combination of circumstances produced her in this day.' It has been an unusual case of repression, for one thing. She waits on her elders and thinks before she speaks, said Mrs. Brownlee. She's mighty pretty. She looks so sound and wholesome, and she's neatly dressed. Ellen says she was a fright the first two days. Long, brown, calico dress almost touching the floor and big, lumbering shoes. Those Sinton people bought her clothes. Ellen was in the store, and the woman stopped her crowd and asked them about their dresses. She said the girl was not poor, but her mother was selfish and didn't care for her. 
but Elnora showed a bank book the next day and declared that she paid for the things herself, so the Sinton people must just have selected them. There is something peculiar about it, but nothing wrong, I am sure. I'll encourage Ellen to ask her again. Well, I should say so, especially if she is going to keep on giving away her lunch. She lunched with the bird woman one day this week. She did? Yes, she lives out by the Limberlost. You know the bird woman works there a great deal and probably knows her that way. I think the girl gathers specimens for her. Ellen says she knows more than the teachers about any nature question that comes up, and she is going to lead all of them mathematics and make them work in any branch. When Elnora entered the coat room after having had luncheon with Ellen Brown Lee, there was such a difference in the atmosphere that she could feel it. I am almost sorry I have these clothes, she said to Ellen. In the name of sense, why? cried the astonished girl. Everyone is so nice to me in them, it just sets me to wondering if in time I could have made them be equally friendly in the others. Ellen looked at her introspectively. Well, sir, I believe you could, she announced at last but would have taken time and heartache and your mind would have been less free to work on your studies. No one is happy without friends. I just simply can't study when I am unhappy. That night the bird woman made the last trip to the swamp. Every specimen she possibly could use had been purchased at a fair price and three additions had been made to the bank book, carrying the total a little past two hundred dollars. There remained the Indian relics to sell on Saturday and Elnora had secured the order to furnish material for nature work for the grades. Life suddenly grew very full. There was the most excitingly interesting work for every hour, and that work was to pay high school expenses and start the college fund. There was just one little rift in her joy. All of it would have been so much better if she could have told her mother and given the money into her keeping. But the struggle to get a start had been so terrible, Elnora was afraid to take the risk. When she reached home, she only told her mother that the last of the things had been sold that evening. I think, said Mrs. Comstock, that we will get Wesley to move that box over here back of the garden for you. There you are apt to get told farther into the swamp than you intend to go, and you might mire or something. There ought to be just the same things in our woods and along our swampy places as there are in the Limberlust. Can't you hunt your stuff here? I can try, said Elnora. I don't know what I can find until I do. Our woods are undisturbed, and there is a possibility they might be even better hunting than the swamp. But I wouldn't have Freckles' case moved for the world. He might come back some day and not like it. I've tried to keep his room the best I could, and taking out the box would make a great hole in one side of it. Store boxes don't cost much. I will have Uncle Wesley buy me one and set it up wherever hunting looks the best, early in the spring. I would feel safer at home. Shall we do the work or have supper first? Let's do the work, said Elnora. I can't say that I'm hungry now. Don't seem as if I ever could be hungry again with such a lunch. I am quite sure no one carried more delicious things to eat than I. Mrs. Comstock was pleased. I put in a pretty good hunk of cake, she said. Did you divide it with anyone? Why, yes, I did, admitted Elnor. Who? Things were getting uncomfortable. I ate the biggest piece myself, said Elnora, and gave the rest to a couple of boys named Jimmy and Billy and a girl named Belle. They said it was very best cake they ever tasted in all their lives. Mrs. Comstock sat straight. I used to be a master hand at spice cake, she boasted, but I'm a little out of practice. I must get to work again. With the very weeds growing higher than our heads, we should get plenty of good stuff to eat off this land if we can't afford anything else but taxes. Elnora laughed and hurried upstairs to change her dress. Margaret Sinton came that night, bringing a beautiful blue one in its stead and carried away the other to launder. Do you mean to say those dresses are to be washed every two days? questioned Mrs. Comstock. They have to be to look fresh, replied Margaret. We want our girls sweet as a rose. Well, of all things, cried Mrs. Comstock, every two days, any girl who can't keep a dress clean longer than that is a dirty girl. You'll wear the goods out and fade the colors with so much washing. We'll have a clean girl anyway. Well, if you like the job, you can have it, said Mrs. Comstock. I don't mind the washing, but I'm so inconvenient with an iron. Elnora sat late that night working hard over her lessons. The next morning she put on her blue dress and ribbon, and in those she was a picture. Mrs. Comstock caught her breath with a queer stirring around her heart, and looked twice to be sure of what she saw. As Elnora gathered her books, her mother silently gave her the lunch box. "'Feels heavy,' said Elnora gaily, "'and smelly. Like as not I'll be called upon to divide again.' "'Then you divide,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Eating is the one thing we don't have to economize on, Elnora. 
spite of all I can do, food goes to waste in the soil every day. If you can give some of those city children a taste of the real thing, why, don't be selfish. Elnora went down the road thinking of the city children with whom she probably would divide. Of course the bridge would be occupied again. So she stopped and opened the box. Undoubtedly, Mrs. Comstock was showing Margaret Sinton the frills. The cake was still fresh and there were four slices. The sandwiches had to be tasted twice before Elnora discovered that beech nuts had been used in a peanut recipe and they were a great improvement. There were preserved strawberries in the cup, potato salad with mint and cucumber in the dish, and a beautifully browned squab from the stable loft. I don't want to be selfish, murmured Elnora, but it just seems as if I can't give away this lunch. If Mother did not put love into it, she substituted something that's likely to fool me. She almost felt her steps lagging as she approached the bridge. A very hungry dog had been added to the trio of children. Elnora loved all dogs, and, as usual, this one came to her in friendliness. The children said, "'Good morning!' with alacrity, and another paper parcel lay conspicuous. "'How are you this morning?' inquired Elnora. "'All right!' cried the three, while the dog sniffed ravenously at the lunchbox and beat a perfect tattoo with his tail. "'How did you like the bologna?' questioned Billy eagerly. "'One of the girls took me to lunch at her home yesterday,' answered Elnora. Dawn broke beautifully over Billy's streaked face. He caught the package and thrust it toward Elnora. "'Then maybe you'd like to try the bologna today!' The dog leaped in glad apprehension of something, and Belle scrambled to her feet and took a step forward. The look of famished greed in her eyes was more than Elnora could bear. It was not that she cared for the food so much. Good things to eat had been in abundance all her life. She wanted with this lunch to try to absorb what she felt must be an expression of some sort from her mother, and if it was not a manifestation of love, she did not know what to think. But it was her mother who had said, Be generous. She knelt on the bridge. Keep back the dog, she warned the elder boy. She opened the box and divided the milk between Billy and the girl. She gave each a piece of cake, leaving one in a sandwich. Billy pressed forward eagerly, bitter disappointment on his face, and the elder boy forgot his charge. Oh, I thought they'd be meat, lamented Billy. Elnora gave way. There is, she said gladly. There's a little pigeon bird. I want just a teeny piece of the breast for a sort of keepsake, just one bite, and you can have the rest among you. Elnora drew the knife from its holder and cut off the wishbone. Then she held the bird toward the girl. You can divide it, she said. The dog made a bound and seizing the squab, sprang from the bridge and ran for life. The girl and boy hurried after him. With awful eyes, Billy stared and swore impetuously. Elnora caught him and clapped her hand over the little mouth. A delivery wagon came tearing down the street, the horse running full speed, passed the fleeing dog with the girl and boy in pursuit, and stopped at the bridge. High school girls began to roll from all sides of it. A rescue! A rescue! they shouted. It was Ellen Brownlee and her crowd, and every girl of them carried a big parcel. They took in the scene as they approached. The fleeing dog with something in its mouth, the half-naked girl and boy chasing it told the story. Those girls screamed with laughter as they watched the pursuit. "'Thank goodness I saved the wishbone,' said Elnora. "'As usual, I can prove that there was a bird.' She turned toward the box. Billy had improved the time. He had the last piece of cake in one hand, and the last bite of salad disappeared in one great gulp. Then the girl shouted again. "'Let's have a sample ourselves,' suggested one. She caught up the box and handed out the remaining sandwich. Another girl divided it into bites, each little over an inch square, and then she lifted the cup lid and deposited a preserved strawberry on each bite. One, two, three, all together now, she cried. Billy let out a roar. You old mean things, he screamed. In an instant he was down on the road and handfuls of dust began to fly among them. The girl scattered before him. Billy, cried Elnora, Billy, I'll never give you another bite as long as I live if you throw dust on anyone. Then Billy dropped the dust, bored both fists into his eyes, and fled sobbing into Elnora's new blue skirt. She stopped to meet him, and consolation began. Those girls laughed on. They screamed and shouted until the little bridge shook. "'Tomorrow might as well be a clear day,' said Ellen, passing around and feeding the remaining berries to the girls as they could compose themselves enough to take them. "'Billy, I admire your taste more than your temper.' Elnora looked up. "'The little soul is nothing but skin and bones,' she said. I never was really hungry myself. Were any of you? Well, I should say so, cried a plump rosy girl. I'm famished right now. Let's have breakfast immediate. 
"We got to refill this box first," said Ellen Brownlee. "Who's got the butter?" A girl advanced with a wooden tray. "Put it in the preserve cup. A little strawberry flavour won't hurt it. Next!" called Ellen. A loaf of bread was produced and Ellen cut off a piece which filled the sandwich box. "Next!" A bottle of olives was unwrapped. The grocer's boy who was waiting opened that and Ellen filled the salad dish. "Next!" A bag of macaroons was produced and the cake compartment filled. "Next!" "'I don't suppose this will make quite as good dog feet as a bird,' laughed a girl, holding open a bag of sliced ham while Ellen filled the meat dish. "'Next!' A box of candy was handed to her, and she stuffed every corner of the lunchbox with chocolates and nougat. Then it was closed and formally presented to Elnora. The girls each helped themselves to candy and olives and gave Billy the remainder of the food. Billy took one bite of ham and approved.' Bell and Jimmy had given up chasing the dog and, angry and ashamed, stood waiting a half block away. "'Come back!' screamed Billy. "'You great big dunces, come back! There's a new kind of meat and cake and candy!' The boy delayed, but the girl joined Billy. Ellen wiped her fingers, stepped to the cement abutment, and began reciting Horatio at the bridge, substituting Elnora wherever the hero appeared in the lines. Elnora gathered up the sacks and gave them to Bell, telling her to take the food home cut and spread the bread, set things on the table, and eat nicely. Then Elnora was hustled into the wagon with the girls and driven on the run to the high school. They sang a song beginning, Elnora, please give me a sandwich. I'm ashamed to ask for cake, as they went. Elnora did not know it, but that was her initiation. She belonged to the crowd. She only knew that she was happy and vaguely wondered what her mother and Aunt Margaret would have said about the proceedings. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, wherein Mrs. Comstock manipulates Margaret and Billy acquires a residence. Saturday morning, Elnora helped her mother with the work. When she had finished, Mrs. Comstock told her to go to Sentence and wash her Indian relics, so that she would be ready to accompany Wesley to town in the afternoon. Elnora hurried down the road and was soon at the cistern with a tub, busily washing arrow points, stone axes, tubes, pipes, and skin-cleaning implements. There were not so many points as she had supposed, and some she had thought the finest were chipped and broken. Still, there was quite a large box of perfect ones to carry to the city. Then Elnora hurried home, dressed, and was waiting when the carriage reached the gate. She stopped at the bank with the box and sent him went to do his marketing and a little shopping for his wife. At the dry goods store, Mr. Brownlee called to him. Hello, Sinton. How do you like the fate of your lunch box? Then he began to laugh. I always hate to see a man laughing alone, said Sinton. It looks so selfish. Tell me the fun and let me help you. Brownlee wiped his eyes. I suppose you knew, but I see she hasn't told. Then the three days' history of the lunchbox was repeated with particulars which included the dog. Now laugh, concluded Brownlee. Blessed if I see anything funny, replied Sinton, and if you had bought that box and furnished one of those lunches yourself, you wouldn't either. I call such a work a shame. I'll have it stopped. Someone must see to that all right. They are little leeches. Their father earns enough to support them, but they have no mother and they run wild. I suppose they are crazy for cooked food, but it is funny, and when you think it over, you will see it if you don't now. About where would a body find that, father? inquired Sinton grimly. Mr. Brownlee told him, and he started, locating the house with little difficulty. House was the proper word, for of home there was no sign. Just a small empty house with three unkept little children racing through and around it. The girl and the elder boy hung back, but dirty little Billy greeted Sinton with, "'What do you want here?' "'I want to see your father,' said Sinton. "'Well, he's asleep,' said Billy. "'Where?' asked Sinton. "'In the house,' answered Billy. "'And you can't wake him.' "'Well, I'll try,' said Wesley. Billy led the way. "'There he is,' he said. "'He is drunk again.' On a dirty mattress in a corner lay a sleeping man who appeared to be strong and well. Billy was right.' You could not wake him. He had gone the limit and a little beyond. He was now facing eternity. Sinton went out and closed the door. Your father is sick and needs help, he said. You stay here and I will send a man to see him. If you just let him alone, he'll sleep it off, volunteered Billy. 
He's that way all the time, but he wakes up and gets us something to eat after a while, only wait and twist you up inside pretty bad. The boy wore no air of complaint. He was merely stating facts. Wesley Sinton looked hard at Billy. Are you twisted up inside now? he asked. Billy laid a grimy hand on the region of his stomach, and the filthy little waist sank close to the backbone. Bet your life, boss, he said cheerfully. How long have you been twisted? asked Sinton. Billy appealed to the others. When was it we had that stuff on the bridge? Yesterday morning, said the girl. Is that all gone? asked Sinton. She went and told us to take it home, said Billy ruefully, and cause she said to, we took it. Pa had come back, he was drinking some more, and he ate a lot of it, most the whole thing, and it made him sick as a dog, and he went and wasted all of it. Then he got drunk some more, and now he's asleep again. We didn't get hardly none. You children sit on the steps until the man comes, said Senton. I'll send you some things to eat with him. What's your name, Sonny? Billy, said the boy. Well, Billy, I guess you better come with me. I'll take care of him, Senton promised the others. He reached a hand to Billy. I ain't no baby, I'm a boy, said Billy as he shuffled along beside Senton, taking a kick at every movable object without regard to his battered toes. Once they passed a great Dane dog lolling after its master, and Billy ascended Senton as if he was a tree and clung to him with trembling hot hands. I ain't afraid of that dog, scoffed Billy as he was again placed on the walk, but once he took me for a rat or something and his teeth cut into my back, if I'd done right, I'd have took the law on him. Sinton looked down into the indignant little face. The child was bright enough, he had a good head, but oh, such a body. I about got enough of dogs, said Billy. I used to like him, but I'm getting pretty tired. You ought to see the lick and Jimmy and Belle and me give our dog when we caught him for taking the little bird she gave us. We waited till he was asleep, then laid a board on him and all of us jumped on it to once. You could have heard him yell a mile. Bell said Meb we could squeeze the bird out of him, but squeeze nothing. He was holler as us, and that bird was lost long for it got to his stomach. It was east the little one anyway. Bell said it wouldn't have made a bite apiece for three of us, no how, and the dog got one good swaller. We didn't get much of the meat either. Pa took most of that. Seems like paws and dogs gets everything. Billy laughed ruefully. Involuntarily, Wesley sent him reached his hand. They were coming into the business part of Onabasha, and the streets were crowded. Billy understood it to mean that he might lose his companion and took a grip. That little hot hand clinging tight to his, the sore feet recklessly scouring the walk, the hungry child panting for breath as he tried to keep even, the brave soul jesting in the face of hard luck, caught Sinton in a tender, empty spot. "'Say, son,' he said, "'how would you like to be washed clean "'and have all the supper your skin could hold "'and sleep in a good bed?' "'Ah, gee,' said Billy, "'I ain't dead yet. "'Them things is in heaven. "'Poor folks can't have them. "'Pa said so.' "'Well, you can have them "'if you want to go with me and get them,' "'promised Sinton. "'Honest?' "'Yes, honest.' "'Crossed your heart?' "'Yes,' said Sinton. "'Can I take some to Jimmy and Bell?' If you'll come with me and be my boy, I'll see that they have plenty. What will Pa say? Your Pa is in that kind of sleep now where he won't wake up, Billy, said Sinton. I'm pretty sure the law will give you to me if you want to come. When people don't ever wake up, they're dead, announced Billy. Is my Pa dead? Yes, he is, answered Sinton. And you'll take care of Jimmy and Belle, too? I can't adopt all three of you, said Sinton. I'll take you and see that they are well provided for. Will you come? Yep, I'll come, said Billy. Let's eat. First thing we do. All right, agreed Sinton. Come into this restaurant. He lifted Billy to the lunch counter and ordered the clerk to give him as many glasses of milk as he wanted and a biscuit. I think there's going to be fried chicken when we get home, Billy, he said. So you just take the edge off now and fill up later. While Billy lunched, Sinton called up the different departments and notified the proper authorities ending with the Women's Relief Association. He sent a basket of food to Belle and Jimmy, bought Billy a pair of trousers and a shirt, and went to bring Elnora. "'Why, Uncle Wesley!' cried the girl. "'Where did you find Billy?' "'I've adopted him for the time being, if not longer,' replied Sinton. "'Where did you get him?' queried the astonished Elnora. "'Well, young woman,' said Sinton, "'Mr. Brownlee told me the history of your lunchbox. 
and it seemed so funny to me as it does to the rest of them. So I went to look up the father of Billy's family and make him take care of them, or allow the law to do it for him. It will have to be the law. He's deader than anything, broke in Billy. He can't ever take all the meat any more. Billy, gasped Elnora. Never you mind, said Zenton. A child don't say such things about a father who loved and raised him, right? When it happens, the father alone is to blame. You won't hear Billy talk like that about me when I cross over. You don't mean you're going to take him to keep? I'll soon need help, said Zenton. Billy will come in just about right ten years from now, and if I raise him, I'll have him the way I want him. But Aunt Margaret don't like boys, objected Elnora. Well, she likes me, and I used to be a boy. Anyways, I remember she has had her way about everything at our house ever since we were married. I'm going to please myself about Billy. Hasn't she always done just as she chose so far as you know? Honest, Elnora. Honest, replied Elnora. You are beautiful to all of us, Uncle Wesley, but Aunt Margaret won't like Billy. She won't want him in her home. In our home, corrected Sinton. What makes you want him? marveled Elnora. God only knows, said Sinton. Billy ain't so beautiful and he ain't so smart. I guess it's because he's so human. My heart goes out to him. So did mine, said Elnora. I love him. I'd rather see him eat my lunch than have it myself any time. What makes you like him? asked Sinton. Why, I don't know, pondered Elnora. He's so little, he needs so much, he's got such splendid grit, and he's perfectly unselfish with his brother and sister. But we must wash him before Aunt Margaret sees him. I wonder if Mother... You needn't bother. I'm going to take him home the way he is, said Sinton. I want Maggie to see the worst of it. I'm afraid, began Elnora. So am I, said Sinton. But I won't give him up. He's taken a sort of grip on my heart. I've always been crazy for a boy. Don't let him hear us. Don't let him get killed, cried Elnora. During their talk, Billy had wandered to the edge of the walk and barely escaped the wheels of a passing automobile in an effort to catch a stray kitten that seemed in danger. Sinton drew Billy back to the walk and held his hand closely. Are you ready, Elnora? Yes, you were gone a long time, she said. Sinton glanced at a package she carried. Have to have another book? he asked. No, I got this for Mother. I've had such splendid luck selling my specimens, I didn't feel right about keeping all the money for myself, so I saved enough from the Indian relics to get a few things I wanted. I would have liked to have gotten her address, but I didn't dare, so I compromised on a book. What did you select, Elnor? asked Sinton wonderingly. Well, said she, I've noticed Mother always seemed interested in anything Mark Twain wrote in the newspapers, and I thought it would cheer up a little, so I just got his Innocence Abroad. I haven't read it myself, but I've seen mention made of it all my life, and the critics say it's genuine fun. Good, cried Sinton. Good, you've made a splendid choice. It will take her mind off herself a lot, but she will scold you. Of course, assented Elnor, but possibly she will read it and feel better. I'm going to serve her a trick. I'm going to hide it until Monday and set it on her little shelf of books the last thing before I go away. She must have all of them by heart. When she sees a new one, she can't help being glad, for she loves to read, and if she has all day to get interested in, maybe she'll like it so she won't scold so much. We are both in for it, but I guess we are prepared. I don't know what Margaret will say, but I'm going to take Billy home and see. Maybe he can win with her as he did with us. Elnora had her doubts, but she did not say anything more. When they started home, Billy sat on the front seat. He drove with the hitching strap tied to the railing of the dashboard, flourished the whip, and yelled with delight. At first, Sinton laughed with him, but by the time he left Elnora with several packages at her gate, he was looking serious enough. Margaret was at the door as they drove up the lane. Sinton left Billy in the carriage, hitched the horses, and went to explain to her. He had not reached her before she cried, "'Look, Wesley, that child! You'll have a runaway!' Wesley looked and ran. Billy was standing in the carriage, slashing the meddlesome horses with the whip. "'See me make em go!' he shouted as the whip fell a second time. He did make them go. They took the hitching posts and a few fence palings, which scraped the paint from the wheel. Sinton missed the lines at the first effort, but the dragging posts impeded the horses, and he soon caught them. He led them to the barn and ordered Billy to remain in the carriage while he unhitched. Then, leading Billy and carrying his packages, he entered the yard. "'You run play a few minutes, Billy,' he said. "'I want to talk to the nice lady.' 
the nice lady was looking rather stupefied as Sinton approached her. "'Where in the name of sense did you get that awful child?' she demanded. "'He is a young gentleman who has been stopping Elnora and eating her lunch every day, part of the time with the assistance of his brother and sister, while our girl went hungry. Brownlee told me about it at the store. It's happened three days running. The first time she did without anything. The second time Brownlee's girl took her to lunch. And the third a crowd of high school girls bought a lot of stuff and met them at the bridge. The youngsters seemed to think they could rob her every day, so I went to see their father about having it stopped. "'Well, I should think so,' cried Margaret. "'There were three of them, Margaret,' said Sinton. "'That little fellow—' "'Hyena, you mean,' interpolated Margaret. "'Hyena,' corrected Sinton gravely. "'And another boy and a girl, all equally dirty and hungry. "'The man was dead. "'They thought he was in a drunken sleep, but he was stone dead. "'I brought the little boy with me and sent the officers and other help to the house. "'He's half starved. "'I want to wash him and put clean clothes on him and give him some supper.' "'Have you got anything to put on him?' "'Yes.' "'Where did you get it?' "'Bought it. It ain't much. All I got didn't cost a dollar.' "'A dollar is a good deal when you work and save for it the way we do.' "'Well, I don't know a better place to put it. Have you got any hot water? I'll use this tub at the cistern. Please give me some soap and towels.' Instead, Margaret pushed by him with a shriek. Billy had played by producing a cord from his pocket, and having tied the tails of Margaret's white kittens together, he had climbed on a box and hung them across the clothesline. Wild with fright, the kittens were clawing each other to death, and the air was white with fur. The string had twisted, and the frightened creatures could not recognize friends. Margaret stepped back with bleeding hands. Sinton cut the cord with his knife, and the poor little cats raced under the house, bleeding and disfigured. Margaret, white with wrath, faced Sinton. "'If you don't hitch up and take that animal back to town,' she said, "'I will—' Billy threw himself on the grass and began to scream. "'You said I could have fried chicken for supper,' he wailed. "'You said she was a nice lady.' Sinton lifted him, and something in his manner of handling the child infuriated Margaret. His touch was so gentle. She reached for Billy and gripped his shirt collar in the back. Sinton's hand closed over hers. "'Gently, girl,' he said. "'This little body is covered with sores.' "'Sores!' she ejaculated. "'Sores? What kind of sores?' "'Oh, they might be from bruises made by fists or boot toes, "'or they might be bad blood from wrong eating, "'or they might be pure filth. "'Will you hand me some towels?' "'No, I won't,' said Margaret. "'Well, give me some rags, then.' "'Margaret compromised on pieces of old tablecloth. "'Sent and led Billy to the cistern, "'pumped cold water into the tub, "'poured in a kettle of hot, and beginning at the head, scoured him. The boy shut his little teeth and said never a word, though he twisted occasionally when the soap struck a raw spot. Margaret watched the process from the window in amazed and ever-increasing anger. Where did Wesley learn it? How could his big hands be so gentle? Sinton came to the door. "'Have you got any peroxide?' he asked. "'A little,' she answered stiffly. "'Well, I need about a pint, but I'll begin on what you have.' Margaret handed him the bottle. Wesley took a cup, weakened the jug, and said to Billy, "'Man, these sores on you must be healed. Then you must eat the kind of food that's fit for little men. I'm going to put some medicine on you, and it is going to sting like fire. If it just runs off, I won't use any more. If it boils, there's poison in these places, and they must be tied up, dosed every day, and you must be washed and kept mighty clean. Now hold still, because I'm going to put it on.' "'I think the one on my leg is the worst,' said the undaunted Billy, holding out a raw place. Sent him poured on the drug. Billy's body twisted and writhed, but he did not run. "'Gee, look at it boil!' he cried. "'I guess they's poison. You'll have to do it to all of them.' Sinton's teeth were set as he watched the boy's face. He poured the drug, strong enough to do effective work, on a dozen places over that little body and bandaged all he could. Billy's lips quivered at times and his chin jumped, but he did not shed a tear or utter a sound other than to take a deep interest in the boiling. As Sinton put the small shirt on the boy and fastened the trousers, he was ready to reset the hitching post and mend the fence without a word. "'Now am I clean?' asked Billy. "'Yes, you are clean outside,' said Sinton. "'There is some dirty blood in your body and some bad words in your mouth that we have to get out, but that takes time.' If we put right things to eat into your stomach, that will do away with the sores. And if you know that I don't like bad words, you won't say them any oftener than you can help, will you, Billy? 
Billy leaned against Sinton in apparent indifference. "'I want to see me,' he demanded. Sinton led the boy into the house and lifted him to a mirror. "'My, I'm pretty good-looking, ain't I?' bragged Billy. Then, as Sinton stooped to set him on the floor, Billy's lips passed close to the big man's ear and hastily whispered a vehement, "'No!' as he ran for the door. "'How long until supper, Margaret?' asked Sinton as he followed. "'You are going to keep him for dinner?' she asked. "'Sure,' said Sinton. "'That's what I brought him for. "'It's likely he never had a good square meal of decent food in his life. "'He's starved to the bone.' Margaret rose deliberately, removed the white cloth from the supper table, and substituted an old red one she used to wrap the bread. She put away the pretty dishes they commonly used, and set the table with old plates for pies and kitchen utensils. But she fried the chicken and was generous with milk and honey, snowy bread, gravy, potatoes, and fruit. Sinton repainted the scratch wheel. He mended the fence, with Billy holding the nails and handing the pickets. Then he filled the old hole, digged a new one, and set the hitching post. Billy hopped on one foot at his task of holding the post steady as the earth was packed around it. There was not the shadow of a trouble on his little freckled face. Sinton threw in stones and pounded the earth solid around the post. The sound of a gulping sob attracted him to Billy. The tears were rolling down his cheeks. "'If I'd a knowed you'd have to get down in a hole and work so hard, I wouldn't a hit the horses,' he said." "'Never you mind, Billy,' said Sinton. "'You will know next time, so you can think over it "'and make up your mind whether you really want to before you strike.' "'Sinton went to the barn and put away the tools. "'He thought Billy was at his heels, but the boy lagged on the way. "'A big snowy turkey gobbler resented the small intruder "'in his especial preserves, and with spread tail and dragging wings "'came at him threateningly. "'If that turkey gobbler had known the sort of things "'with which Billy was accustomed to holding his own,' He never would have issued that challenge. Billy accepted instantly. He danced around with stiff arms at his sides and imitated the gobbler. Then came his opportunity, and he jumped on the big turkey's back. Wesley heard Margaret scream in time to see the flying leap and admire its dexterity. The turkey tucked its tail and scampered. Billy slid from his back, and as he fell, he clutched wildly, caught the folded tail, and instinctively hung on for life. The turkey gave one scream and relaxed its muscles. Then it fled in disfigured defeat to the haystack. Billy scrambled to his feet, holding the tail, and his eyes were bulging. "'Why, the blasted old thing came off!' he said to Sinton, holding out the tail in amazed wonder. Sinton, caught suddenly, forgot everything and roared. Seeing which, Billy thought a turkey tail of no account and flung that one high above him, shouting in wild, childish laughter as the feathers scattered and fell. Margaret, watching, burst into tears. Wesley had gone mad. For the first time in her married life, she wanted to tell her mother. When Wesley had waited until he was so hungry he could wait no longer, he invaded the kitchen to find a cooked supper baking on the back of the stove, while Margaret, with red eyes, nursed a pair of demoralized white kittens. "'Is supper ready?' he asked. "'It has been for an hour,' answered Margaret. "'Why didn't you call us?' That us had too much comradeship in it. It irritated Margaret. I suppose it would take you even longer than that to fix things decent again. As for my turkey and my poor little kittens, they don't matter. I am mighty sorry about them, Margaret. You know that. Billy is very bright, and he will soon learn. Soon learn? cried Margaret. Wesley Sinton, you don't mean to say that you think of keeping that creature here for some time? No, I think of keeping a decent, well-behaved little boy. Margaret set the supper on the table. Seeing the old red cloth, Wesley stared in amazement. Then he understood. Billy capered around in delight. "'Ain't that pretty?' he exulted. "'I wish Jimmy and Belle could see. "'We, why, we east eat out of our hands or off an old dry goods box, "'and when we fix up a lot, we have newspaper. "'We ain't ever had a nice red cloth like this.' Wesley looked straight at Margaret so intently that she turned away, her face flushing. He stacked the dictionary and the geography of the world on a chair and lifted Billy beside him. He heaped a plate generously, cut the food, put a fork into Billy's little fist, and made him eat slowly and properly. Billy did his best. Occasionally greed overcame him, and he used his left hand to pop a bite into his mouth with his fingers. These lapses Wesley patiently overlooked and went on with his general instructions. Luckily, Billy did not spill anything on his clothing or the cloth. After supper, Wesley took him to the barn until he finished the night work. Then he went and sat by Margaret on the front porch. 
Billy appropriated the hammock and swung by pulling a rope tied around a tree. The very energy with which he went at the work of swinging himself appealed to Wesley. "'Mercy, but he's an active little body,' he said. "'There isn't a lazy bone in him. See how he works to pay for his fun.' "'There goes his foot through it,' cried Margaret. "'Wesley, he shall not ruin my hammock.' "'Of course he shan't,' said Wesley. "'Wait, Billy, let me show you.' Thereupon he explained to Billy that ladies wearing beautiful white dresses sat in hammocks, so little boys must not put their dusty feet in them. They must just sit in them and let their feet hang down. Billy immediately sat and allowed his feet to swing. Margaret, said Sinton after a long silence on the porch, isn't it true that if Billy had been a half-starved, sore cat, dog, or animal of any sort that you would have pitied and helped care for it and been glad to see me get any pleasure out of it I could? Yes, said Margaret coldly. But because I brought a child with an immortal soul, there is no welcome. That isn't a child. It's an animal. You just said you would have welcomed an animal. Not a wild one. I meant a tame beast. Billy is not a beast, said Wesley hotly. He is a very dear little boy. Margaret, you've always done the church going and Bible reading for this family. How do you reconcile that suffer little children to come unto me with the way you are treating Billy? Margaret arose. I haven't treated that child. I've only let him alone. I can barely hold myself. He needs a hide tanned about off him. If you'd care to look at his body, you'd know that you couldn't find a place to strike without cutting into a raw spot, said Sinton. Besides, Billy has not done a thing for which a child should be punished. He is only full of life, no training, and with the boy's love and mischief. He did abuse your kittens, but an hour before I saw him risk his life to save one from being run over. He minds what you tell him and doesn't do anything he is told not to. He thinks of his brother and sister right away when anything pleases him. He took that stinging medicine with the grit of a bulldog. He is just a bully little chap and I love him. Oh, good heavens, cried Margaret, going into the house as she spoke. Sinton sat still. At last Billy, tired of the swing, came to him and leaned his slight body against the big knee. Am I going to sleep here? he asked. Sure you are, said Sinton. Billy swung his feet as he laid across Wesley's knee. Come on, said Sinton. I must clean you up for bed. You have to be just awful clean here, announced Billy. I like to be clean. You feel so good after the hurt is over. Sinton registered that remark and worked with a special tenderness as he redressed the ailing places and washed the dust from Billy's feet and hands. Where can he sleep? he asked Margaret. I'm sure I don't know, she answered. Oh, I can sleep in any place, said Billy, on the floor or anywhere. Home, I sleep on Pa's coat on the store box, and Jimmy and Belle, they sleep on the store box, too. I sleep between them so as I don't roll off and crack my head. Ain't you got a store box and an old coat? Sinton arose and opened a folding lounge. Then he brought an armload of clean horse blankets from a closet. These don't look like the nice white bed a little boy should have, Billy, he said, but we'll make them do. This will be a store box all hollow. Billy took a long leap for the lounge. When he found it bounced, he proceeded to bounce until he was tired. By that time, the blankets had to be refolded. Wesley had Billy take one end in help, while both of them seemed to enjoy the job. Then Billy lay down and curled up in his clothes like a little dog. But sleep would not come. Finally, he sat up. He stared around restlessly. Then he arose, went to Sinton, and leaned against his knee. Sinton picked up the boy and folded his arms around him. Billy sighed in rapturous content. That bed feels so lost-like, he said. Jimmy always jabbed me on one side and Bell on the other, and so I knew I was there. Sinton laughed the best he could. Do you know where they are? asked Billy. They are with kind people who gave them a fine supper, a clean bed, and will always take good care of them. I wished I was, Billy hesitated and looked earnestly at Sinton. I mean, I wish they was here. You are about all I can manage, Billy, said Sinton. Billy sat up. Can't she manage anything? he asked, waving toward Margaret. Indeed, yes, said Sinton. She has managed me for twenty years. My, but she made you nice, said Billy. I just love you. I wish she'd take Jimmy and Belle and make them nice as you. She isn't strong enough to do that, Billy. They will grow into a good boy and girl where they are. Billy slid from Sinton's arms and walked toward Margaret until he reached the middle of the room. Then he stopped and at last sat on the floor. Finally, he lay down and closed his eyes. 
This feels more like my bed. If only Jimmy and Belle was here to crowd up a little so it wasn't so alone like. Won't I do, Billy? asked Senton in a husky voice. Billy moved restlessly. Seems like, seems like toward night as if a body got kind of lonesome for a woman person, like her. Billy indicated Margaret and then closed his eyes so tight his small face wrinkled. Soon he was up again. Wished I had snap, he said. Oh, I ist wished I had snap. I thought you laid a board on snap and jumped on it, said Senton. We did, cried Billy. Oh, you oughta heard him squeal. Billy laughed loudly, then his face clouded. But I want Snap to lay beside me so bad now, that if he was here I'd give him a piece of my chicken, for I ate any. Do you like dogs? Yes, I do, said Sinton. Billy was up instantly. Would you like Snap? I'm sure I would, said Sinton. Would she? Billy indicated Margaret, and then he answered his own question. But of course she wouldn't, cause she likes cats and dogs chases cats. Oh dear, I thought for a minute maybe Snap could come here. Billy laid down and closed his eyes resolutely. Suddenly they flew open. Does it hurt to be dead? he demanded. Nothing hurts you after you are dead, Billy, said Senton. Yes, but I mean, does it hurt getting to be dead? Sometimes it does. It did not hurt your father, Billy. It came softly while he was asleep. It is came softly? Yes. I kind of wished he wasn't dead, said Billy. Of course I like to stay with you and the fried chicken and the nice soft bed and, and everything and I like to be clean, but he took us to the show and he got us gum and he never hurt us when he wasn't drunk. Billy drew a deep breath and tightly closed his eyes, but very soon they opened. Then he sat up. He looked at Sinton pitifully and then he glanced at Margaret. You don't like boys, do you? he questioned. I like good boys, said Margaret. Billy was at her knee instantly. Well, say I'm a good boy, he announced joyously. I do not think boys who hurt helpless kittens and pull out turkeys' tails are good boys. Yes, but I didn't hurt the kittens, explained Billy. They got mad about it's the little fun and scratch each other. I didn't suppose they'd act like that. And I didn't pull the turkey's tail. I just held on to the first thing I grabbed and the turkey pulled. Honest, it was the turkey pulled, he turned to Sinton. You tell her, didn't the turkey pull? I didn't know its tail was loose, did I? I don't think you did, Billy, said Sinton. Billy stared into Margaret's cold face. Sometimes at night Belle sits on the floor and I lay my head in her lap. I could pull up a chair and lay my head in your lap, like this, I mean. Billy pulled up a chair, climbed on it, and laid his head on Margaret's lap. Then he shut his eyes again. Margaret could have looked little more repulsed if he had been a snake. Billy was soon up. My, but your lap is hard, he said, and you are a good deal fatter and Belle, too. He slid from the chair and came back to the middle of the room. Oh, but I wished he wasn't dead, he cried. The flood broke, and Billy screamed in desperation. Out of the night, a soft, warm young figure flashed through the door and with a swoop caught him in her arms. She dropped into a chair, nestled him closely, and drooped her fragrant brown head over his little bullet-eyed red one and rocked softly as she crooned over him. Billy boy, where have you been? Oh, I have been to seek a wife. She's the joy of my life, but then she's a young thing, and she can't leave her mammy. Billy gripped her with a death grip. Elnor wiped his eyes, kissed his face, swayed and sang. Why aren't you asleep? she asked at last. I don't know, said Billy. I tried. I tried awful hard, because I thought he wanted me to, but it just wouldn't come. Please tell her I tried, he appealed to Margaret. He did try to go to sleep, admitted Margaret. Maybe he can't sleep in his clothes, suggested Elnor. Haven't you an old dressing sack? I could roll the sleeves. Margaret got an old sack and Elnor put it on Billy. Then she brought a basin of water and bathed his face and head. She gathered him up and began to rock again. Have you got a paw? asked Billy. No, said Elnor. Is he dead like mine? Yes. Did it hurt him to die? I don't know. Billy was wide awake again. And it hurt my pa, he boasted. He has died while he was asleep. He didn't even know it was coming. I'm glad of that, said Elnor, pressing the little head against her breast again. Billy escaped her hand and sat up. I guess I won't go to sleep, he said. It might come softly and get me. It won't get you, Billy, said Elnor, rocking and singing between sentences. It don't get little boys. It just takes big people who are sick. 
Was my Pa sick?" "Yes," said Eleanor. "He had a dreadful sickness inside him that burned and made him drink things. That was why he would forget his little boys and girl. If he had been well, he would have gotten you good things to eat, clean clothes, and had the most fun with you." Billy leaned against her and closed his eyes, and Eleanor rocked hopefully. "If I was dead, would you cry?" He was up again. "Yes, I would," said Eleanor, gripping him closer until Billy almost squealed with the embrace. "'Do you love me tight as that?' he questioned blissfully. "'Yes, bushels and bushels,' said Eleanor. "'Better than any little boy in the whole world.' Billy looked at Margaret. "'She don't,' he said. "'She'd be glad if it would get me softly right now. "'She don't want me here at all.' Eleanor smothered his face against her breast and rocked. "'You love me, don't you?' "'I will, if you will go to sleep.' "'Every single day you will give me your dinner for the baloney, won't you?' said Billy." "'Yes, I will,' replied Eleanor. "'But you will have as good a lunch as I do after this. "'You will have milk, eggs, chicken, all kinds of good things, "'little pies and cakes, maybe.' "'Billy shook his head. "'I'm going back home soon as it is light,' he said. "'She don't want me. "'She thinks I'm a bad boy. "'She's going to whip me if he lets her. "'She said so. "'I heard her. "'Oh, I wish he hadn't died. "'I want to go home.' "'Billy shrieked again.' Mrs. Comstock had started to walk slowly and meet Elnora. The girl had been so late that her mother reached the scenting gate and came up the path until the picture inside became visible. Elnora had told her about Sinton taking Billy home. Mrs. Comstock had some curiosity to see how Margaret bore the unexpected addition to her family. Billy's voice, raised with excitement, was plainly audible. She could see Elnora holding him and hear his excited wail. Sinton's face was drawn and haggard, and Margaret sat in defiant. A very imp of perversity entered the breast of Mrs. Comstock and danced there. "'Hoity-toity!' she said as she suddenly appeared in the door. "'Blessed if I ever heard a man making sounds like that before!' Billy ceased suddenly. Mrs. Comstock was tall, angular, and her hair was prematurely white, for she was only thirty-six, though she looked fifty. But there was an expression on her usually cold face that was attractive just then, and Billy was in search of attractions. "'Have I stayed too late, Mother?' asked Elnora anxiously. "'I truly intended to come straight back, but I thought I could get Billy to sleep first. Everything is strange, and he's so nervous.' "'Is that your ma?' demanded Billy. "'Yes.' "'Does she love you?' "'Of course.' "'My mother didn't love me,' said Billy. "'She went away and left me and never came back.' She don't care what happens to me. You wouldn't go away and leave your little girl, would you? questioned Billy and Mrs. Comstock. No, said Katherine Comstock, and I wouldn't leave a little boy either. Billy was half off Elnora's knees. Do you like boys? he questioned. If there is anything I love, it is a boy, said Mrs. Comstock assuringly. Billy was on the floor. Do you like dogs? Yes, almost as well as boys. I'm going to buy a dog just as soon as I can find a good one. Billy swept toward her with a whoop. "'Do you want a boy?' he shouted. Catherine Comstock stretched out her arms and gathered him in. "'Of course I want a boy,' she rejoiced. "'Maybe you'd like to have me,' offered Billy. "'Sure I would,' triumphed Mrs. Comstock. "'Anyone would like to have you. You are just a real boy, Billy.' "'Will you take Snap? I'd like to have Snap almost as well as you.' "'Mother!' breathed Delnora imploringly. "'Don't! Oh, don't! He thinks you mean it!' "'And so I do mean it,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I'll take him in a jiffy. "'I throw away enough to feed a little tyke like him every day. "'His chatter would be great company while you are gone. "'Blood soon can be purified with right food and baths, "'and as for Snap, I meant to get a bulldog, "'but possibly Snap will serve just as well. "'All I ask of a dog is to bark at the right time. "'I'll do the rest. "'Would you like to come and be my boy, Billy?' Billy leaned against Mrs. Comstock, reached his arms around her neck, and gripped her with all his puny might. "'You can whip me all you want to,' he said. "'I won't make a sound.' Mrs. Comstock held him closely, and her hard face was softening. Of that there could not be a doubt. "'Now why would any one whip a nice little boy like you?' she asked wonderingly. "'She,' Billy from his refuge, waved toward Margaret, she was going to whip me because her cats fought when I tied their tails together and hung them over the line to dry. How did I know her old cats would fight? Mrs. Comstock began to laugh suddenly, and try as she would, she could not stop as soon as she desired. Billy studied her. Have you got turkeys? he demanded. 
"'Yes, flocks of them,' said Mrs. Comstock, vainly struggling to suppress her mirth and settle her face in its accustomed lines. "'Are their tails fast?' demanded Billy. "'Why, I think so,' marveled Mrs. Comstock. "'Hers ain't,' said Billy, with a wave toward Margaret that was becoming familiar. "'Her turkey pulled and its tail comes right off. "'She's going to whip me if he lets her. "'I didn't know the turkey would pull. "'I didn't know its tail would come off. "'I will never touch one again, will I?' "'Of course you won't,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'And what's more, I don't care if you do. "'I'd rather have a fine little man like you "'than all the turkeys in the country. "'Let them lose their old tails if they want to, "'and let the cats fight. "'Cats and turkeys don't compare with boys "'who are going to be fine big men some of these days.' "'Then Billy and Mrs. Comstock hugged each other rapturously, "'and their audience stared in silent amazement. "'You like boys!' exulted Billy, "'and his head dropped against Mrs. Comstock in unspeakable content. "'Yes, and if I don't have to carry you the whole way home, "'we must start right now,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'You are going to be asleep before you know it.' "'Billy opened his eyes and braced himself. "'I can walk,' he said proudly. "'All right, we must start. Come, Elnora. Good night, folks.' "'Mrs. Comstock set Billy on the floor and arose, gripping his hand.' "'You take the other side, Elnor, and we will help him as much as we can,' she said. Elnor stared piteously at Margaret, then at Wesley, and arose in white-faced bewilderment. "'Billy, are you going to leave without even saying good-bye to me?' asked Sinton with a great gulp in his throat. Billy held tight to Mrs. Comstock and Elnora. "'Good-bye,' he said casually. "'I'll come and see you sometime.' Wesley Sinton gave a smothered sob and strode from the room. Mrs. Comstock started for the door, dragging at Billy as Elnora pulled back, but Mrs. Sinton was before them, her eyes flashing. "'Kate Comstock, you think you are mighty smart, don't you?' she cried. "'I ain't in the lunatic asylum where you belong, anyway,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I am smart enough to tell a dandy boy when I see him, and I'm good and glad to get him. I'll love to have him.' "'Well, you won't have him,' exclaimed Margaret Sinton. "'That boy is Wesley's. He got him and brought him here. You can't come in and take him like that.' Let go of him. Not much I won't, cried Mrs. Comstock. Leave the poor sick little soul here for you to beat because he didn't know just how to handle things. Of course I'll make mistakes. He's got to have a lot of teaching, but not the kind he'll get from you. Clear out of my way. You let go of our boy, ordered Margaret. Why, do you want to whip him before he can go to sleep? jeered Mrs. Comstock. No, I don't, said Margaret. He's Wesley's and nobody shall touch him. Wesley! Wesley Sinton appeared behind Margaret in the doorway, and she turned to him. "'Make Kate Comstock let go of our boy,' she demanded. "'Billy, she wants you now,' said Wesley Sinton. "'She won't whip you, and she won't let anyone else. "'You can have stacks of good things to eat, ride in the carriage, and have a great time. "'Won't you stay with us?' Billy drew away from Mrs. Comstock and Elnora. He faced Margaret, his eyes shrewd with childish wisdom. Necessity had taught him to strike the hot iron, to drive the hard bargain.' "'Can I have Snap to live here always?' he demanded. "'Yes, you can have all the dogs you want,' said Margaret Sinton. "'Can I sleep close enough so as I can touch you?' "'Yes, you can move your lounge up so that you can hold my hand,' said Margaret. "'Do you love me now?' questioned Billy. "'I'll try to love you if you are a good boy,' said Margaret. "'Then I guess I'll stay,' said Billy, walking over to her. Out in the night, Elnora and her mother went down the road in the moonlight, and every few rods Mrs. Comstock laughed aloud. "'Mother, I don't understand you,' sobbed Elnora. "'Well, maybe when you have gone to high school longer you will,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Anyway, you saw me bring Mag sent into her senses, didn't you?' "'Yes, I did,' answered Elnora. "'But I thought you were in earnest. "'So did Billy and Uncle Wesley and Aunt Margaret.' "'Well, wasn't I?' inquired Mrs. Comstock. "'But you just said you brought Aunt Margaret, too.' "'Well, didn't I?' "'I don't understand you.' That's a reason I am recommending more schooling. Elnora took her candle and went to bed. Mrs. Comstock was feeling too good to sleep. Twice of late she really had enjoyed herself for the first time in sixteen years, and a sort of greediness for more of the same feeling crept into her blood-like intoxication. As she sat brooding alone, she knew the truth. She would have loved to take Billy. She would not have minded his mischief, his chatter, or his dog. He would have meant a sort of salvation from herself that she greatly needed. She was even sincere about the dog. She meant to tell Sinton to buy her one at the very first opportunity. Her last thought was of Billy. She chuckled softly, for she was not saintly, and now she knew what she could do that would fill her soul with grim satisfaction. End 
of chapter 7. Chapter 8 of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter 8 Wherein the Limberlost tempts Elnora and Billy buries his father. Immediately after dinner on Sunday, Wesley Sinton stopped at the Comstock gate to ask if Elnora wanted to go to town with him. Billy sat beside him, and he did not look as if he were on his way to a funeral. Elnora said she had a study and could not go but she suggested that her mother take her place. Mrs. Comstock put on her hat and went at once, which surprised Elnora. She did not know that her mother was anxious for an opportunity to speak with Senton alone. Elnora knew why she was repeatedly cautioned not to leave their land. If she went specimen hunting, to remain along the roads, or at least not to enter the swamp. She studied two hours and was several lessons ahead of her classes. There was no use to go farther. She would take a walk and see if she could gather any caterpillars or find any freshly spun cocoons. She searched the bushes and low trees behind the garden and all about the edge of the woods on their land, and having little success, at last came out to the road. Almost the first thorn bush she examined yielded a polyphemus cocoon. Elnora lifted her head with the instinct of a hunter on the chase and began work. She reached the swamp before she knew it, carrying five find cocoons of different species as her reward. She pushed back her hair and gazed around longingly. A few rods inside she thought she saw cocoons on a bush to which she went and found several. Sense of caution was rapidly vanishing. She was in a fair way to forget everything and plunge into the swamp when she thought she heard footsteps coming down the trail. She went back and came out almost facing Pete Corson. That ended her difficulty. She had known him since childhood. When she sat on the front porch of the Brushwood schoolhouse, Pete had been one of the big boys at the back of the room. He had been rough and wild, but she never had been afraid of him, and often he had given her pretty things from the swamp. "'What luck!' she cried. "'I promised Mother I would not go inside the swamp alone, and will you look at the cocoons I found? They are more just screaming for me to come get them, because the leaves will fall with the first frost, and then the jays and crows will begin to tear them open.' I haven't much time since I'm going to school. You will go with me, Pete. Please say yes, just a little way. What are those things? asked the man, his keen black eyes fast upon her. They are the cases these big caterpillars spin for winter, and in the spring they come out great night moths, and I can sell them. Oh, Pete, I can sell them for enough to take me through high school and dress me so like the rest that I don't look different, and if I have very good luck, I can save some for college. Pete, please go with me. Why don't you go like you always have? Well, the truth is, I had a little scare, said Elnora. I never did mean to go alone. Sometimes I sort of wandered inside farther than I intended, chasing things. You know Duncan gave me Freckles' books, and I've been gathering moths like he did. Lately I found I could sell them. If I can make a complete collection, I can get three hundred dollars for it. Three such collections would take me almost through college, and I have four years in high school yet. That's a long time. I might get them. Can every kind there is be found here? No, not all of them. But when I get more than I need of one kind, I can trade them with collectors farther north and west so I can complete sets. It's the only way I stay to earn the money. Look what I have already. Big gray cecropias come from this kind, brown polyphemus from that, and green lunas from these. You aren't working on Sunday. Go with me just an hour, Pete. The man looked at her narrowly. She was young, wholesome, and beautiful. She was innocent, intensely in earnest, and she needed the money. He knew that. You didn't tell me what scared you, he said. Oh, I thought I did. Why, you know, I had Freckles' box packed full of moths and specimens, and one evening I sold some to the bird woman. Next morning I found a note telling me it wasn't safe to go inside the swamp. That sort of scared me. I think I'll go alone rather than miss the chance, but I'd be so happy if you would take care of me. Then I could go anywhere I chose, because if I married, you could pull me out. You will take care of me, Pete. That was the finishing stroke. Yes, I'll take care of you, promised Pete Corson. Goody, said Elnor. Let's start quick. And Pete, you look at these closely, and when you're hunting or going along the road, if one dangles under your nose, you cut off the little twig and save it for me, will you? Yes, I'll save you all I see, promised Pete. 
He pushed back his hat and followed Elnora. She plunged fearlessly through bushes, over underbrush, and across dead logs. One minute she was crying wildly that here was a big one, the next she was reaching for a limb above her head or on her knees over turning dead leaves under a hickory or oak tree, or pushing aside black muck with her bare hands as she searched for buried pupa cases. For the first hour Pete bent back bushes and followed, carrying what Elnora discovered. Then he found one. "'Is this the kind of thing you are looking for?' he asked bashfully as he presented a wild cherry twig. "'Oh, Pete, that's a Promethea. I'd even hope to find one.' "'What's the bird like?' asked Pete. "'Almost black wings,' said Elnora, "'with clay-colored edges and the most wonderful wine-colored flush over the underside if it's a male, "'and stronger wine above and below if it's a female. Oh, aren't I happy!' "'How would it do to make what you have into a bunch that we could leave here and come back for them?' That would be all right. Relieved of his load, Pete began work. First he narrowly examined the cocoons Elnora had found. He questioned her as to what other kinds would be like. He began to use the eyes of a trained woodman and hunter in her behalf. He saw several so easily and moved through the forest so softly that Elnora forgot the moths in watching him. Presently she was carrying the specimens and he was making the trips of investigation to see which was a cocoon and which a curled leaf or he was down on his knees digging around stumps. As he worked, he kept asking questions. What kind of logs were best to look beside? What trees were pupa cases most likely to be under? Or what bushes did caterpillars spin most frequently? Time passed, as it always does when one's occupation is absorbing. When the sentence had taken Mrs. Comstock home, they stopped to see if Elnora was safe. She was not at home, and they had not seen her along the way. Mrs. Comstock called about the edge of the woods and received no reply. Then Sinton turned and drove back to the Limberlost. He left Margaret and Mrs. Comstock holding the team and entertaining Billy and entered the swamp. Elnora and Pete had left a wide trail behind them. Before Sinton had thought of calling, he heard voices and approach with some caution. Soon he saw Elnora, her flushed face beaming as she bent with an armload of twigs and branches and talked to a kneeling man. Now go cautiously, she was saying. I'm just sure we will find an imperialist here. It's their very kind of a place. There, what did I tell you? Isn't that splendid? Oh, I'm so glad you came with me. Sinton stood and stared in speechless astonishment, for the man had risen, brushed the dirt from his hands, and held out to Elnora a small, shiny, dark pupa case. As his face swung into view, Sinton almost cried out, for he was the one man of all others Wesley knew with whom he most feared, for Elnora's safety. She had him on his knees digging pupa cases for her from the loose swamp loam. Elnora, called Sinton. Elnora. Oh, Uncle Wesley, cried the girl. See what luck we've had. I know we have a dozen and a half cocoons and we have three pupa cases. It's much harder to get the cases because you have to dig for them and you can't see where to look. But Pete is fine at it. He's found three and he says he will keep watch along the roads and through the woods as he hunts. Isn't that splendid of him? Uncle Wesley, there's a college over there on the western edge of the swamp. Look closely and you can see the great dome up among the clouds. I should say you have had luck, said Sinton, striving to make his voice natural. But I thought you were not coming to the swamp. Well, I wasn't, said Elnor, but I couldn't find many anywhere else. Honest, I couldn't. And just as soon as I came to the edge, I began to see them here. I kept my promise. I didn't come in alone. Pete came with me. He's so strong, he isn't afraid of anything, and he's perfectly splendid to locate cocoons. He's found half of these. Come on, Pete. It's getting dark now, and we must go. They started for the trail, Pete carrying the cocoons. He left them at the case while Elnor and Sinton went on to the carriage together. Elnora Comstock, what does this mean? demanded her mother. It's all right. One of the neighbors was with her, and she got several dollars worth of stuff, interposed Sinton. You ought to see my pa, shouted Billy. He was just all whited out, and he laid as still as anything. They put him away deep in the ground. Billy, breathed Margaret in a prolonged groan. Jimmy and Belle are going to be together in a nice place. They're coming to see me, and Snap is right down here by the wheel. Here, Snap. My, but he'll be tickled to get something to eat. He's most twisted as me. They get new clothes and all they want to eat, too, but they'll miss me. They could have got along without me. I took care of them. I had a lot of things give to me because I was the littlest, and I always divided with them. But they won't need me now. When she left the carriage, Mrs. Comstock gravely shook hands with Billy. Remember, she said to him, 
I love boys and I love dogs. Whenever you don't have a good time up there, take your dog and come right down and be my little boy. We will just have loads of fun. You should hear the whistles I can make. If you aren't treated right, you come straight to me. Billy wagged his head sagely. You as bad I will, he said. Mother, how could you? asked Elnora as they walked up the path. How could I, Missy? You better ask how couldn't I? I just couldn't. Not for enough to pay my road tax. Not for enough to pay the road tax and the dredge tax, too. Aunt Margaret always has been lovely to me, and I don't think it's fair to worry her. I choose to be lovely to Billy and let her sweat out her own worries just as she has me these sixteen years. There's nothing in all this world so good for people as getting a dose of their own medicine. The difference is that I am honest. I just say in plain English, if they don't treat you right, come to me. They have only said it in actions and inferences. I want to teach Mag Senton how her own dose is taste, but she begins to sputter before I fairly get the spoon to her lips. Just you wait. When I think when I owe her, began Elnora, well, thank goodness I don't owe her anything, and so I'm perfectly free to do what I choose. Come on and help me get supper. I'm hungry as Billy. Margaret sent him rock slowly back and forth in her chair. On her breast lay Billy's red head. One hand clutched her dress front with spasmodic grip, even after he was unconscious. You mustn't begin that, Margaret, said Sinton. He's too heavy, and it's bad for him. He's better off to lie down and go to sleep alone. He's very light, Wesley. He jumps and quivers so. He has to be stronger than he is now before he will sleep soundly. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, wherein Elnora discovers a violin and Billy disciplines Margaret. Elnora missed the little figure at the bridge the next morning. She slowly walked up the street and turned in at the wide entrance to the school grounds. She scarcely could comprehend that only a week ago she had gone there friendless, alone, and so sick at heart that she was physically ill. Today she had decent clothing, books, friends, and her mind was at ease to work on her studies. As she approached home that night, the girl paused in amazement. Her mother had company, and she was laughing. Elnora entered the kitchen softly and peeped into the sitting room. Mrs. Comstock sat in her chair, holding a book, and every few seconds a soft chuckle broke into a real laugh. Mark Twain was doing his work, while Mrs. Comstock was not lacking in a sense of humor. Elnora entered the room before her mother saw her. Mrs. Comstock looked up with flushed face. "'Where did you get this?' she demanded. "'I bought it,' said Elnora. "'Bought it? With all the taxes due?' "'I paid for it out of my Indian money, mother,' said Elnora. "'I couldn't bear to spend so much on myself and nothing at all on you. I was afraid to buy the dress I should have liked to, and I thought the book would be company while I was gone. I haven't read it, but I do hope it's good.' "'Good! It's the biggest piece of foolishness I have read in all my life. I've laughed all day ever since I found it. I had a notion to go out and read some of it to the cows and see if they wouldn't laugh.' "'If it made you laugh, it's a wise book,' said Elnora. "'Wise!' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You can stake your life it's a wise book. It takes the smartest man there is to do this kind of fooling.' And she began laughing again. Elnora, highly satisfied with her purchase, went to her room and put on her working clothes. Thereafter, she made a point of getting a book that she thought would interest her mother from the library every week and leaving it on the sitting-room table. Every night, she carried home at least two school books and studied until she had mastered the points of each lesson. She did her share of the work faithfully, and every available minute she was in the field searching for cocoons, for the moths promised to become her best source of income. She gathered large baskets of nests, flowers, mosses, insects, and all sorts of natural history specimens, and sold them to the grade teachers. At first she tried to tell these instructors what to teach their pupils about the specimens, but recognizing how much more she knew than they, one after another begged her to study at home and use her spare hours in school to exhibit and explain nature subjects to their pupils. Elnora loved the work, and she needed the money, for every few days some matter of expense arose that she had not expected. From the first week she had been received and invited with the crowd of girls in her class, and it was their custom in passing through the business part of the city to stop at the confectioners and take turns in treating to expensive candies, 
ice cream sodas, hot chocolate, or whatever they fancied. When first Elnora was asked, she accepted without understanding. The second time she went because she seldom had tasted these things, and they were so delicious she could not resist. After that she went because she knew all about it and had decided to go. She had spent a half hour on the log by the trail in deep thought and had arrived at her conclusions. She worked harder than usual for the next week, but she seemed to thrive on work. It was October, and the red leaves were falling when her first time came to treat. As the crowd flocked down the broad walk that night, Elnora called, "'Girls, it's my treat tonight. Come on!' She led the way through the city to the grocery they patronized when they had a small spread, and entering came out with a basket, which she carried to the bridge on her home road. There she arranged the girls in two rows on the cement abutments, and opening her basket, she gravely offered each girl an exquisite little basket of bark, lined with red leaves, in one end of which nestled a juicy big red apple, and in the other a spicy doughnut not an hour from Margaret Sinton's frying basket. Another time she offered big balls of popped corn stuck together with maple sugar, and liberally sprinkled with beechnut kernels. Again it was hickory nut kernels glazed with sugar, another time maple candy, and once a basket of warm pumpkin pies. She never made any apology or offered any excuse. She simply gave what she could afford, and the change was as welcome to those city girls, accustomed to sodas and French candy, as were these same things to Elnora surfeited on popcorn and pie. In her room was a little slip containing a record of the number of weeks in the school year, the times it would be her turn to treat, and the dates on which such occasions would fall, with the number of suggestions by each. Once the girls almost fought over a basket lined with yellow leaves and filled with fat, very ripe red haws. In late October there was a riot over one which was lined with red leaves and contained big, fragrant pawpaws frostbitten to a perfect degree. Thin hazelnuts were ripe, and once they served. One day Elnora, at her wit's end, explained to her mother that the girls had given her things and she wanted to treat them. Mrs. Comstock, with characteristic stubbornness, had said she would leave a basket at the grocery for her, but firmly declined to say what would be in it. All day Elnora struggled to keep her mind on her books. For hours she wavered in tense uncertainty. What would her mother do? Should she take the girls to the confectioner's that night or risk the basket? Mrs. Comstock could make delicious things to eat, but would she? As they left the building, Elnora made a final rapid mental calculation. She could not see her way clear to a decent treat for ten people for less than two dollars, and if the basket was nice, then the money would be wasted. She decided to risk it. As they went to the bridge, the girls were betting on what the treat would be, and crowding near Elnora like spoiled small children. Elnora set down the basket. Girls, she said, I don't know what this is myself, so all of us are going to be surprised. Here goes! She lifted the cover, and perfumes from the land of spices rolled up. In one end of the basket lay ten enormous sugar cakes, the tops of which had been liberally dotted with circles cut from stick candy. The candy had melted in baking and made small transparent wells of waxy sweetness, and in the center of each cake was a fat turtle made from a raisin with clothes for head and feet. The remainder of the basket was filled with big spiced pears that could be held by their stems while they were eaten. The girl shrieked and attacked the cookies, and of all the treats Elnora offered, perhaps none was quite so long remembered as that. When Elnora took her basket, placed her books in it, and started home, all the girls went with her as far as the fence where she crossed the field to the swamp. When they parted, they kissed her goodbye. Elnora was a happy girl as she hurried home to thank her mother. She was happy over her books that night, and happy all the way to school the next morning. When the music swelled from the orchestra, her heart almost broke with throbbing joy, for music always had affected her strangely, and since she had been comfortable enough in her surroundings to notice things, she had listened to every note to find what it was that literally hurt her heart, and at last she knew. It was the talking of the violins. They were human voices, and they spoke a language Elnora understood. It seemed to her that she must climb up on the stage, take the instruments from the fingers of the players, and make them speak what was in her heart. She fairly prayed to get hold of one, if only for a second. That night she said to her mother, I am perfectly crazy for a violin. I'm sure I could play one, sure as I live. Did anyone? Elnora never completed that sentence. Hush! thundered Mrs. Comstock. Be quiet. Never mention those things before me again. Never as long as you live. 
I loathe them. They are a snare of the very devil himself. They were made to lure men and women from their homes and their honor. If ever I see you with one in your fingers, I will smash it in pieces. Naturally, Elnora hushed, but she thought of nothing else after she had done justice to her lessons. At last there came a day when, for some reason, the leader of the orchestra left his violin on the grand piano. That morning, Elnora made her first mistake in algebra. At noon, as soon as the great building was empty, she slipped into the auditorium, found the side door which led to the stage, and going through the musician's entrance, she took the violin. She carried it back into the little side room where the orchestra assembled, closed all the doors, opened the case, and lifted out the instrument. She laid it on her breast, dropped her chin on it, and drew the bow softly across the strings. One after another, she tested the open notes. They reminded her of things. Gradually, her stroke ceased to tremble, and she drew the bow firmly. Then her fingers began to fall in softly, slowly, she searched up and down those strings for sounds she knew. Standing in the middle of the floor, she tried over and over. It seemed scarcely a minute before the hall was filled with the sound of hurrying feet, and she was forced to put away the violin and go to her classes. Of food she never thought until she noticed how heavy her lunchbox was on the way home, so she sat on the log by the swamp and remedied that. The next day she prayed that the violin would be left again, but her petition was not answered. That night when she returned from the school, she made an excuse to go down to see Billy. He was engaged in holding walnuts by driving them through holes in a board. His hands were protected by a pair of Margaret's old gloves, but he had speckled his face generously. He looked well and greeted Elnor hilariously. "'Me and the squirrels are laying up our winter stores,' he shouted. "'Cause the cold is coming, and the snow, and if we have any nuts we have to fix them now. But I'm ahead, cause Uncle Wesley made me this board, and I can hold a big pile while the old squirrel does only ist one with his teeth.' Elnor picked him up and kissed him. "'Billy, are you happy?' she asked. "'Yes, and so snap,' answered Billy. "'You ought to see him make the dirt fly when he gets after a chipmunk. "'I bet you he could dig up paw if anybody wanted him to.' "'Billy!' gasped Margaret as she came out to them. "'Well, me and Snap don't want him up. "'I bet you Jimmy and Belle don't either. "'I ain't been twisty inside once since I've been here, "'and I don't want to go away, and Snap don't either. "'He told me so.' "'Billy, that is not true. "'Dogs can't talk,' cautioned Margaret.' "'Then what makes you open the door when he asks you to?' demanded Billy. "'Scratching and whining isn't talking. "'Anyway, it's the best Snap can talk, and you get up and do things he wants done. "'Chipmunks can holler, too. "'You ought to hear them damn things holler when Snap gets them. "'Billy, when you want a cookie for supper and I don't give it to you, "'it is because you said a wrong word. "'Well, for... "'Billy clapped his hand over his mouth and stained his face in swipes. "'Well, for anything!' Did I go and forget again? The cookies will get all hard, won't they? I bet you ten dollars I don't say that any more. He espied Wesley and ran to show him a walnut too big to go through the holes, and Elnora and Margaret went into the house. They talked of many things for a time, and then Elnora said suddenly, Aunt Margaret, I like music. I've noticed that in you all your life, answered Margaret. If dogs can't talk, I can make a violin talk, announced Elnora and then in amazement watched the face of margaret Sinton grow pale a violin she wavered where did you get a violin they fairly seemed to speak to me in the orchestra one day the conductor left his in the auditorium and i took it and aunt margaret i can make it do the wind in the swamp the birds and the animals i can make any sound i ever heard on it if i had a chance to practice a little i could make it do the orchestra music too i don't know how i know but i do did "'Did you ever mention it to your mother?' faltered Margaret. "'Yes, and she seems prejudiced against them. "'But, oh, Aunt Margaret, I never felt so about anything, "'not even going to school. "'I just feel as if I'd die if I didn't have one. "'I could keep it at school and practice at noon a whole hour. "'Soon they'd ask me to play in the orchestra. "'I could keep it in the case and practice in the woods in summer. "'You'd let me play here over Sunday. "'Oh, Aunt Margaret, what does one cost? "'Would it be wicked for me to take of my money and buy a very cheap one?' I could play on the least expensive one made. Oh, no, you couldn't. A cheap machine makes cheap music. You got to have a fine fiddle to make it sing. But there's no sense in your buying one. There isn't a decent reason on earth why you shouldn't have your fa- My father's, cried Elnora. She caught Margaret Sinton by the arm. My father had a violin. He played it. That's why I can. 
Where is it? Is it in our house? Is it in Mother's room?" "Oh, Nora!" panted Margaret. "Your mother will kill me! She always hated it." "Mother dearly loves music," said Eleanor. "Not when it took the man she loved away from her to make it." "Where is my father's violin?" "Eleanora!" "I've never seen a picture of my father. I've never heard his name mentioned. I've never had a scrap that belonged to him. Was he my father, or am I a charity child like Billy, and so she hates me?" "She's got good pictures of him. Seems she just can't bear to hear him talked about. Of course he was your father. They lived right there when you were born. She don't dislike you. She just tries to make herself think she does. There's no sense in the world in you not having his violin. I've a great notion. Has she got it? No, I've never heard her mention it. It was not at home when he, when he died. Do you know where it is? Yes, I'm the only person on earth who does except the one who has it. Who is that? I can't tell you, but I will see if they have it yet and get it if I can. But if your mother finds it out, she will never forgive me. I can't help it, said Elnora. I want that violin. I want it now. I'll go tomorrow and get it if it has not been destroyed. Destroyed? Oh, Aunt Margaret, would anyone dare? I hardly think so. It was a good instrument. He played it like a master. Tell me, breathed Elnora. His hair was red and curled more than yours, and his eyes were blue. He was tall, slim, and the very imp of mischief. He joked and teased all day until he picked up that violin. Then his head bent over it, and his eyes got big and earnest. He seemed to listen as if he first heard the notes and then copied them. Sometimes he drew the bow trembly, like he wasn't sure it was right, and he might have to try again. He could almost drive you crazy when he wanted to, and no man that ever lived could make you dance as he could. He made it all up as he went. He seemed to listen for his dancing music, too. It appeared to come to him. He began to play, and you had to keep time or die. You couldn't be still. He loved to sweep a crowd around with that bow of his. I think it was the thing you call inspiration. I can see him now, his handsome head bent, his cheeks red, his eyes snapping, and that bow going across the strings and driving us like sheep. He always kept his body swinging, and he loved to play. She often slighted his work shamefully and sometimes her a little. That is why she hated it. Elnor, what are you making me do? The tears were rolling down Elnor's cheeks. Oh, Aunt Margaret, she sobbed. Why haven't you told me about him sooner? I feel as if you had given my father to me living so that I could touch him. I can see him, too. Why didn't you ever tell me before? Go on, go on. I can't, Elnora. I'm scared to death. I never meant to say anything. If I hadn't promised her not to talk of him to you, she wouldn't have let you come here. She made me swear it. But why? Why? Was he ashamed? Was he disgraced? Maybe it was that unjust feeling that took possession of her when she couldn't help him from the swamp. She had to blame someone or go crazy, so she took it out on you. At times those first ten years, if I had talked to you and you had repeated anything to her, she might have struck you too hard. She was not master of herself. You must be patient with her, Elnora. God only knows what she has gone through, but I think she is a little better lately. So do I, said Elnora. She seems more interested in my clothes, and she fixes me such delicious lunches that the girls bring fine candies and cake and beg to trade. I gave half my lunch for a box of candy one day, brought it home to her, and told her. Since she has wanted me to carry a market basket and treat the crowd every day, she was so pleased. Life has been too monotonous for her. I think she enjoys even the little change made by my going and coming. She sits up half the night to read the library books I bring, but she is so stubborn she won't even admit that she touches them. Tell me more about my father. Wait until I see if I can get the violin. So Elnora went home in suspense, and that night she added to her prayers, Dear Lord, be merciful to my father, and oh, do help Aunt Margaret to get his violin. Wesley and Billy came into supper tired and hungry. Billy ate heartily, but his eyes often rested on a plate of tempting cookies, and when Wesley offered them to the boy, he reached for one. Margaret was compelled to explain that cookies were forbidden that night. What? said Wesley. Wrong word's been coming again. Oh, Billy, I do wish you could remember. I can't sit and eat cookies before a little boy who has none. I'll have to put mine back, too. Billy's face was a puzzle. It twisted in despair. Aw, oh, go on, he said gruffly but his chin was jumping, for Wesley was his idol. "'Can't do it,' said Wesley. "'It would choke me.' Billy turned to Margaret. "'You make him,' he appealed. 
"He can't, Billy," said Margaret. "I know how he feels. You see, I can't myself." Then Billy slid from his chair, ran to the couch, buried his face in the pillow, and cried heartbrokenly. Wesley hurried to the barn and Margaret to the kitchen. When the dishes were almost washed, Billy slipped from the back door. Wesley, piling hay into the mangers, heard a sound behind him and inquired, "'That you, Billy?' "'Yes,' answered Billy. "'And it's all so dark you can't see me now, isn't it?' "'Well, mighty near,' answered Wesley. "'Then you stoop down and open your mouth.' Sinton had shared bites of apples and nuts for weeks, for Billy had not learned how to eat anything without dividing with Jimmy and Belle. Since he was separated from them, he shared with Wesley and Margaret. So he bent over the small figure and received an installment of cookie that almost choked him. "'Now you can eat it!' shouted Billy in delight. "'It's all dark. I can't see what you're doing at all!' Wesley picked up the small figure and set the boy on the back of a horse to bring his face level so that they could talk as men. He never towered from his height above Billy, but always lifted the little soul when important matters were to be discussed. "'Now what a dandy scheme,' he commented. "'Did you and Aunt Margaret fix it up?' "'No, she ain't had hers yet, but I got one for her. "'It's as soon as you eat yours, I'm going to take hers and feed her first time I find her in the dark.' "'But, Billy, where did you get the cookies? "'You know Aunt Margaret said you were not to have any.' "'I just took them,' said Billy. "'I didn't take them for me. "'I just took them for you and her.' "'Wesley swallowed hard and thought fast. "'In the warm darkness of the barn, "'the horses crunched their corn, "'a rat gnawed at a corner of the granary, "'and among the rafters the white pigeon "'cooed a soft sleepy note to his dusky mate. "'Did... did I steal?' "'wavered Billy through the darkness.' Wesley's big hands closed until he almost hurt the boy. No, he said vehemently, that is too big a word. You just made a mistake. You were trying to be a fine little man, but you went at it the wrong way. You only made a mistake. All of us do that, Billy. The world grows that way. When we make mistakes, we can see them. That teaches us to be more careful the next time, and so we learn. How wouldn't it be a mistake? If you had told Aunt Margaret what you wanted to do, and asked her for the cookies, she would have given them to you. But I was afraid she wouldn't, and you just had to have it. Not if it was wrong for me to have it, Billy. I don't want it that much. Must I take it back? You think hard and decide yourself, suggested Wesley. Lift me down, said Billy after silence. I got to put this in the jar and tell her. Wesley set the boy on the floor, but as he did so, he paused one second and strained him close to his breast. Margaret sat in her chair sewing. Billy slipped in and crept up beside her. The little face was lined with tragedy. "'Why, Billy, whatever is the matter?' she cried as she dropped her sewing and held out her arms. Billy stood back. He gripped his little fist tight and squared his shoulders. "'I got to be shut up in the closet,' he said. "'Oh, Billy, what an unlucky day! What have you done now?' I stole, gulped Billy. He said it was just a mistake, but it was worser than that. I took something you told me I wasn't to have. Stole? Margaret was in despair. What, Billy? Cookies, answered Billy in equal trouble. Billy, wailed Margaret. How could you? It was for him and you, sobbed Billy. He said he couldn't eat it for me, but out in the barn it's all dark and I couldn't see. I thought maybe he could there. Then we might put out the light and you could have yours. He said I only made it worse, cause I mustn't take things, and I know I mustn't, so I got to go in the closet. Margaret gazed at him helplessly. Will you hold me tight a little bit first? He did. Margaret opened her arms, and Billy rushed in and clung to her a few seconds with all the force of his being. Then he slipped to the floor and marched to the closet. Margaret opened the door. Billy gave one glance at the light, clenched his fist, and, walking inside, climbed on the box. Margaret shut her eyes and closed the door. Then she sat and listened. Was the air pure enough? Possibly he might smother. She had read something once. Was it very dark? What if there should be a mouse in the closet and it should run across his foot and frighten him into spasms? Somewhere she had heard. Margaret leaned forward with tense face and listened. Something dreadful might happen. She could bear it no longer. She arose hurriedly and opened the door. Billy was drawn up on the box in a little heap, and he lifted a disapproving face to her. "'Shut that door,' he said. "'I ain't been in here near long enough yet.'" End of chapter 9
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Wherein Elnora has more financial troubles, and Mrs. Comstock again hears the song of the Limberlost. The next night Elnora hurried to sentence. She threw open the back door and searched Margaret's face with anxious eyes. "'You got it!' panted Elnora. "'You got it! I can see by your face that you did. Oh, give it to me!' "'Yes, I got it, honey. I got it all right, but don't be so fast. You can't have it before Saturday. It has been kept in such a damp place it needed gluing. It had to have strings, and the key was gone. I knew how much you wanted it, so I sent Wesley right to town with it. They said they could fix it good as new, but it should be varnished, and that it would take several days for the glue to set. You can have it Saturday.' "'You found it where you thought it was? You know it's his?' "'Yes, it was just where I thought, and it's the same violin I've seen him play hundreds of times. "'It's all right, only laying so long it needs fixing. "'Oh, Aunt Margaret, can I ever wait?' "'It does seem a long time, but how could I help it? "'You couldn't do anything with it as it was. "'You see it had been hidden away in the garret, "'and it needed cleaning and drying to make it fit to play again. "'You can have it Saturday, sure. "'Saturday morning?' He just said Saturday, but Elnora, you've got to promise me that you will leave it here or in town and not let your mother get a hint of it. I don't know what she'd do. Uncle Wesley can bring it here until Monday. Then I will take it to school so that I can practice at noon. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, and there's more than the violin for which to be thankful. You've given me my father. Last night I saw him plain as life. Elnora, you were dreaming. You couldn't have seen him. I know I was dreaming, but I saw him. I saw him so closely that a tiny white scar at the corner of his eyebrow showed. I was just reaching out to touch him when he disappeared. Who told you there was a scar on his forehead? No one ever did in all my life. I saw it last night just as he went down. And, oh, Aunt Margaret, I saw what she did, and I heard his cries. No matter what she does, I don't believe I ever can be angry with her again. Her heart is broken, and she can't help it. Oh, it was terrible, but I'm glad I saw it. Now I will always understand. I don't know what to make of that, said Margaret. I don't believe in such stuff at all, but you couldn't make it up, for you didn't know. I only know that I played the violin last night as he played it, and while I played he came through the woods from the direction of Carney's. It was summer, and all the flowers were in bloom. He wore gray trousers and a blue shirt. His head was bare and his face was beautiful. I could almost touch him when he sank. Margaret Sinton stood perplexed. "'Well, I don't know what to think of that,' she ejaculated. "'I was next to the last person who saw him before he was drowned. "'It was late on a June afternoon, and he was dressed as you described. "'He was bareheaded because he had found a quail's nest before the bird began to brood, "'and he gathered the eggs in his hat and left it in a fence corner to get on his way home. "'They found it afterward. "'Was he coming from Carney's? "'He was on that side of the quagmire.' Why he ever skirted it so close as to get caught is a mystery you will have to dream out. I never could understand it. Was he doing something he didn't want my mother to know? Why? Because if he was, he might have cut close to the swamp so he couldn't be seen from the garden. You know the whole path straight to the pool where he sank can be seen from our back door. It's firm on our side. The danger is on the north and east. If he didn't want Mother to know, he might have tried to pass on either of those sides and gone too close. Was he in a hurry? Yes, he was, said Margaret. He had been away longer than he expected, and he almost ran when he started home. And he left his violin somewhere that you knew, and you went and got it. I'll wager he was going to play and didn't want Mother to find it out. It wouldn't make any difference to you if you knew every little thing, so quit thinking about it and just be glad you are to have what he loved best of anything. That's true, and I must hurry home, or I'll have to be cutting too close to swamp myself. I'm dreadfully late. Elnora sprang up and ran down the road, but when she was near the cabin, she climbed the fence, crossed the open woods pasture diagonally, and entered at the back garden gate. As she often came that way when she had been looking for cocoons, her mother asked no questions. Elnora lived by the minute until Saturday, when, contrary to his usual custom, Sinton went to town in the forenoon, taking her along to buy some groceries. Sinton drove straight to the music store and asked for the violin he had left to be mended. In its new coat of varnish with new keys and strings, it looked greatly like any other violin to Sinton, but to Elnora it was the most beautiful instrument ever made in a priceless treasure. She held it in her arms, touched the strings softly, and then she drew the bow across them in whispering measure. 
She had no time to think what a remarkably good bow it was for sixteen years' disuse. The tan leather case might have impressed her as being in fine condition also, had she been in a state to question anything. She did remember to ask for the bill, and she was gravely presented with a slip calling for four strings, one key, and a coat of varnish. Total, one dollar fifty. It seemed to Elnora she never could put the precious instrument in the case and start home. Wesley left her in the music store, where the proprietor showed her all he could about tuning, and gave her several beginner sheets of notes and scales. She carried the violin in her arms as far as the crossroads at the corner of their land, then reluctantly put it under the carriage seat. As soon as her work was done, she ran down the sentence and began to play, and on Monday the violin went to school with her. She made arrangements with the superintendent to leave it in his office, and scarcely took time for her food at noon. She was so eager to practice. Often one of the girls asked her to stay in town all night for some lecture or entertainment. She could take the violin with her, practice, and secure help. Her skill was so great that the leader of the orchestra offered to give her lessons if she would play to pay for them, so her progress was rapid in technical work. But from the first day the instrument became hers, with perfect faith that she could play as her father did, she spent half her practice time in imitating the sounds of all outdoors and improvising the songs her happy heart sang in those days. So the first year went, and the second and third were a repetition. But the fourth was different, for that was the close of the course, ending with graduation and all its attendant ceremonies and expenses. To Elnora these appeared mountain high. She had hoarded every cent, thinking twice before she parted with a penny, but teaching natural history in the grades had taken time from her studies in school, which must be made up outside. She was a conscientious student, ranking first in most of her classes and standing high in all branches. Her interest in her violin had grown with the years. She went to school early and practiced a half hour in the little room off the stage while the orchestra gathered. She put in a full hour at noon and remained another half hour at night. She carried the violin to Sentence on Saturday and practiced all the time she could there while Margaret watched the road to see that Mrs. Comstock was not coming. She had become so skillful that it was a delight to hear her play the music of any composer. But when she played her own, that was joy inexpressible. For then the wind blew, the water rippled, the Limberlost sang her songs of sunshine, shadow, black storm, and white night. Since her dream, Elnora had regarded her mother with peculiar tenderness. The girl realized, in a measure, what had happened. She avoided anything that possibly could stir bitter memories or draw deeper a line on the hard, white face. This cost many sacrifices, much work, and sometimes delayed progress, but the horror of that awful dream remained with Elnora. She worked her way cheerfully, doing all she could to interest her mother in things that happened in school, in the city, and by carrying books that were interesting from the public libraries. Three years had changed Elnora from the girl of sixteen to the very verge of womanhood. She had grown tall, round, and her face had the loveliness of perfect complexion, beautiful eyes and hair, and an added touch from within that might have been called comprehension. It was a compound of self-reliance, hard knocks, heart hunger, unceasing work and generosity. There was no form of suffering with which the girl could not sympathize, no work she was afraid to attempt, no subject she had investigated she did not understand. These things combined to produce a breadth and depth of character altogether unusual. She was so absorbed in her classes and her music that she had not been able to gather specimens as usual. When she realized this and hunted assiduously, she soon found that changing natural conditions had affected such work. Men all around were clearing available land. The trees fell wherever corn would grow. The swamp was broken by several gravel roads, dotted in places around the edge with little frame houses, and the machinery of oil wells. One especially low place around the region of Freckle's room was nearly all that remained of the original. Wherever the trees fell, the moisture dried, the creek ceased to flow, the river ran low, and at times the bed was dry. With unbroken sweep the winds of the west came, gathering force with every mile, and howled and raved, threatening to tear the shingles from the roof, blowing the surface from the soil in clouds of fine dust, and rapidly changing everything. From coming in with two or three dozen rare moths in a day, in three years' time, Elnora had grown to be delighted with finding two or three. Big Percy caterpillars could not be picked from their favorite bushes when there were no bushes. 
Dragonflies would not hover over dry places, and butterflies became scarce in proportion to the flowers, while no land yields over three crops of Indian relics. All the time the expense of books, clothing, and incidentals had continued. Elnora added to her bank account whenever she could, and drew out when she was compelled, but she omitted the important feature of calling for a balance. So one early spring morning, in the last quarter of the fourth year, she almost fainted when she learned that all her funds were gone. Commencement, with its extra expense, was coming. She had no money, and very few cocoons to open in June, which would be too late. She had one collection for the bird woman complete to a pair of imperialist moths, and that was her only asset. On the day she added these big yellow emperors, she would get a check for three hundred dollars, but she would not get it until these specimens were secured. She remembered that she never had found an emperor before June. Moreover, that sum was for her first year in college. Then she would be of age, and she meant to sell enough of her share of her father's land to finish. She knew her mother would oppose her bitterly in that, for Mrs. Comstock had clung to every acre and tree that belonged to her husband. Her land was almost complete forest, where her neighbors owned cleared farms, dotted with wells that every hour sucked oil from beneath her holdings, but she was too absorbed in the grief she nursed to know or care. The brushwood road and the redredging of the great Limberlost ditch had been more than she could pay from her income, and she had trembled before the wicket as she asked the banker if she had funds to pay it, and wondered why he laughed as he assured her she had. For Mrs. Comstock had spent no time on compounding interest, and never added the sum she had been depositing through nearly twenty years. Now she thought her funds were almost gone, and every day she worried over expenses. She could see no reason in going through the forms of graduation when pupils had all in their heads that was required to graduate. Elnora knew she had to have her diploma in order to enter the college she wanted to attend, but she did not dare utter the word until high school was finished, for, instead of softening as she hoped her mother had begun to do, she seemed to remain very much the same. When the girl reached the swamp, she sat on a log and thought bitterly over the absolute expense she was compelled to meet. Every member of her particular set was having an expensive photograph taken to exchange with the others. Elnora loved these girls and boys, and to say she could not have their pictures to keep was more than she could bear. Each one would give to all the others a handsome graduation present. She knew they would prepare gifts for her whether she could make a present in return or not. Then it was the custom for each graduating class to give a great entertainment and use the funds to present the school with a statue for the entrance hall. Elnora had been cast for and was practicing a part in that performance. She was expected to furnish her dress and personal necessities. She had been told that she must have a green dress, and where was it to come from? Every girl of the class would have three beautiful new frocks for commencement, one for the baccalaureate sermon, another, which could be plainer, for graduation exercises, and a handsome one for the banquet and ball. Elnora faced the past three years and wondered how she could have spent so much money and not kept account of it. She did not realize where it had gone. She did not know what she could do now. She thought over the photographs and at last settled that question to her satisfaction. She studied longer over the gifts, ten handsome ones there must be, and at last decided she could arrange for them. The green dress came first. The lights would be dim in the scene and the setting deep woods. She could manage that. She simply could not have three dresses. She would have to get a very simple one for the sermon and do the best she could for graduation. Whatever she got for that must be made with a gimp that could be taken out to make it a little more festive for the ball. But where could she get even two pretty dresses? The only hope she could see was to break into the collection of the man from India, sell some malls, and try to replace them in June. But in her soul she knew that never would do. No June ever brought just the thing she hoped it would. If she spent the college money, she knew she could not replace it. If she did not, the only way was to try for a room in the grades and teach a year. Her work there had been so appreciated that Elnora felt with the recommendation she knew she could get from the superintendent and teachers, she could secure a position. She was sure she could pass the examinations easily. She had once gone on Saturday, taken them, and secured a license for a year before she left the Brushwood School. She wanted to start to college when the other girls were going. If she could make the first year alone, she could manage the rest. But make that first year herself, she must. Instead of selling any of her collection, she must hunt as she never before had hunted and find a yellow emperor. She had to have it. That was all. Also, she had to have those dresses. She thought a sentence and dismissed it. She thought of the bird woman and knew she could not tell her. 
She thought of every way in which she ever had hoped to earn money, and realized that with the play, committee meetings, practicing, and final examinations, she scarcely had time to live, much less to do more than the work required for her pictures and gifts. Again, Elnora was in trouble, and this time it seemed the worst of all. It was dark when she arose and went home. Mother, she said, I have a piece of news that is decidedly not cheerful. Then keep it to yourself, said Mrs. Comstock. I think I have enough to bear without a great girl like you piling trouble on me. My money is all gone, said Elnor. Well, did you think it would last forever? It's been a marvel to me that it's held out as well as it has the way you've dressed and gone. I don't think I've spent any that I was not compelled to, said Elnor. I've dressed on just as little as I possibly could to keep going. I am heartsick. I thought I had over fifty dollars to put me through commencement, but they tell me it's all gone. Fifty dollars to put you through commencement? Well, what on earth are you proposing to do? The same as the rest of them, in the very cheapest way possible. And what might that be? Elnora omitted the photographs, the gifts, and the play. She told only of the sermon, graduation exercises, and the ball. Well, I won't trouble myself over that, sniffed Mrs. Comstock. If you want to go to a sermon, put on the dress you always use for meeting. If you need white for exercises, wear the new dress you got last spring. As for the ball, the best thing for you to do is to stay a mile away from such folly. In my opinion, you'd best bring home your books and quit right now. You can't be fixed like the rest of them. Don't be so foolish as to run into it. Just stay here and let these last few days go. You can't learn enough more to be of any account. But, Mother, gasped Elnor, you don't understand. Oh, yes, I do, said Mrs. Comstock. I understand perfectly. So long as the money lasts and you held up your head and went sailing without even explaining how you got it from the stuff you gathered. Goodness knows I couldn't see. But now it's gone, you come whining to me. What have I got? Have you forgot that the ditch in the road completely strapped me? I haven't any money. There's nothing for you to do but get out of it. I can't, said Elnora desperately. I've gone on too long. It would make a break in everything. They wouldn't let me have my diploma. What's the difference? You've got the stuff in your head. I wouldn't give a rap for a scrap of paper. That don't mean anything. But I've worked four years for it, and I can't enter. I ought to have it to help me get to school when I want to teach. If I don't have my grades to show, people will think I quit because I couldn't pass my examinations. I must have my diploma. Then get it, said Mrs. Comstock. The only way is to graduate with the rest. Well, graduate if you are bound to. But I can't unless I have things enough like the others that I don't look as I did that first day. Well, please remember, I didn't get you into this, and I can't get you out. You are set on having your own way. Go on and have it and see how you like it. Elnora went upstairs and did not come down again that night, which her mother called pouting. I've thought all night, said the girl at breakfast, and I can't see any way but to borrow the money of Uncle Wesley and pay it back from some that the bird woman will owe me when I get one more specimen. But that means that I can't go to, that I will have to teach this winter if I can get a city grade or a country school. Just you dare go dinging after Wesley sent him for money, cried Mrs. Comstock. You won't do any such a thing. I can't see any other way. I've got to have the money. Quit, I tell you. I can't quit. I've gone too far. Well, then, let me get your clothes and you can pay me back. But you said you had no money. Maybe I can borrow some at the bank. Then you can return it when the bird woman pays you. All right, said Elnora. I don't have to have expensive things. Just some kind of a pretty cheap white dress for the sermon, and the white one a little better than I had last summer for commencement in the ball. I can use the white gloves and shoes I got myself for last year, and you can get my dress made at the same place you did that one. They have my measurements and do perfect work. Don't get expensive things. It will be warm, so I can go bareheaded. Then she started to school, but was so tired and discouraged she scarcely could walk. Four years as plans going in one day. For she felt that if she did not get started to college that fall, she never would. Instead of feeling relieved at her mother's offer, she was almost too ill to go on. For the thousandth time, she groaned, Oh, why didn't I keep account of my money? After that, the days went so swiftly, she scarcely had time to think. But several trips her mother made to town, and the assurance that everything was all right, satisfied Elnora. She worked very hard to pass good final examinations and perfect herself for the play. For two days she had remained in town with the bird woman, in order to spend more time practicing and at her work. 
Often Margaret had asked about her dresses for graduation, and Elnora had replied that they were with a woman in the city who had made her a white dress for last year's commencement when she was a junior usher, and they would be all right. So Margaret, Wesley, and Billy concerned themselves over what they would get her for a present. Margaret suggested a beautiful dress. Sinton said that would look to everyone as if she needed dresses. The thing was to get a handsome gift like all the rest would have. Billy wanted to present her a five-dollar gold piece to buy music for a violin. He was positive Elnora would like that best of anything. It was toward the close of the term when they drove to town one evening to try to settle this important question. They knew Mrs. Comstock had been alone several days, so they asked her to accompany them. She had been more lonely than she would admit, filled with unusual unrest besides, and so she was glad to go. But before they had driven a mile, Billy had told that they were going to buy Elnora a graduation present, and Mrs. Comstock devoutly wished that she had remained at home. She was prepared when Billy asked, "'Aunt Kate, what are you going to give Elnora when she graduates?' "'Plenty to eat, a good bed to sleep in, and do all the work while she trollops,' answered Mrs. Comstock dryly. Billy reflected. "'I guess all of them have got that,' he said. "'I mean a present you buy at the store, like Christmas.' "'It is only rich folks that buy presents at stores,' replied Mrs. Comstock. "'I can't afford it.' "'Well, we ain't rich,' he said. "'But we are going to buy Elnora something as fine as the rest of them have "'if we sell a corner of the farm. Uncle Wesley said so.' "'A fool in his land is soon parted,' said Mrs. Comstock tersely. "'Wesley and Billy laughed, but Margaret did not enjoy the remark. "'While they were searching the stores for something on which all of them could decide, "'and Margaret was holding Billy to keep him from saying anything before Mrs. Comstock "'about the music on which he was determined, "'Mr. Brownlee met Wesley and stopped to shake hands. "'I see your boy came out finely,' he said. "'I don't allow any boy anywhere to be finer than Billy,' said Senton. "'I guess you don't allow any girl to surpass Elnora,' said Mr. Brownlee. "'She comes home with Ellen often, and my wife and I love her. "'Ellen says she is great in her part tonight. "'Best thing in the whole play. "'Of course you are in to see it. "'If you haven't reserved seats, you'd best start pretty soon "'for the high school auditorium, only seats a thousand. "'It's always jammed at these home talent plays. "'All of us want to see how our children perform.' "'Why, yes, of course,' said the bewildered Sinton. "'Then he hurried to Margaret. "'Say,' he said, there is going to be a play at the high school tonight, and Elnora is in it. Why hasn't she told us? I don't know, said Margaret, but I'm going. So am I, said Billy. Me too, said Wesley, unless you think for some reason she don't want us. Looks like she would have told us if she had. I'm going to ask her mother. Yes, that's what she's been staying in town for, said Mrs. Comstock. It's some sort of a swindle to raise money for a class to buy some silly thing to stick up in the school household and remember them by. I don't know whether it's now or next week, but there's something of the kind to be done. Well, it's tonight, said Wesley, and we are going. It's my treat, and we've got to hurry, or we won't get in. There's reserved seats, and we have none, so it's the gallery for us. But I don't care, so I get to take one good peep at Elnora. Suppose she plays, whispered Margaret in his ear. Aw, oh, tush, she couldn't, said Wesley. Well, she's been doing it three years in the orchestra and working like a slave at it. Oh, well, that's different. She's in the play tonight. Brownlee told me so. Come on, quick. We'll drive and hitch closest place we can find to the building. Margaret went in the excitement of the moment, but she was troubled. When they reached the building, Wesley tied the team to a railing, and Billy sprang out to help Margaret. Mrs. Comstock sat still. Come on, Kate, said Wesley, reaching his hand. I'm not going anywhere, said Mrs. Comstock, settling comfortably back against the cushions. All of them begged and pleaded, but it was no use. Not an inch would Mrs. Comstock budge. The night was warm and the carriage comfortable. The horses were securely hitched. She did not care to see what idiotic thing a pack of school children were doing. She would wait until the sentence returned. Wesley told her it might be two hours, and she said she did not care if it was four, so they left her. Did you ever see such cookies? cried Billy. Such blame stubbornness in all your life, demanded Sinton. Won't come to see as fine a girl as Elnora in a stage performance. Why, I wouldn't miss it for fifty dollars. I think it's a blessing she didn't, said Margaret placidly. I begged unusually hard so she wouldn't. I'm scared of my life for fear Elnora will play. They found seats near the door where they could see fairly well. Billy stood at the back of the hall and had a good view. By and by, a great volume of sound welled from the orchestra, but Elnora was not playing. Told you so, said Sinton. Got a notion to go out and see if Kate won't come now. She can take my seat, and I'll stand with Billy. You sit still, said Margaret emphatically. This is not over yet. 
So Wesley remained in his seat. The play opened and went on very much like all high school plays have gone for the last fifty years, but Elnora did not appear in any of the scenes. Out in the warm summer night, a sour, grim woman nursed an aching heart and tried to justify herself. The effort irritated her intensely. She felt that she could not afford the things that were being done. The old fear of losing the land that she and Robert Comstock had purchased and begun to clear was strong upon her. She was thinking of him, how she needed him, when the orchestra music poured from the open windows near her. She leaned back, closed her eyes, and tried to make her mind a blank, to shut out even the music when the leading violin began a solo. Mrs. Comstock bore it as long as she could, and then slipped from the carriage and fled down the street. She did not know how far she went or how long she stayed, but everything was still, save an occasional raised voice when she wandered back. She stood looking at the building. Slowly she entered the wide gates and followed up the walk. Elnora had been coming here for almost four years. When Mrs. Comstock reached the door, she looked inside. The wide hall was lighted with electricity, and the statuary and the decorations of the walls did not seem like pieces of foolishness. The marble looked pure, white, and the big pictures most interesting. She walked the length of the hall and slowly read the titles of the statues and the names of the pupils who had donated them. She speculated on where the piece Elnora's class would buy could be placed to advantage. Then she wondered if they were having a large enough audience to buy marble, she liked it better than the bronze, but looked as if it cost more. How white the broad stairway was! Elnora had been climbing those stairs for years and never told her they were marble. Of course she thought they were wood. Probably the upper hall was even grander than this. She went over to the fountain, took a drink, climbed to the first landing, and looked about her, and then without thought to the second. There she came opposite the wide open doors and the entrance to the auditorium packed with people in a crowd standing outside. When they noticed the tall woman with white face and hair and black dress, one by one they stepped a little aside so that Mrs. Comstock could see the stage. It was covered with curtains and no one was doing anything. Just as she turned to go, a sound so faint that everyone leaned forward and listened, drifted down the auditorium. It was difficult to tell just what it was. After one instant, half the audience looked toward the windows, for it seemed only a breath of wind rustling freshly open leaves, just a hint of stirring air. Then the curtains were swept aside swiftly. The stage had been transformed into a lovely little corner of creation, where trees and flowers grew and moss carpeted the earth. A soft wind blew, and it was the gray of dawn. Suddenly a robin began to sing, then a song sparrow joined him, and then several orioles began talking at once. The light grew stronger, the dewdrops trembled, flower perfume began to creep out to the audience, the air moved the branches gently, and a rooster crowed. Then all the scene was shaken with a babble of bird notes in which you could hear a cardinal whistling and a blue finch piping. Back somewhere among the high branches a dove cooed and then a horse neighed shrilly. Then set a blackbird crying, To check! And the whole flock answered it. The crows began to caw and the lamb bleated. Then the grosbeaks, chats, and vurios had something to say. The sun rose higher, the light grew stronger, and the breeze rustled the treetops loudly. A cow bawled and the whole barnyard answered. The guineas were clucking, the turkey gobblers strutting, the hens calling, the chickens cheeping, the light streamed down straight overhead, and the bees began to hum. The air stirred strongly, and off in an unseen field a reaper clacked and rattled through ripening wheat while the driver whistled. An uneasy mare wickered to her colt. The colt answered, and the light began to decline. Miles away a rooster crowed for twilight, and dusk was coming down. Then a catbird and a brown thrush sang against a grosbeak and a hermit thrush. The air was tremulous with heavenly notes. The lights went out in the hall. Dusk swept across the stage. A cricket sang and a kitty did answer, and a wood peewee wrung the heart with its lonesome cry. Then a night hawk screamed, a whippoorwill complained, a belated killdeer swept the sky, and the night wind sang a louder song. A little screech owl tuned up in the distance, a barn owl replied, and the great horned owl drowned both their voices. The moon shone and the scene was warm with mellow light. The bird voices died and soft, exquisite melody began to swell and roll. In the center of the stage, piece by piece, the grasses, mosses, and leaves dropped from an embankment. The foliage softly blew away, while plainer and plainer came the outlines of a lovely girl figure, draped in soft, clinging green. In her shower of bright hair a few green leaves and white blossoms clung, and they fell over her robe down to her feet. 
Her white throat and arms were bare. She leaned forward a little and swayed with the melody, her eyes fast on the clouds above her, her lips parted, a pink tinge of exercise in her cheeks as she drew her bow. She played as only a peculiar chain of circumstances puts it in the power of a very few to play. All nature had grown still. The violin sobbed, sang, danced, and quavered on alone. No voice in particular, just the soul of the melody of all nature combined in one great outpouring. At the doorway, a white-faced woman bore it as long as she could and then fell senseless. The men nearest carried her down the hall to the fountain, revived her, and then placed her in the carriage to which she directed them. The girl played on and never knew. When she finished, the uproar of applause sounded a block down the street, but the half-senseless woman scarcely realized what it meant. Then the girl came to the front of the stage, bowed and lifting the violin. She played her conception of an invitation to dance. Every living soul within sound of her notes strained their nerves to sit still and let only their hearts dance with her. When that began, the woman ran toward the country. She never stopped until the carriage overtook her halfway to her cabin. She only said she had grown tired of sitting and walked on her head. That night she asked Billy to remain with her and sleep on Elnora's bed. Then she pitched headlong upon her own and suffered agony of soul such as she never before had known. The swamp had sent back the soul of her love dead and put it into the body of the daughter she resented, and it was almost more than she could bear and live. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Girl of the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, wherein Elnora graduates and Freckles and the Angel send gifts. That was Friday night. Elnora came home Saturday morning and went to work. Mrs. Comstock asked no questions, and the girl only told her that the audience had been large enough to more than pay for the piece of statuary the class had selected for the hall. Then she inquired about her dresses and was told they would be ready for her. She had been invited to go to the bird woman's to prepare for both the sermon and commencement exercises. Since there was so much practicing to do, it had been arranged that she should remain there from the night of the sermon until after she was graduated. If Mrs. Comstock decided to attend, she was to drive in with the sentence. When Elnora begged her to come, she said she thought not. She cared nothing about such silliness. It was almost time for Wesley to come to take Elnora to the city when, fresh from her bath with shining, crisply washed hair and dressed to her outer garment, she stood with expectant face before her mother and cried, Now my dress, mother! Mrs. Comstock was pale as she replied, It's on my bed. Help yourself. Elnora opened the door and stepped into her mother's room with never a misgiving. Since the night Margaret and Wesley had brought her clothing, when she first started to school, her mother had selected all of her dresses, with Mrs. Sinton's help made most of them, and Elnora had paid the bills. The white dress of the previous spring was her first maid at a dressmaker's. She had worn that as junior usher at commencement. But her mother had selected the goods, had it made, and it had fitted perfectly and had been suitable in every way. So, with her heart at rest on that point, Elnora hurried to the bed to find only her last summer's white dress, freshly washed and ironed. For an instant she stared at it, then she picked up the garment, looked at the bed beneath it, and then her gaze slowly swept the room. It was a very unfamiliar room. Perhaps this was the third time she had been in it since she was a very small child. Her eyes ranged over the beautiful walnut dresser, the tall bureau, the big chest inside which she never had seen, and the row of masculine attire hanging above it. Somewhere a dainty lawn or mole dress simply must be hanging, but it was not. Elnora dropped on the chest because she felt too weak to stand. In less than two hours she must be in the church at Onabasha. She could not wear a last year's washed dress. She had nothing else. She leaned against the wall and her father's overcoat brushed her face. She caught the folds and clung to it with all her might. Oh, father, father, she moaned. I need you. I don't believe you would have done this. She clung to the coat in dry-eyed agony and tried to think what she could do. At last, she opened the door. "'I can't find my dress,' she said. "'Well, as it's the only one there, I shouldn't think it would be much trouble.' "'You mean for me to wear an old wash dress tonight?' "'It's a good dress. There isn't a hole in it. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't wear it.' 
"'Except that I will not,' said Eleanor. "'Didn't you get me any dress for commencement, either?' "'If you soil that tonight, I've plenty of time to wash it again.' Sinton's voice called from the gate. "'In a minute,' answered Eleanor. She ran upstairs and in an incredibly short time came down wearing one of her gingham school dresses. With a cold, hard face, she passed her mother and went into the night. A half hour later, Margaret and Billy stopped for Mrs. Comstock with the carriage. She had determined fully that she would not go before they called. With the sound of their voices, a sort of horror of being left seized her, so she put on her hat, locked the door, and went out to them. "'How did Elnora look?' inquired Margaret anxiously. "'Like she always does,' answered Mrs. Comstock curtly. "'I do hope her dresses are as pretty as the rest,' said Margaret. "'None of them will have prettier faces or nicer ways.' "'They just don't have one half as pretty faces or one-tenth as nice ways,' boasted Billy, who was wrestling with fractions. "'Oh, you two make me tired,' scoffed Mrs. Comstock. Wesley was waiting before the big church to take care of the team. As they stood watching the people enter the building, Mrs. Comstock felt herself growing ill without knowing why. When they went inside among the lights, saw the flower-deck stage and the masses of finely dressed people, she grew no better. She could hear Margaret and Billy softly commenting on what was being done. "'That first chair in the very front row is Elnora's,' exulted Billy, "'cause she's got the highest grades and so she gets to lead the procession to the platform.' "'The first chair? Lead the procession?' Mrs. Comstock was dumbfounded. The notes of the pipe organ began to fill the building in a slow, rolling march. Would Elnora lead the procession in a gingham dress, or would she be absent in her chair vacant on this great occasion? For now Mrs. Comstock could see that it was a great occasion. Everyone would remember how Elnora had played a few nights before, and they would miss her and pity her. Pity? Because she had no one to care for her. Because she was worse off than if she had no mother. For the first time in her life, Mrs. Comstock began to study herself as she would appear to others. Every time a junior girl came fluttering down the aisle, leading someone to a seat, and Mrs. Comstock saw a beautiful white dress pass, a wave of positive illness swept over her. What had she done? What would become of Elnora? As Elnora rode to the city, she answered Wesley's questions in monosyllables, so that he thought she was nervous or rehearsing her speech, and did not care to talk. Several times the girl tried to tell him and realized that if she said the first word, it would bring a torrent of tears. The bird woman opened the screen and stared unbelievingly. "'Why, I thought you would be ready. You are so late,' she said. "'If you have waited to dress here, we will have to hurry.' "'I have nothing to put on,' said Elnora. In bewilderment, the bird woman drew her inside. "'Did, did,' she faltered. "'Did you think you would wear that?' No, I thought I would telephone Ellen that there had been an accident, and I could not come. I don't know yet how to explain. I'm too sick to think. Oh, do you suppose I can get something made by Tuesday so that I can graduate? Yes, and you'll get something on you tonight so that you can lead your class as you have done for four years. Go to my room and take off that gingham quickly. Anna, drop everything and come help me. The bird woman ran to the telephone and called Ellen Brownlee. "'Elnora has had an accident. She will be a little late,' she said. "'You have got to make them wait. Have them play an extra musical number before the march.' Then she turned to the maid. "'Tell Benson to have the carriage at the gate just as soon as he can get it there. Then come to my room. Bring the thread box from the sewing table, that roll of wide white ribbon on the cutting table, and gather all the white pins from every dresser in the house. But first, come with me a minute. I want that chunk.' "'With a swamp angel stuff in it from the cedar closet,' she panted as they reached the top of the stairs. They hurried down the hall together and dragged the big trunk to the bird woman's room. She opened it and began tossing out white stuff. "'How lucky that she left these things,' she cried. "'Here are white shoes, gloves, stockings, fans, everything.' "'I am already but a dress,' said Elnora. The bird woman began opening closets and pulling out drawers and boxes. "'I think I can make it this way,' she said." She snatched up a creamy lace yoke with long sleeves that recently had been made for her and held it out. Elnora slipped into it, and the bird woman began smoothing out wrinkles and sewing in pins. It fitted very well with the little lapping in the back. Next, from among the angel's clothing, she caught up a white silk waist with low neck and elbow sleeves, and Elnora put it on. It was large enough, but distressingly short in the waist, for the angel had worn it at a party when she was sixteen. The bird woman loosened the sleeves and pushed them to a puff on the shoulders, catching them in places with pins. 
She began on the wide draping of the yoke, fastening it front, back, and at each shoulder. She pulled down the waist and pinned it. Next came a soft white silk dress skirt of her own. By pinning her waistband quite four inches above Elnora's, the bird woman could secure a perfect empire sweep with the clinging silk. Then she began with the wide white ribbon that was to trim a new frock for herself, bound it three times around the high waist effect she had managed, tied the ends in a knot, and let them fall to the floor in a beautiful sash. "'I want four white roses, each with two or three leaves,' she cried. Anna ran for them, while the bird woman added pins. Elnora, she said, "'forgive me, but tell me truly. Is your mother so extremely poor as to make this necessary?' "'No,' answered Elnora. "'Next year I am heir to my share of over three hundred acres of land covered with almost as valuable timber as was in the Limberlost. We adjoin it. There could be dozens of oil wells drilled that would yield to us the thousands our neighbors are draining from under us, and the bare land is worth over one hundred dollars an acre for farming. She is not poor. She is... I don't know what she is. A great trouble soured and warped her. It made her peculiar. She does not in the least understand, but it is because she don't care to instead of ignorance. She does not... Elnora stopped. She is... is different, finished the girl. Anna came with the roses. The bird woman set one on the front of the draped yoke, one on each shoulder, and the last among the bright masses of brown hair. Then she turned the girl facing the tall mirror. Oh, panted Elnora, is that me? You are a genius. Why, I will look as well as any of them. Well, thank goodness for that, cried the bird woman. If it wouldn't do, I should have been ill. You are lovely, altogether lovely. Ordinarily, I shouldn't say that, but when I think of how you are carpentered, I'm adoring the result. The organ began rolling out the march as they came in sight. Elnora took her place at the head of the procession while everyone wondered. Secretly, they had hoped that she would be dressed well enough, that she would not appear poor and neglected. With this radiant young creature, gowned in the most recent style, her smooth skin flushed with excitement, and a rose-set coronet of red gold on her head, had to do with the girl they knew was difficult to decide. The signal was given, and Elnora began the slow march across the vestry and down the aisle. The music welled softly, and Margaret began to sob without knowing why. Mrs. Comstock gripped her hands together and shut her eyes. It seemed an eternity to the suffering woman before Margaret caught her arm and whispered, Oh, Kate, for any sake, look at her. Here, the aisle across. Mrs. Comstock opened her eyes and, directing them where she was told, gazed intently and slid down in her seat on the verge of collapse. She was saved by Margaret's tense grip and her command, Here, idiot, stop that! In the blaze of light, Elnora climbed the steps to the palm-embowered platform, crossed it, and took her place. Sixty young men and women, each of them dressed the best possible, followed her. There were manly, fine-looking men in that class which Elnora led. There were girls of beauty and grace, but not one of them was handsomer or clothed in better taste than she. Billy thought the time never would come when Elnora would see him, but at last she caught his eye. Then Margaret and Wesley got faint signs of recognition in turn. But there was no softening of the girl's face and no hint of a smile when she saw her mother. Heartsick, Catherine Comstock gripped her seat and tried to prove to herself that she was justified in what she had done, but she could not. She tried to blame Elnora for not saying that she was to lead a procession and sit on a platform in the sight of hundreds of people, but that was impossible, for she realized that she would have scoffed and not understood if she had been told. Her heart pained until she suffered acute agony with every breath. When at last the exercises were over, she climbed into the carriage and rode home without a word. She did not hear what Margaret and Billy were saying. She scarcely heard Senton, who drove behind, when he told her that Elnora would not be home until Wednesday. Early the next morning, Mrs. Comstock was on her way to Onabasha. She was waiting when the Brownlee store opened. She examined ready-made white dresses, but they had only one of the right size, and it was marked $40. Mrs. Comstock did not hesitate over the price, but whether the dress would be suitable. She would have to ask Elnora. She inquired her way to the home of the bird woman and knocked. "'Is Elnora Comstock here?' she asked the maid. "'Yes, but she is still in bed. I was told to let her sleep as long as she would.' "'Maybe I could sit here and wait,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I want to see about getting her a dress for tomorrow. I am her mother.' 
"Then you don't need wait or worry," said the girl cheerfully. "There are two women up in the sewing room at work on a dress for her right now. It will be done in time, and it will be a beauty." Mrs. Comstock turned and trudged back to the Limberlost. The bitterness in her soul became a physical actuality, and water would not wash the taste of wormwood from her lips. She was too late. She was not needed. Another woman was mothering her girl. Another woman would prepare a beautiful dress such as Elnora had worn last night. The girl's love and gratitude would go to her. Mrs. Comstock tried the old process of blaming someone else, but she felt no better. She nursed her grief as closely as ever in the long days of the girl's absence. She brooded over Elnora's possession of the forbidden violin and her ability to play it until the performance could not have been told from her father's. She tried every refuge her mind could conjure to quiet her heart and remove the fear that the girl never would come home again, but it persisted. Mrs. Comstock could neither eat nor sleep. She wandered about the cabin and garden. She kept far from the pool where Robert Comstock had sunk from sight, for she felt that it would entomb her also if Elnora did not come home Wednesday morning. The mother told herself that she would wait, but the waiting was bitter as anything she ever had known. When Elnora awoke Monday, another dress was in the hands of a seamstress and was soon fitted. It had belonged to the angel and was a soft white thing that with a little alteration would serve admirably for commencement in the ball. All that day Elnora worked, helping prepare the auditorium for the exercises, rehearsing the march and the speech she was to make in behalf of the class. The next day was even more busy. But her mind was at rest, for the dress was a soft, delicate lace, easy to change, and the marks of alteration impossible to detect. The bird woman had telephoned to Grand Rapids, explained the situation, and asked the angel she might use it. The reply had been to give the girl all the things the chest contained. When the bird woman told Elnora, tears filled her eyes. "'I will write at once and thank her,' she said. "'With all her beautiful things, she does not need them, and I do.' They will serve for me often and be much finer than anything I could afford. It is lovely of her to give me the dress and of you to have it altered for me, as I never could. The bird woman laughed. I feel quite religious today, she said. You know the first and greatest rock of my salvation is, do unto others. I am only doing to you what there was no one to do to me when I was a girl very like you. Anna tells me your mother was here early this morning and that she came to see about getting you a dress. She is too late, said Elnora coldly. She had over a month to prepare my dresses, and I was to pay for them, so there is no excuse. Nevertheless, she is your mother, said the bird woman softly. I think almost any kind of a mother must be better than none at all, and you say she has had great trouble. She loved my father, and he died, said Elnora. The same thing, in quite as tragic a manner, has happened to thousands of other women, and they have gone on with calm faces and found happiness in life by loving others. There is something else I am afraid I never shall forget. This I know I shall not, but talking does not help. I must deliver my presents and photographs to the crowd. I have a picture, and I made a present for you, too, if you would care for them. I shall love anything you give me, said the bird woman. I know you well enough to know that whatever you do will be beautiful. Elnora felt good over that, and as she tried on her dress for the last fitting, she was really happy. She looked lovely in the dainty gown. It would serve finely for the ball and many other like occasions, and it was her very own. The bird woman's driver took Elnora in the carriage, and she called on all the girls with whom she was especially intimate, and left her picture in the package containing her gift to them. By the time she returned, parcels for her were arriving. Friends seemed to spring from everywhere. Almost everyone she knew had some gift for her, while because they so loved her, the members of her crowd had made her beautiful presents. There were books, vases, silver pieces, handkerchiefs, fans, boxes of flowers and candy. One big package settled the trouble at Sinton's, for it contained a dainty dress from Margaret, a five-dollar gold piece, conspicuously labeled, I earned this myself, from Billy, with which to buy music, and a gorgeous cut-glass perfume bottle it would have cost five dollars to fill with even a moderate-priced scent from Wesley. In an express crate was a fine curly maple dressing table sent by Freckles. The drawers were filled with wonderful toilet articles from the angel. The bird woman added an embroidered linen cover and a small silver vase for a few flowers, and no girl of the class had finer gifts. Elnora laid her head on the table sobbing happily, and the bird woman was almost crying herself. Professor Henley sent an elegantly printed and illustrated butterfly book. 
The great rooms in which Elnora had taught gave her a set of volumes covering every phase of life afield, in the woods and water. Elnora had no time to read, so she just carried one of these books around with her, hugging it as she went. After she had gone to dress, a queer-looking package was brought by a small boy who hopped on one foot as he handed it in and said, "'Tell Elnora that is from her ma.' "'Who are you?' asked the bird woman as she took the bundle. "'I'm Billy,' announced the boy. "'I gave her the five dollars. I earned it myself, dropping corn, sticking onions, and pulling weeds. My, but you gotta drop and stick and pull a lot before it's five dollars worth. "'Would you like to come in and see Elnora's gifts?' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Billy, trying to stand quietly. He followed into the room and gazed around. "'Gee, Mentley!' he gasped. "'Does Elnora get all this?' "'Yes. I bet you a thousand dollars I'd be first in my class when I graduate. Say, have the others got a lot more than Elnora?' "'I think not.' "'Well, Uncle Wesley said to find out if I could, and if she didn't have as much as the rest, he'd buy till she did if it took a hundred dollars. Say, you ought to know him. He's just scrumptious.' There ain't anybody anywhere finer than he is. My, he's grand. I'm quite sure of it, said the bird woman. I've often heard Elnora say so. Billy strutted around the table admiringly. I bet you nobody can beat this, he boasted. Then he stopped, thinking deeply. I don't know, though, he began reflectively. Some of them are awful rich. They got big families to give them things and wagon loads of friends, and I haven't seen what they got. Now maybe Elnora is getting left after all. He lifted an anxious little freckled face to the bird woman. She cleared her throat. Don't worry, Billy, she said. I will watch, and if I find Elnora's getting left, I'll buy her some more things myself. But I'm sure she is not. She has more beautiful gifts now than she will know what to do with, and others will come. Tell your Uncle Wesley his girl is bountifully remembered, very happy, and she sends her dearest love to all of you. Now you must go so I can help her dress. You will be there tonight to see her, of course. Yes, sirree, she got me a seat, third row from the front, middle section, so I can see, and she's going to wink at me after she gets her speech off her mind. She kissed me, too. She's a perfect lady, Elnora is. I'm going to marry her when I get big enough. Why isn't that splendid, laughed the bird woman as she hurried upstairs. Dear, she called, here's another gift for you. Elnora was half disrobed as she took the package and, sitting on the couch, opened it. The bird woman bent over her and tested the fabric with her fingers. "'Why, bless my soul!' she cried. "'Hand-woven, hand-embroidered linen, fine as silk. "'It's priceless! I haven't seen such things in years. "'My mother had garments like those when I was a child, "'but my sisters had them cut up for collars, belts, and fancy waists while I was small. "'Look at the exquisite work!' "'Where could it have come from?' cried Elnora. She shook out a petticoat with a hand-wrought ruffle a foot deep, then an old-fashioned chemise the nick and sleeve work of which was elaborate and perfectly wrought. On the breast was pinned a note that she hastily opened. I was married in these, it read, and I had intended to be buried in them, but perhaps it would be more sensible for you to graduate and get married in them yourself if you would like. Your mother. From my mother? Wide-eyed, Elnora looked at the bird woman. I never in my life saw the like. Mother does things I think I never can forgive, and when I feel hardest, she turns around and does something that makes me think she just must love me a little bit, after all. Any of the girls would give almost anything to graduate in hand-embroidered linen like that. Money can't buy such things, and they came just when I was thinking she didn't care what became of me. Do you suppose she can be insane? Yes, said the bird woman, stark, staring mad, wildly insane if she does not love you and care what becomes of you. Elnora arose and held the petticoat to her. Will you look at it, she cried, only imagine her not getting my dress ready, and then turning around and sending me such a petticoat as this. Ellen would pay a hundred dollars for it and never blink. I suppose mother has had it all my life and I never saw it before. Go, take your bath and put on those things, said the bird woman. Forget everything and be happy. She is not insane. She is embittered. She did not understand how things would be. When she saw, she came at once to get your address. This is her way of saying she is sorry she did not get the other. You know this. she has not spent any money, so perhaps she is quite honest in saying she has none. Oh, she is honest, said Elnor. She wouldn't care enough to tell an untruth. She'd say just how things were no matter what happened. 
Soon Elnora was ready for her dress. She never had looked so well as when she again headed the procession across the flower and palm deck stage of the high school auditorium. As she sat there, she could have reached over and dropped a rose she carried into the seat she had occupied that September morning, four years previously, when she entered the high school. She spoke the few words she had to say in behalf of her class beautifully, had the tiny wink ready for Billy, and the smile and nod of recognition for Wesley and Margaret. When at last she looked into the eyes of a white-faced woman next to them, she slipped a hand to her side and raised her skirt the fraction of an inch, just enough to let the embroidered edge of a petticoat show a trifle. When she saw the look of relief which flooded her mother's face, Elnora knew that forgiveness was in her heart and that she would go home in the morning. It was late afternoon before she arrived, and a dray followed with a load of packages. Mrs. Comstock was overwhelmed. She sat half-dazed and made Elnora show her each costly and beautiful or simple and useful gift, tell her carefully what it was and from where it came. She studied the faces of Elnora's particular friends intently. The gifts from them had to be selected and set in a group. Several times she started to speak and then stopped. At last, between her dry lips, came a harsh whisper. Elnora, what did you give back for these things? I'll show you, said Elnora cheerfully. I got the same thing for the bird woman, Aunt Margaret, and you, if you care for it. But I have to run upstairs to get it. When she returned, she handed her mother an oblong frame, hand-carved, enclosing Elnora's picture, taken by a schoolmate's camera. She wore her storm coat and carried a dripping umbrella. From under it looked her bright face. Her books and lunchbox were on her arm, and across the bottom of the frame was carved, your country classmate. Then she offered another frame. I am strong on frame, she said. They seem to be the best I could do without money. I located the maple and the black walnut myself in the little corner that had been overlooked between the river and the ditch. They didn't seem to belong to anyone, so I just took them. Uncle Wesley said it was all right, and he cut and hauled them for me. I gave the mill half of each tree for sawing and curing the remainder. Then I gave the woodcarver half of that for making my frames. A photographer gave me a lot of spoiled plates, and I boiled off the emulsion and took the specimens I framed for my stuff. The man said the white frames were worth three and a half and the black ones five. I exchanged those little frame pictures for the photographs of the others. For presents, I gave each one of my crowd one like this, only a different moth. The bird woman gave me the birch bark. She got it up north last summer. Elnora handed her mother a handsome black walnut frame a foot and a half wide by two long. It finished a small, shallow, glass-covered box of birch bark, to the bottom of which clung a big night moth with delicate pale green wings and long, exquisite trailers. A more beautiful thing would have been difficult to imagine. So you see, I did not have to be ashamed of my gifts, said Elnora. I made them myself and raised and mounted the moths. Moth, you call it, said Mrs. Comstock. I've seen a few of the things before. They are thick around us every June night, or at least they used to be, said Elnora. I've sold hundreds of them with butterflies, dragonflies, and other specimens. Now I must put away these and get to work, for it is almost June, and there are a few more I want dreadfully. When I get them, I will be paid some money for which I have worked a long time. She was afraid to say college just then. She thought it would be better to wait a few days and see if an opportunity would not come when it would work more naturally. Besides, unless she could secure the yellow emperor she needed to complete her collection, she could not talk college until she was of age, for she would have no money. End of chapter 11《Chapter 12 of A Girl the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Wherein Margaret Sinton Reveals a Secret and Mrs. Comstock Possesses the Limber Lost. Elnor, bring me the towel, quick! cried Mrs. Comstock. In a minute, mother, mumbled Elnor. She was standing before the kitchen mirror, tying the back part of her hair, while the front turned over her face. Hurry! There's a varmint of some kind! Elnor ran into the sitting room and thrust the heavy kitchen towel into her mother's hand. Mrs. Comstock swung open the screen door and struck at some object. Elnora tossed the hair from her face so that she could see past her mother. The girl screamed wildly. Don't, mother, don't! Mrs. Comstock struck again. Elnora caught her arm. It's the one I want. It's worth a lot of money. Don't. Oh, you shall not. Shan't, Missy, blazed Mrs. Comstock. When did you get to bossing me? 
The hand that held the screen swept a half circle and stopped at old Nora's cheek. She staggered with the blow and across her face, paled with excitement, a red mark rose rapidly. The screen slammed shut, throwing the creature on the floor before them. Instantly, Mrs. Comstock's foot crushed it. Elnora stepped back. Accepting the red mark, her face was very white. "'That was the last moth I needed,' she said, "'to complete a collection worth three hundred dollars. "'You've ruined it before my eyes!' "'Moth!' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You say that because you are mad. "'Moths have big wings. I know a moth.' "'I've kept things from you,' said Elnora, "'because I didn't dare confide in you. "'You had no sympathy with me, "'but you know I never told you untruths in all my life.' "'It's no moth,' reiterated Mrs. Comstock. "'It is!' cried Elnora. "'It's just out of a case in the ground. "'Its wings take two or three hours to expand and harden.' "'If I had known it was a moth,' Mrs. Comstock wavered, "'you did know! I told you! I begged you to stop! "'It meant just three hundred dollars to me!' "'Bah! Three hundred fiddlesticks!' sneered Mrs. Comstock. "'They are what have paid for books, tuition, and clothes for the last four years. "'They are what I could have started on to college. "'You've crushed the last one I needed before my face. "'You never have made any pretense of loving me. "'At last I'll be equally frank with you. "'I hate you. You are a selfish, wicked woman. I hate you.' Elnora turned, went through the kitchen, and out the back door. She followed the garden path to the gate and walked toward the swamp a short distance when reaction overtook her. She dropped on the ground and leaned against a big log. When a little child, desperate as now, she had tried to die by holding her breath. She had thought in that way to make her mother sorry, but she had learned that life was a thing thrust upon her and death would not come at her wish. She was so crushed over the loss of that moth which she had childishly named the Yellow Emperor that she scarcely remembered the blow. She had thought no luck in all the world would be so rare as to complete her collection, and she just had been forced to see a splendid imperialist crushed to a mass before her. There was a possibility that she could find another, but now she was facing the certainty that the one she might have had, and with which she undoubtedly could have attracted others, was ruined by her mother. How long she sat there, Elnora did not know or care. She simply suffered in dumb, abject misery, an occasional dry sob shaking her. Aunt Margaret was right. Elnora felt that morning that her mother never would be any different. The girl had reached a place where she realized that she could bear it no longer. As Elnora left the room, Mrs. Comstock took one step after her. "'You little hussy!' she gasped. But Elnora was gone. Her mother stood staring. "'She never did lie to me,' she muttered. I guess it was a moth, and the only one she needed to get three hundred dollars, she said. I wish I hadn't been so fast. I never saw anything like it. I thought it was some deadly, stinging, biting thing. Body does have to be mighty careful here, but likely I've spilt the milk now. Pshaw, she can find another. There's no use to be foolish. Maybe moths are like snakes. Where there's one, there's two. Mrs. Comstock took the broom and swept the moth out of the door. Then she got down on her knees and carefully examined the steps, logs, and the earth of the flower beds at each side. She found the place where the creature had emerged from the ground and the hard, dark, brown case which had enclosed it, still wet inside. Then she knew Elnora had been right. It was a moth. Its wings had been damp and not expanded. Mrs. Comstock never before had seen one in that state, and she did not know how they originated. She had thought all of them came from cases spun on trees or against walls or boards. She only had seen enough to know that there were such things, just as a flash of white told her that an ermine was on her premises, or a sharp buzz warned her of a rattler. So it was from creatures like that Elnora had gotten her school money. In one sickening sweep there rushed into the heart of the woman a full realization of the width of the gulf which separated her from her child. Lately many things had pointed toward it, none more plainly than when Elnora, like a reincarnation of her father, had stood fearlessly before a large city audience and played with even greater skill than he on what Mrs. Comstock felt very certain was his violin. But that little crawling creature of earth, crushed by her before its splendid yellow and lavender wings could spread and carry it into the mystery of night, had brought a realizing sense. "'We are nearer strangers with each other than we are with any of the neighbors,' she muttered. So one of the Almighty's most delicate and beautiful creations was sacrificed without fulfilling the law, 
yet none of its species ever served so glorious a cause, for at last Mrs. Comstock's inner vision had cleared. She went through the cabin mechanically. Every few minutes she glanced toward the back walk to see if Elnora was coming. She knew arrangements had been made with Margaret to go to the city some time that day, so she grew more nervous and uneasy every moment. She was haunted by the fear that the blow might discolor Elnora's cheek and that she would tell Margaret. She went down the back walk, looking intently in all directions, left the garden, and took the swampy path. Her step was noiseless on the soft black earth, and soon she came near enough to see Elnora. Mrs. Comstock stood looking at the girl in troubled uncertainty. Not knowing what to say, at last she turned and went back to the cabin. Noon came and she prepared dinner, calling as she always did when Elnora was in the garden, but she got no response and the girl did not come. A little after one o'clock, Margaret stopped at the gate. "'Elnora has changed her mind. She is not going,' called Mrs. Comstock. She felt that she hated Margaret as she hitched her horse and came up the walk instead of driving on. "'You must be mistaken,' said Margaret. "'I was going on purpose for her. She asked me to take her. I had no errand. Where is she?' "'I will call her,' said Mrs. Comstock. She followed the path again and this time found Elnora sitting on the log. Her face was swollen and discolored and her eyes red with crying. She paid no attention to her mother. "'Mag Senton is here,' said Mrs. Comstock harshly. "'I told her you had changed your mind, but she said you asked her to go with you and she had nothing to go for herself.' Elnora rose, recklessly took a short cut through the deep swamp grasses, and so reached the path ahead of her mother. Mrs. Comstock followed as far as the garden, but she could not enter the cabin. She busied herself among the vegetables, barely looking up when the back door screen slammed noisily. Margaret Sinton approached colorless and with such flaming eyes that Mrs. Comstock shrank back. "'What's the matter with Elnora's face?' demanded Margaret. Mrs. Comstock made no reply. "'You struck her, did you?' "'I thought you wasn't blind.' "'I have been for twenty long years now, Kate Comstock,' said Margaret Sinton. "'But my eyes are open at last. "'What I see is that I've done you no good and Elnora a big wrong. "'I had an idea that it would kill you to know, "'but I guess you are tough enough to stand anything. "'Kill or cure, you get it now.' "'What are you frothing about?' coolly asked Mrs. Comstock. "'You!' cried Margaret. "'You, the woman who don't pretend to love her only child, "'who lets her grow to a woman as you have let Elnora, "'and can't be satisfied with every sort of neglect, "'but must add abuse yet, "'and all for a fool idea about a man who wasn't worth his salt.' "'Mrs. Comstock picked up a hoe. "'Go right on,' she said. "'Empty yourself. "'It's the last thing you'll ever do.' "'Then I'll make a tidy job of it,' said Margaret. "'You'll not touch me. "'You'll stand there and hear the truth at last, "'and because I dare face you and tell it, you will know in your soul it is truth. When Robert Comstock shaved that quagmire out there so close he went in, he wanted to keep you from seeing where he was coming from. He'd been to see Elvira Carney. They had plans to go to a dance that night. Close your lips, said Mrs. Comstock in a voice of deadly quiet. You know I wouldn't dare open them if I was not telling you the truth. I can prove what I say. I was coming from Reed's. It was hot in the woods, and I stopped at Carney's as I passed for a drink. Elvira's bedridden old mother heard me, and she was so crazy for someone to talk with, I stepped in a minute. I saw Robert come down the path. Elvira saw him, too, and she ran out of the house to head him off. It looked funny, and I just deliberately moved where I could see and hear. He brought her his violin and told her to get ready and meet him in the woods with it that night, and they would go to a dance. She took it and hid it in the little loft to the well house and promised she'd go. "'Are you done?' demanded Mrs. Comstock. "'No, I'm going to tell you the whole story. "'You don't spare Elnora anything. "'I shan't spare you. "'I hadn't been here that day, "'but I can tell you just how he was dressed, "'which way he went, and every word they said, "'though they thought I was busy with her mother "'and wouldn't notice them. "'Put down your hoe, Kate. "'I went to Elvira, told her what I knew, "'and made her give me Comstock's violin for Elnora "'over three years ago. "'She's been playing it ever since.' I won't see her slighted and abused another day on account of a man who would have broken your heart if he had lived. Six months more would have showed you what everybody else knew. He was one of those men who couldn't trust himself, and so no woman was safe with him. Now, will you drop grieving over him and do Elnora justice? Mrs. Comstock gripped the hoe tighter, and turning, she went down the walk and started across the woods to the home of Elvira Kearney. With averted head, she passed the pool, steadily pursuing her way. 
Elvira Kearney, hanging towels across the back fence, saw her coming and went toward the gate to meet her. Twenty years she had dreaded that visit. Since Margaret Sinton had compelled her to produce the violin she had hidden so long, because she was afraid to destroy it, she had come more near expectation than dread. The wages of sin are the hardest debts on earth to pay, and they are always collected at inconvenient times in unexpected places. Mrs. Comstock's face and hair were so white that her dark eyes seemed burned into their setting. Silently, she stared at the woman before her a long time. "'I might have saved myself the trouble of coming,' she said at last. "'I see you are guilty as sin.' "'What has Mag Sinton been telling you?' panted the miserable woman, gripping the fence. "'The truth,' answered Mrs. Comstock succinctly. "'Guilt is in every line of your face and your eyes all over your wretched body.' If I had taken a good look at you any time in all these past years, no doubt I could have seen it just as plain as I can now. No woman or man can do what you've done and not get a mark set on them for everyone to read. Mercy, gasped weak little Elvira Kearney. Have mercy. Mercy, scoffed Mrs. Comstock. Mercy, that's a nice word from you. How much mercy did you have on me? Where's the mercy that sent Comstock to the slime of the bottomless quagmire and left me to see it, and then struggle on in agony all these years? How about the mercy of letting me allow my baby to be neglected all the days of her life? Mercy, do you really dare use the word to me? If you knew what I've suffered. Suffered, jeered Mrs. Comstock. That's interesting, and pray, what have you suffered? All the neighbors have suspected and been down on me. I ain't had a friend. I've always felt guilty of his death. I've seen him go down a thousand times, plain as ever you did. Many's the night I've stood on the other bank of that pool and listened to you, and I tried to throw myself in to keep from hearing you. But I didn't dare. I knew God would send me to burn forever, but I'd better done it. For now he has set the burning on my body, and every hour it is slowly eating the life out of me. The doctor says it's a cancer. Mrs. Comstock exhaled a long breath. Her grip on the hoe relaxed, and her stature lifted to towering height. I didn't know or care when I came here just what I did, she said. But my way is beginning to clear. If the guilt of your soul has come to a head and a cancer on your body, it looks as if the Almighty didn't need any of my help in meeting out his punishments. I really couldn't fix up anything to come anywhere near that. If you are going to burn until your life goes out with that sort of fire, you don't owe me anything. Oh, Catherine Comstock, groaned Elvira Kearney, clinging to the fence for support. Looks as if the Bible's right when it says the wages of sin is death, don't it? asked Mrs. Comstock. Instead of doing a woman's work in life, you chose a smile of invitation in the dress of unearned cloth. Now you tell me you are marked to burn to death with the uncringable fire. And him! It was shorter with him, but let me tell you, he got his share. He left me with an untruth on his lips, for he told me he was going to take his violin to Onabasha for a new key, when he carried it to you. Every vow of love and constancy he ever made me was a lie after he touched your lips. So when he tried the wrong side of the quagmire to hide from me the direction in which he was coming, it reached out for him and it got him. It didn't hurry either. It just sucked him down, slow and deliberate. Mercy, groaned Elvira Kearney. Mercy. I don't know the word, said Mrs. Comstock. You took all that out of me long ago. The last twenty years haven't been of the sort that taught mercy. I've never had any on myself and none on my child. Why in the name of justice should I have mercy on you, or on him? You were both older than me, both strong, sane people. You deliberately chose your course when you lured him and he, when he was unfaithful to me. When a loose man and a light woman faced the death the Almighty ordained for them, why should they shout at me for mercy? What did I have to do with it? Elvira Kearney sobbed in panting gasps. You've got tears, have you? marveled Mrs. Comstock. Mine all dried long ago. I've none left to shed over my wasted life, my disfigured face and hair, my years of struggle with a man's work, my wreck of land among the tilled fields of my neighbors, or the final knowledge that the man I so gladly would have died to save wasn't worth the sacrifice of a rattlesnake. If anything yet could wring a tear from me, it would be the thought of the awful injustice I always have done my girl. If I lay a hand on you for anything, it would be for that." "'Kill me if you want to,' sobbed Elvira Kearney. "'I know that I deserve it. I don't care.' "'You are getting your killing fast enough to suit me,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I wouldn't touch you any more than I would him if I could. "'Once is all any man or woman deceives me about the holiest things of life. "'I wouldn't touch you any more than I would the Black Plague. "'I am going back to my girl.' "'Mrs. Comstock turned and started swiftly through the woods. 
but she had gone only a few rods when she stopped, and leaning on the hoe, she stood thinking deeply. Then she turned back. Elvira still clung to the fence, sobbing bitterly. "'I don't know,' said Mrs. Comstock, "'but I left a wrong impression with you. I don't want you to think that I believe the Almighty set a cancer to burning you as a punishment for your sins. I don't. I think a lot more of the Almighty. With a whole sky full of worlds on his hands to manage, I'm not believing that he has time to look down on ours and pick you out of all the millions of we sinners and get a special kind of torture to eating you. It wouldn't be a gentlemanly thing to do, and first of all, the Almighty is bound to be a gentleman. I think likely a bruise and bad blood is what caused your trouble. Anyway, I've got to tell you that the cleanest housekeeper I ever knew, one of the noblest Christian women, was slowly eaten up by a cancer. She got hers from the careless work of a poor doctor. The Almighty is to forgive sin and heal disease, not to invent and spread it. She had gone only a few steps when she again turned back. If you will gather a lot of red clover bloom, make a tea strong as lie of it, and drink quartz, I think likely it will help you if you are not too far gone. Anyway, it will cool your blood and make the burning easier to bear. Then she swiftly walked home. Into the lonely cabin she could not, neither could she sit outside and think. She attacked a bed of beets and hoed until the perspiration ran from her face and body. Then she began on the potatoes. When she was too tired to take another stroke, she bathed and put on dry clothing. In securing her dress, she noticed her husband's carefully preserved clothing lining one wall. She gathered it in a great armload and carried it out to the swamp. Piece by piece, she pitched into the green maw of the quagmire all those articles she had dusted carefully and fought moths from for years, and stood watching as it slowly sucked them down. She went back to her room and gathered every scrap that had in any way belonged to Robert Comstock, excepting his gun and revolver, and threw it into the swamp. Then, for the first time, she set her door wide open. She was too weary now to do more, but an urging unrest drove her. She wanted Elnora. It seemed to her she never could wait until the girl came and delivered her judgment. At last, in an effort to get nearer to her, Mrs. Comstock climbed the stairs and stood looking around Elnora's room. It was very unfamiliar. The pictures were strange to her. Commencement had filled it with packages and bundles. The walls were covered with cocoons. Moths and dragonflies were pinned about. Under the bed she could see a half-dozen large white boxes. She did not know what they contained. She pulled out one and lifted the lid. The bottom was covered with a sheet of thin cork, and on long pins sticking in it were dozens of great velvet-winged moths. Each one was labeled, always there were two of a kind, in many cases four, showing under and upper wings of both male and female. They were of every color and shape. Mrs. Comstock caught her breath sharply. When and where had Elnora gotten all of them? They were the most exquisite sight the woman ever had seen so she opened all the boxes to feast on their beautiful contents. As she did so, there came more fully a sense of the distance between her and her child. She could not understand how Elnora had gone to school and performed all this work secretly. When it was finished, up to the very last moth, she, the mother, who should have been the first confidant and helper, had been the one to bring disappointment. Small wonder Elnora had come to hate her. Mrs. Comstock carefully closed and replaced the boxes and again stood looking around the room. This time her eyes rested on some books she did not remember having seen before, so she picked up one and found that it was a moth book. She glanced over the first pages and was soon eagerly reading. When the text reached the classification of species, she laid it down, took up another, and read its introductory chapters. Then she found some papers and studied them. By that time, her brain was in a confused jumble of ideas about capturing moths with differing baits and bright lights. She went downstairs, thinking deeply. Being unable to sit still and having nothing else to do, she glanced at the clock and began preparing supper. The work dragged. A chicken was snatched up and dressed hurriedly. A spice cake sprang into being in short order. Strawberries that had been intended for preserves went into short cake. Delicious odors crept from the cabin. She put many extra touches on the table and then commenced watching the road. Everything was ready, but Elnora did not come. Then began the anxious process of trying to keep cooked food warm and not spoil it. The birds went to bed and dusk came. Mrs. Comstock gave up the fire and set the supper on the table. Then she went out and sat on the front doorstep watching night creep all around her. She started eagerly as the gate creaked, but it was only Wesley Sinton coming down the walk. Catherine, Margaret and Elnora passed where I was working this afternoon, and Margaret got out of the carriage and called me to the fence. She told me what she had done. I've come to say to you that I am sorry. 
She has heard me threaten to do it a good many times, but I never would have got it done. I'd give a good deal if I could undo it, but I can't, so I've come to tell you how sorry I am. You've got something to be sorry for, said Mrs. Comstock, but likely we ain't thinking of the same thing. It hurts me less to know the truth than to live in ignorance. If Mag had the sense of a peewee, she told me long ago. That's what hurts me, to think that both of you knew Robert was not worth an hour of honest grief, yet you'd let me mourn him all these years and neglect Elnora while I did it. If I've anything to forgive you, that is what it is. Sinton took off his hat and sat on a bench. Catherine, he said solemnly, nobody ever knows how to take you. Would it be asking too much to take me for having a few grains of plain common sense, she inquired. You've known all this time that Comstock got what he deserved when he undertook to sneak in an unused way across the swamp which he was none too familiar. Now I should have thought that you'd figure that knowing the same thing would be the best method to cure me of pining for him and slighting my child. Heaven only knows we have thought of that and talked of it often, but we were both two big cowards. We didn't dare tell you. So you have gone on year after year watching me show indifference to Elnora, and yet a little horse sense would have pointed out to you that she was my salvation. Why, look at it, not married quite a year, all his vows of love and fidelity made to me before the Almighty forgotten in a few months, and a dance in a light woman so alluring he had to lie and sneak for them. What kind of a prospect is that for a life? I know men and women. An honorable man is an honorable man, and a liar is a liar. Both are born and not made. One cannot change to the other any more than that same old leopard can change its spots. After a man tells a woman the first untruth of that sort, the others come piling thick, fast, and mountain high. The desolation they bring in their wake overshadows anything I have suffered completely. If he had lived six months more, I should have known him for what he was born to be. It was in the blood of him. His father and grandfather before him were fiddling, dancing people. But I was certain of him. I thought we could leave Ohio and come out here alone, and I could so love him and interest him in his work that he would be a man. Of all the fool, fruitless jobs, making anything of a creature that begins by deceiving her is the foolest the same woman ever undertook. I am more than sorry you and Margaret didn't see your way clear to tell me long ago. I'd have found it out in a few more months if he had lived, and I wouldn't have borne it a day. The man who breaks his vows to me once don't get the second chance. I give truth and honor. I have a right to ask it in return. I'm glad I understand at last. Now, if Elnora will forgive me, we will take a new start and see what we can make out of what is left of life. If she won't, then it will be my turn to learn what suffering really means. But she will, said Sinton. She must. She can't help it when things are explained. Don't you worry over her. I know this. She isn't hurrying about coming home. Do you know where she is or what she is doing? I do not, but likely she will be along soon. I must go help Billy with the night work. Goodbye, Catherine. Thank the Lord you have come to yourself at last. They shook hands and sent him went down the road while Mrs. Comstock entered the cabin. She went to the supper table, but she could not swallow food. She stood in the back door watching the sky for moths, but they did not seem to be very numerous. Her spirits sank and she breathed unevenly. Then she heard the front screen. She reached the middle door as Elnora touched the foot of the stairs. Hurry and get ready, Elnora, she said. Your supper is almost spoiled now. Elnora closed the stair door behind her, and for the first time in her life threw the heavy lever which barred out any one from downstairs. Mrs. Comstock heard the thud and knew what it meant. She reeled slightly and caught the doorpost for support. For a few minutes she clung there, then sank to the nearest chair. After a long time she arose and, stumbling half-blindly, she put the food in the cupboard and covered the table. She took the lamp in one hand, the butter in the other, and started for the spring house. Something brushed close by her face, and she looked just in time to see a winged creature rise above the cabin and sail away. That was a night bird, she muttered. As she stooped to set the butter in the water, came another thought. Perhaps it was a moth. Mrs. Comstock dropped the butter and hurried out with the lamp. She held it high above her head and waited until her arms ached. Small insects of night gathered, and at last the little dusty miller, but nothing came of any size. I got to go where they are if I get them, muttered Mrs. Comstock. She hurried into the cabin, set the lamp on the table, and stood thinking deeply. She went to the barn for the pair of stout high boots she used in feeding stock in deep snow. Throwing the boots by the back door, she climbed to the loft over the spring house and hunted an old lard oil lantern and one of first manufacture for oil. Both these she cleaned and filled. She listened until everything upstairs had been still for over a half hour. 
By that time it was after eleven o'clock. Then she took the good lantern from the kitchen, the two old ones, a handful of matches, a ball of twine, and went from the cabin softly closing the door. Sitting on the back step, she put on the boots and then stood gazing into the sweet June night, first in the direction of the woods on her land, then toward the Limberlost. Its outline looked so dark and forbidding, she shuddered and went down the garden, taking the path toward the woods. But as she neared the pool, her knees wavered and her courage fled. The knowledge that in her soul she was now glad Robert Comstock was at the bottom of it made a coward of her, who fearlessly had mourned him there nights untold. She could not go on. She skirted the back of the garden, crossed a field, and came out on the road. Soon she reached the Limberlost. She hunted until she found the old trail, then followed it stumbling over logs and through clinging vines and grasses. The heavy boots clumped on her feet, overhanging branches whipped her face and pulled her hair. But her eyes were on the sky she went straining into the night, hoping to find signs of a living creature on wing. By and by she began to see the wavering flight of something she thought near the right size. She had no idea where she was, but she stopped, lighted a lantern, and hung it as high as she could reach. A little distance away she placed the second, and then the third. The objects came nearer, and sick with disappointment, she saw that they were bats. Crouching in the damp swamp grasses, without a thought of snakes or venomous insects, she waited, her eyes roving from lantern to lantern. Once, she thought a creature of high flight dropped near the lard oil light, so she arose breathlessly waiting, but either it passed or it was an illusion. She glanced at the old lantern, then at the new, and was on her feet in an instant creeping close. Something large as a small bird was fluttering around. Mrs. Comstock began to perspire while her hand shook wildly. Closer she crept, and just as she reached for it, something similar swept by and both flew away together. Mrs. Comstock set her teeth and stood shivering. For a long time the locusts rasped, the whippoorwills cried, and the steady hum of nightlife throbbed in her ears. Away in the sky she saw something coming what was no larger than a falling leaf. Straight on toward the light it came. Without in the least realizing what she was doing, Mrs. Comstock began to pray aloud. "'This way, O oh Lord, make it come this way, please. You know how I need it. O oh Lord, send it lower.' The moth hesitated at the first light, then slowly, easily it came toward the second, as if following a path of air. It touched a leaf near the lantern and settled. As Mrs. Comstock reached for it, a thin yellow spray wet her hand in the surrounding leaves. When its wings raised above its back, her fingers came together. She held the moth to the light. It was nearer brown than yellow, and she remembered having seen some like it in the boxes that afternoon. It was not the one needed to complete the collection, but Elnora might want it, so Mrs. Comstock held on. Just there the Almighty was kind, or nature was sufficient, as you look at it, for following the law of its being when disturbed, the moth again through the spray by which some suppose it attracts its kind, and liberally sprinkled Mrs. Comstock's dress front and arms. From that instant she became the best moth bait ever invented. Every polyphemus in range hastened to her, and other fluttering creatures of night followed. The influx came her way. She snatched wildly here and there until she had one in each hand and no place to put them. She could see more coming in her aching heart, swollen with the strain of long excitement, hurt pitifully. She prayed in broken exclamations that did not always sound reverent, but never was human soul in more deadly earnest. Moths were coming. She had one in each hand. They were not yellow, and she did not know what to do. She glanced around to try to discover some way to keep what she had, and her throbbing heart stopped and every muscle stiffened. There was the dim outline of a crouching figure not two yards away, and a pair of eyes their owner thought hidden, caught the light in a cold stream. Her first impulse was to scream and fly for life. Before her lips could open, a big moth alighted on her breast while she felt another walking over her hair. All sense of caution deserted her. She did not care to live if she could not replace the yellow moth she had killed. She set her eyes on those among the leaves. "'Hear you!' she cried hoarsely. "'I need you. Get yourself out here and help me. These critters are going to get away from me, and I've got to have them. Hustle!' Pete Corson parted the bushes and stepped into the light. "'Oh, it's you,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I might have known, but you gave me a start. Here, hold these until I make some sort of bag for them. Go easy. If you break them, I don't guarantee what will happen to you.' "'Pretty fierce, ain't you?' laughed Pete, but he advanced and held out his hands. "'For Elnora, I suppose.' Yes, said Mrs. Comstock, in a mad fit I trampled one this morning, and by the luck of the old boy himself, it was the last moth she needed to complete a collection. I got to get another one or die. 
fit, I guess it's your funeral, said Pete. There ain't a chance in a dozen the right one will come. What color was it? Yellow and big as a bird. The emperor, likely, said Pete. You dig for that kind, and they are not numerous, so as that you can smash them for fun. Well, I can try to get one anyway, said Mrs. Comstock. I forgot all about bringing anything to put them in. You take a pinch on their wings until I make a poke. Mrs. Comstock removed her apron, tearing off the strings. She unfastened and stepped from the skirt for calico dress. With one apron string, she tied shut the band and placket. She pulled a wire pin from her hair, stuck it through the other string, and using it as a bodkin, ran it around the hem of her skirt. Her fingers flew, and shortly she had a large bag. She put several branches inside to which the moths could cling, closed the mouth partially, and held it toward Pete. "'Put your hand well down and let the things go,' she ordered. "'But be careful, man. Don't run into the twigs. Easy. That's one. Now the other. Is the one on my head gone? There was one on my dress, but I guess it flew. Here comes a kind of a gray-looking one.' Pete slipped several more moths into the bag. "'Now that's five, Mrs. Comstock,' he said. "'I'm sorry, but you'll have to make that do. "'You must get out of here lively. "'Your lights will be taken for hurry calls, "'and inside the next hour a couple of men will ride here like fury. "'They won't be nice Sunday school men, "'and they won't hold bags and catch moths for you. "'You must go, quick.' "'Mrs. Comstock laid down the bag "'and pulled one of the lanterns lower. "'I won't budge a step,' she said. "'This land don't belong to you. "'You have no right to order me off it.' Here I stay until I get a yellow emperor, and no little petering thieves of this neighborhood can scare me away. You don't understand, said Pete. I'm willing to help Eleanor, and I'd take care of you if I could. But there will be too many for me, and they will be mad at being called out for nothing. Well, who's calling them out? demanded Mrs. Comstock. I'm catching moths. If a lot of good-for-nothings get fooled into losing some sleep, why well, let them? They can't hurt me or stop my work. They can, and they'll do both. "'Well, I'll see them do it,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I've got Robert's revolver in my dress, "'and I can shoot as straight as any man if I'm mad enough. "'Anyone that interferes with me tonight will find me mad aplenty. "'There goes another.' "'She stepped into the light and waited until a big brown moss settled on her "'and was easily taken. "'Then in light, airy flight, came a delicate pale green thing, "'and Mrs. Comstock started in pursuit. "'But the scent was not right. "'The moth fluttered high, then dropped lower, still lower, and sailed away.' With outstretched hands, Mrs. Comstock pursued it. She hurried one way, then another, then ran over an object which tripped her and she fell. She regained her feet in an instant, but she had lost sight of the moth. With livid face, she turned on the crouching man. "'You nasty, sneaking son of Satan!' she cried. "'Why are you hiding there? You made me lose the one I want to most of any I've had a chance as yet. Get out of here! Go this minute, or I'll fill your worthless carcass so full of holes you'll do to sift cornmeal!' Go, I say. I'm using the Limberlost tonight, and I won't be stopped by the devil himself. Cut like fury and tell the rest of them they can just go home. Pete is going to help me, and he is all you I need. Now go. The man turned and went. Pete leaned against a tree, held his mouth shut, and shook inwardly. Mrs. Comstock came back panting. The old scoundrel made me lose that, she said. If anyone else comes snooping around here, I'll just blow them up to start with. I haven't time to talk. Suppose that had been yellow. I'd have killed that man, sure. The Limberlost isn't safe tonight, and the sooner those whelps find it out, the better it will be for them. Pete stopped laughing to look at her. He saw that she was speaking the truth. She was quite past reason, sense, or fear. The soft night air stirred the wet hair around her temples. The flickering lanterns made her face a ghastly green. She would stop at nothing, that was evident. Pete suddenly began catching moths with exemplary industry and putting one into the bag, another escaped. "'We must not try that again,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'Now what will we do?' "'We are close to the old case,' said Pete. "'I think I can get into it. "'Maybe we could slip the rest in there.' "'That's a fine idea,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'They'll have so much room there, "'they won't be likely to hurt themselves, "'and the books say they don't fly in daytime "'unless they are disturbed. "'So they will settle when it's light, "'and I can come with Elnora to get them.' "'They captured two more, "'and then Pete carried them to the case.' "'Here comes a big one,' he cried as he returned. Mrs. Comstock looked up and stepped out with a prayer on her lips. She could not tell the color at that distance, but the moth appeared different from the others. On it came, dropping lower and darting from light to light. As it swept near her, "'Oh, heavenly father!' exulted Mrs. Comstock. "'It's yellow! Careful, Pete, your hat, maybe!' Pete made a long sweep. The moth wavered above the hat and sailed away. 
Mrs. Comstock leaned against a tree and covered her face with her shaking hands. "'That is my punishment,' she cried. "'Oh, Lord, if you will give a moth like that into my possession, I'll always be a better woman.' The Emperor again came in sight. Pete stood tense and ready. Mrs. Comstock stepped into the light and watched the moth's course. Then a second appeared in pursuit of the first. The larger one wavered into the radius of light once more. The perspiration rolled down the man's tense face. He half lifted the hat. "'Pray, woman, pray now,' he panted. "'I guess I best get over by that lard oil light and go to work,' breathed Mrs. Comstock. "'The Lord knows this is all in prayer, but it's no time for words just now. Ready, Pete? You are going to get a chance first. Pete made another long, steady sweep, but the moth darted beneath the hat. In its flight, it came straight toward Mrs. Comstock. She snatched off the remnant of apron she had tucked into her petticoat band and held the calico before her. The moth struck full against it and clung to the goods. Pete crept up stealthily. The second moth followed the first, and the spray showered the apron. Wait, gasped Mrs. Comstock. I think they have settled. The books say they won't leave now. The big, pale, yellow creature clung firmly, lowering and raising its wings. The other came nearer. Mrs. Comstock held the cloth with rigid hands while Pete could hear her breathing in short gusts. "'Shall I try now?' he implored. "'Wait,' whispered the woman. "'Something seems to say wait.' The night breeze stiffened and gently waved the apron. Locusts rasped, mosquitoes hummed, and frogs sang uninterruptedly. A musky odor slowly filled the air. "'Now shall I?' questioned Pete. "'No, leave them alone.' They are safe now. They are mine. They are my salvation. God and the Limperloss gave them to me. They won't move for hours. The books all say so. Oh, Heavenly Father, I am thankful to you, and you too, Pete Corson. You are a good man to help me. Now I can go home and face my girl. Instead, Mrs. Comstock dropped suddenly. She spread the apron across her knees. The moths were undisturbed. Then her tired white head dropped, the tears she had thought forever dried shed forth, and she sobbed for pure joy. Oh, I won't do that now, you know, comforted Pete. Think of getting two. That's more than you ever could have expected. A body would think you would cry if you hadn't got any. Come on now, it's almost morning. Let me help you home. Pete took the bag and the two old lanterns. Mrs. Comstock carried her moths in the best lantern and went ahead to light the way. Elnor had sat by her window far into the night. At last she undressed and went to bed, but sleep would not come. She had gone to the city to talk with members of the school board about a room in the grades. There was a possibility that she might secure the moth and so be able to start to college that fall, but if she did not, then she wanted the school. She had been given some encouragement, but she was so unhappy that nothing mattered. She could not see the way open to anything in life while she remained with her mother, save a long series of disappointments. Yet Margaret Senton had advised her to go home and try once more. Margaret had seemed so sure there would be a change for the better that Elnora had consented, although she had no hope herself. So strong is the bond of blood, she could not make up her mind to seek a home elsewhere, even after the day which had passed. Unable to sleep, she arose at last, and the room being warm, she sat on the floor by the window. The lights in the swamp caught her eye. She was very uneasy, for quite a hundred of her best moths were in the case. However, there was no money, and no one ever had touched a book or anything of her apparatus. Watching the light set her thinking, and before she realized it, she was in a panic of fear. She hurried down the stairway, softly calling her mother. There was no answer. She lightly stepped across the sitting room and looked in at the open door. There was no one, and the bed had not been used. Her first thought was that her mother had gone to the pool, and the Limberlost was alive with signals. Pity and fear mingled in the heart of the girl. She opened the kitchen door, crossed the garden, and ran back to the swamp. As she neared it, she listened, but she could hear only the usual voices of night. Mother, she called softly, then louder, Mother! There was not a sound. Chilled with fright, she hurried back to the cabin. She did not know what to do. She understood what the lights in the Limberlost meant. Where was her mother? She was afraid to enter while she was growing very cold and still more fearful about remaining outside. At last she went to her mother's room, picked up the gun, carried it into the kitchen, and crowding in the little corner behind the stove, she waited in trembling anxiety. The time was dreadfully long before she heard her mother's voice. 
Then she decided that someone had been ill and sent for her, so she took courage, and stepping swiftly across the kitchen, she unbarred the door and drew back out of sight by the table. Mrs. Comstock entered, dragging her heavy feet. Her dress skirt was gone, her petticoat wet and drabbled, and the waist of her dress was almost torn from her body. Her hair hung in damp strings, her eyes were red with crying. In one hand she held the lantern, and in the other, stiffly extended before her, on a wad of calico reposed a magnificent pair of yellow emperors. Elnor stared, her lips parted. "'Shall I put these others in the kitchen?' inquired a man's voice. The girl shrank back to the shadows. "'Yes, anywhere inside the door,' replied Mrs. Comstock as she moved a few steps to make way for him. Pete's head appeared. He set down the moths and was gone. "'Thank you, Pete. More than ever woman thanked you before,' said Mrs. Comstock. She placed the lantern on the table and barred the door. As she turned, Elnora came into view. Mrs. Comstock leaned toward her and held out the moths. In a voice vibrant with tones never before heard, she said, Elnora, my girl, mother's found you another moth. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of A Girl of the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen, wherein Mother Love is bestowed on Elnora, and she finds an assistant in moth hunting. Elnora awoke at dawn and lay gazing around the unfamiliar room. She noticed that every vestige of masculine attire and belongings was gone, and knew, without any explanation, what that meant. For some reason, every tangible evidence of her father was banished, and she was at last to be allowed to take his place. She turned to look at her mother. Mrs. Comstock's face was white and haggard, but on it rested an expression of profound peace Elnora never before had seen. As she studied the features on the pillow beside her, the heart of the girl throbbed in tenderness. She realized as fully as anyone else could what her mother had suffered. Thoughts of the night brought shuddering fear. She softly slipped from the bed, went to her room, dressed, and entered the kitchen to attend the emperors and prepare breakfast. The pair had been left clinging to the piece of calico. The calico was there, and a few pieces of beautiful wing. A mouse had eaten the moths. "'Well, of all the horrible luck!' gasped Elnora. With the first thought of her mother, she caught up the remnants of the moths, burying them in the ashes of the stove. She took the bag to her room, hurriedly releasing its contents, but there was not another yellow one. Her mother had said some had been confined in the case in the Limberlost. There was still a hope that an emperor might be among them. She peeped at her mother, who still slept soundly. Elnora took a large piece of mosquito netting and ran to the swamp. Throwing it over the top of the case, she unlocked the door. She reeled, faint with distress. The living moths that had been confined there, and their fluttering to escape tonight and the mates they sought, not only had wrecked the other specimens of the case, but torn themselves to ribbons on the pins. A third of the rarest moths of the collection for the man of India were antennaless, legless, wingless, and often headless. Elnora sobbed aloud. At last she closed the door, dropped the netting, and sank on the log, staring before her with unseeing eyes, trying to think. This is overwhelming, she said at last, and is making a fatalist of me. I am beginning to think things happen as they are ordained from the beginning, this plainly indicating that there is to be no college, at least this year, for me. My life is all mountaintop or cannon. I wish some would lead me into a few days of green pastures. Last night I went to sleep on Mother's arm, the moths all secured, love and college certainties. This morning I wake to find all my hopes wrecked. I simply don't dare let Mother know that instead of helping me she has ruined my collection. Everything is gone, unless the love lasts. That actually seemed true. I believe I will go see. The love remained. Indeed, in the overflow of the long, hardened, pent-up heart, the girl was almost suffocated with tempestuous caresses and generous offerings. Before the day was over, Elnor realized that she never had known her mother at all. The woman who now busily went through the cabin, her eyes bright, eager, alert, constantly planning, was a stranger. Her very face was different, while it did not seem possible that during one night the acid of twenty years could disappear from the voice and leave it sweet and pleasant. For the next few days, Elnora worked at mounting the moths her mother had taken. 
She had to go to the Bird Woman and tell about the disaster, but Mrs. Comstock was allowed to think that Elnora delivered the moths when she made the trip. If she had told her what actually happened, the chances were that Mrs. Comstock again would have taken possession of the Limberlost, hunting there until she replaced all the moths that had been destroyed. But Elnora knew from experience what it meant to collect such a list in pairs. Valiant as she was in any good cause, this time she was compelled to admit that she was defeated. It would require hard work for at least two summers to replace the lost moths. When she left the bird woman, she went to the president of the Onabasha schools and asked him to do all in his power to secure her a room in one of the ward buildings. The next morning, the last moth was mounted and the housework finished. Elnora said to her mother, If you don't mind, I believe I will go into the woods pasture beside Sleepy Snake Creek and see if I can catch some dragonflies or moths. Wait until I get a knife and a pail and I will go along, answered Mrs. Comstock. The dandelions are plenty tender for greens among the deep grasses, and I might just happen to see something myself. My eyes are pretty sharp. I wish you could realize how young you are, said Elnora. I know women in Onabasha who are ten years older than you, yet they look twenty years younger. So could you if you would dress your hair becomingly and wear appropriate clothes. I think my hair puts me in the old woman class permanently, said Mrs. Comstock, but there was no bitterness in her voice. "'Well, it don't,' cried Elnora. "'There is a woman of twenty-eight who has hair as white as yours from sick headaches, "'but her face is young and beautiful. "'If your face would grow a little fuller and those lines would go away, you'd be lovely.' "'You little pig!' laughed Mrs. Comstock. "'Anyone would think you would be satisfied with having a splinter new mother "'without setting up a kick on her looks first thing. "'Greedy!' "'That is a good word,' said Elnora. "'I admit the charge. "'I'm greedy over every wasted year.' I want you young, lovely, prettily dressed, and enjoying life like the other girls' mothers. Mrs. Comstock laughed softly as she pushed back her sunbonnet so that shrubs and bushes along the way could be scanned closely. Elnora walked ahead with a case over her shoulder, a net in her hand. Her head was bare, the rolling collar of her lavender gingham dress was cut in a V at the throat, the sleeves only reached the elbows. Every few steps she paused and examined the shrubbery carefully, while Mrs. Comstock was watching until her eyes ached, but there were no dandelions in the pail she carried. Early June was rioting in fresh grasses, bright flowers, bird songs, and gay winged creatures of air. Down the footpath the two went through the perfect morning, the love of God and all nature in their hearts. At last they reached the creek, following it toward the bridge. Here Mrs. Comstock found a large bed of tender dandelions and stopped to fill her pail. Then she sat on the bank, picking over the greens, while she listened to the creek softly singing its June song. Elnora remained within calling distance and was having good success. At last she crossed the creek, following it up to a bridge. There she began a careful examination of the undersides of the sleepers and flooring for cocoons. Mrs. Comstock could see her in the creek for several rods above. The mother sat beating the long green leaves across her hand, carefully picking out the white buds, because Elnora liked them, when the splash up the creek attracted her attention. Around the bend came a man. He was bareheaded, dressed in a white sweater and waders which reached his waist. He kept on the bank, only entering the water when necessary. He had a queer basket strapped on his hip, and with a small rod, he sent a long line spinning before him down the creek, deftly manipulating with it a little floating object. He was nearer Elnora than her mother, but Mrs. Comstock thought possibly by hurrying she could remain unseen and yet warn the girl that a stranger was coming. Thrusting the greens into the pail, she ran down the creek bank. As she neared the bridge, she caught a sapling and leaned over the water to call Elnora. With her lips parted to speak, she hesitated a second to watch a sort of insect that flashed past on the water when the splash from the man attracted the girl. She was under the bridge, one knee planted in the embankment, and a foot braced to support her. Her hair was tousled by wind and bushes, her face flushed, and she lifted her arms above her head, working to loosen a cocoon she had found. The call Mrs. Comstock had intended to utter never found voice, for as Elnora looked down at the sound, "'Possibly I could get that for you,' suggested the man. Mrs. Comstock drew back. He was a young man with a wonderfully attractive face, although it was too white for robust health, broad shoulders, and slender upright frame. "'Oh, I do hope you can,' answered Elnora. "'It's quite a find. It's one of those lovely pale red cocoons described in the books. I suspect it comes from having been in a dark place and screened from the weather.' "'Is that so?' cried the man. 
Wait a minute, I've never seen one. I suppose it's a Cecropia from the location. Of course, said Elnor. It's so cool here the moth hasn't emerged. The cocoon is a big baggy one, and it is as red as foxtail. What luck, he cried. Are you making a collection? He reeled in his line, laid his rod across a bush, and climbed the embankment to Elnora's side, produced a knife, and began the work of whittling a deep groove around the cocoon. Yes, I paid my way through the high school in Onabasha with them. Now I am starting a collection which means college. Onabasha, said the man, that is where I am visiting. He paused to rest, for the bridge flooring was hard lumber, and the task he had set himself not easy. Possibly you know my people, Dr. Ammons? The doctor is my uncle. My home is in Chicago. I've been having typhoid fever, something fierce, in the hospital six weeks. Didn't gain strength right, so Uncle Doc sent for me. I'm to live out of doors all summer and exercise until I get in condition again. Do you know my uncle? Yes, he is Aunt Margaret's doctor, and he would be ours, only we are never ill. Well, you look it, said the man, appraising Elnora at a glance. Strangers always mention it, sighed Elnora. I wonder how it would feel to be a pale, languid lady and ride in a carriage. Ask me, laughed the man. It feels like the dickens. I'm so proud of my feet. It's quite a trick to stand on them now. I have to keep out of the water all I can and stop the baby every half mile. But with interesting outdoor work, I'll be myself in a week. Do you call that work? Elnora indicated the creek. I do indeed. Nearly three miles. Banks too soft to brag on and never a strike. Wouldn't you call that hard labor? Yes, laughed Elnora. Work at which you might kill yourself and never get a fish. Did anyone tell you there were trout in Sleepy Snake Creek? Uncle said I could try. Oh, you can try, said Elnora. You can try no end, but you'll never get a trout. This is too far south and too warm for them. If you sit on the bank and use worms, you might get some perch or catfish. But that is an exercise. Well, if you only want exercise, go right on fishing. You can get a creel full of invisible results every night. I object, said the man emphatically. He stopped work again and studied Elnora. Even the watching mother could not blame him. Against the embankment and the shade of the bridge, Elnora's bright head in her lavender dress made a picture worthy of much contemplation. I object, repeated the man. When I work, I want to see results. I'd rather exercise sawing wood, making one pile grow little and the other big, than to cast all day and catch nothing because there's not fish to take. Work for work's sake don't appeal to me. I work for results. He digged the groove around the cocoon with skilled hand. Now there is some fun in this, he said. It's going to be a fair job to cut it out, but when it comes, it is not only beautiful, but worth a price. It will help you on your way. I think I'll put up that rod and hunt moths. That would be something like. Don't you want help? Elnora parried the question. Have you ever hunted moths, Mr. Ammon? Enough to know the ropes in taking them and to distinguish the commonest ones. I go wild on Catocaly. There's too many of them, all too much alike for Philip. But I know all these fellows. One flew into my room when I was about ten years old, and we thought it a miracle. None of us ever had seen one, so we took it over to the museum to Dr. Dorsey. He said they were common enough, but we didn't see them because they flew at night. He showed me the museum collection, and I was so interested I took mine back home and started to hunt them. Every year after that we went to our cottage a month earlier so I could find them, and all my family helped. I stuck to it until I went to college. Then keeping the little moths out of the big ones was too much for the matter, so father advised I donate mine to the museum. He bought a fine case for them with my name on it, which constitutes my sole contribution to science. I know enough to help you, all right. Aren't you going north this year? All depends on how this fever leaves me. Uncle says the nights are too cold and the days too hot there for me. He thinks I'd better stay in an even temperature until I'm strong again. I'm going to stick pretty close to him until I know I am. I wouldn't admit it to anyone at home, but I was almost gone. I don't believe anything can eat up nerve much faster than the burning of a slow fever. No thanks, I have enough. I stay with Uncle Doc, so if I feel it coming again, he can do something quickly. I don't blame you, said Elnora. I never have been sick, but it must be dreadful. I'm afraid you are tiring yourself over that. Let me take the knife a while. Oh, it isn't so bad as that. I wouldn't be wading creeks if it were. I just need a few more days to get steady on my feet again. I'll have this cut out in a minute. It is kind of you to get it, said Elnora. I should have had to peel it, which would spoil the cocoon for a specimen and ruin the moth. You haven't said yet whether I may help you while I am here. Elnora hesitated. You better say yes, he persisted. It would be a real kindness. It would keep me outdoors all day and give an incentive to work. I'm good at it. I'll show you if I am not in a week or so. 
I can sugar, manipulate lights and mirrors and all the expert methods. I'll wager moths are thick in the old swamp over there. They are, said Elnor. Most I have I took there. A few nights ago my mother caught a good many, but we don't dare go alone. All the more reason why you need me. Where do you live? I can't get an answer from you. I'll just go tell your mother who I am and ask her if I may help you. I warn you, young lady, I have a very effective way with mothers. They almost never turn me down. Then it's probable you will have a new experience when you meet mine, said Elnor. She never was known to do what any one expected she surely would. The cocoon came loose. Philip Ammon stepped down the embankment, turning to offer his hand to Elnora. She ran down as she would have done alone, and taking the cocoon, turned it end for end to learn if the imago it contained was alive. Then Ammon took back the cocoon to smooth the edges. Mrs. Comstock gave them one long look as they stood there and returned to her dandelions. She began the cleaning process all over again. While she worked, she paused occasionally, listening intently. Presently they came down the creek, the man carrying the cocoon as if it were a jewel, while Elnora made her way along the bank, taking a lesson in casting. Her face was flushed with excitement, her eyes shining, the bushes taking liberties with her hair. For a picture of perfect loveliness she scarcely could have been surpassed, and the eyes of Philip Ammon seemed to be in working order. "'Mother!' called Elnora. There was an undolent, caressing sweetness in the girl's voice as she sung out the call in perfect confidence that would bring a loving answer that struck deep in Mrs. Comstock's heart. She never had heard that word so pronounced before, and a lump rose in her throat. Here, she answered. She went on examining the dandelion leaves. Mother, this is Mr. Philip Ammon of Chicago, said Elnor. He has been ill, and he is staying with Dr. Ammon in Onabasha. He came fishing down the creek and cut this cocoon from under the bridge for me. He feels it would be better to hunt moths than to fish until he gets well. What do you think about it? Philip Ammon extended his hand. I'm glad to know you, he said. You may take the handshaking for granted, replied Mrs. Comstock. Dandelions have a way of making the fingers sticky, and I like to know a man before I take his hand anyway. That introduction seems mighty comprehensive on your part, but still leaves me unclassified. My name is Comstock. Philip bowed. I am sorry to hear you have been sick, said Mrs. Comstock, but if people will live where they have such vile water as they do in Chicago, I don't see what else they are to expect. Ammon studied her intently. I am sure I didn't have a fever on purpose, he said. You do seem a little wobbly on your legs, she observed. Maybe you had better sit and rest while I finish these greens. It's late for the genuine article, but in the shade among long grass they are still tender. May I have a leaf? asked Ammon, reaching for one as he sat on the bank, looking from the little creek at his feet, away through the dim cool spaces of the June forest on the opposite side. He drew a deep breath. Glory, but this is good after almost two months inside hospital walls. He stretched on the grass and lay gazing up at the leaves, occasionally asking the interpretation of a bird note, or the origin of an unfamiliar forest voice. Elnora began helping with the dandelions. Another, please, said the young man, holding out his hand. Do you suppose this is the kind of grass Nebuchadnezzar ate? she asked, giving the leaf. He knew a good thing if it was. Oh, you should taste dandelions boiled with bacon and accompanied by mother's especial brand of cornbread. Don't! My appetite is twice my size now. While it is, how far is it to Onabasha, shortest cut? Three miles. The man lay in perfect content, nibbling leaves. This surely is a treat, he said. No wonder you find good hunting here. There seems to be foliage for almost every kind of caterpillar. But I suppose you have to exchange for northern species and Pacific coast kinds. Yes, and everyone wants regalis in trade. I never saw the like. They consider Cecropia or Polyphemus an insult, and Alunus barely acceptable. What authorities have you? Elnora began to name textbooks which started a discussion. Mrs. Comstock listened. She cleaned dandelions with greater deliberation than they ever before were examined. In reality, she was taking stock of the young man's long, well-proportioned frame, his strong hands, his smooth, fine-textured skin, his thick shock of dark hair, and making mental notes of his simple, manly speech and the fact that he evidently did know a great deal about Ma's. It pleased her to think that if he had been a neighbor boy who had lain beside her every day of his life while she worked, he could have been no more at home. She liked the things he said, but she was proud that Elnora had a ready answer which always seemed appropriate. At last, Mrs. Comstock finished the greens. 
"'You are three miles from the city and less than a mile from where we live,' she said. "'If you will tell me what you dare eat, I suspect you had best go home with us and rest until the cool of the day before you start back. Probably someone that you can ride in with will be passing before evening.' "'That is mighty kind of you,' said Philip. "'I think I will. It don't matter so much what I eat. The point is that I must be moderate. I am hungry all the time.' "'Then we will go,' said Mrs. Comstock, "'and we will not allow you to make yourself sick with us.' Philip Ammon was on his feet. Picking up the pail of greens and his fishing rod, he stood waiting. Elnora led the way. Mrs. Comstock motioned Philip to follow, and she walked in the rear. The girl carried the cocoon and the box of moss she had taken, searching every step for more. The young man frequently set down his load to join in the pursuit of a dragonfly or moth, while Mrs. Comstock watched the proceedings with sharp eyes. Every time Philip picked up the pail of green, she struggled to suppress a smile. Elnora proceeded slowly, chattering about everything along the trail. Philip was interested in all the objects she pointed out, noticing several things which escaped her. He carried the greens just as casually when they took a short cut down the roadway as along the trail. When Elnora turned toward the gate of her home, Philip Ammon stopped, took a long look at the big, hued long cabin, the vines which clambered over it, the flower garden ablaze with beds of bright bloom interspersed with strawberries and tomatoes, the trees of the forest rising north and west like a green wall, and exclaimed, "'How beautiful!' Mrs. Comstock was pleased. "'If you think that,' she said, "'perhaps you will understand how in all this present-day rush to be modern, I have preferred to remain as I began. My husband and I took up this land, and enough trees to build the cabin, stable, and outbuildings are about all we ever cut. Of course, if he had lived, I suppose we should have kept with our neighbors.' I hear considerable about the value of the land, the trees which are on it, and the oil which is supposed to be under it, but as yet I haven't brought myself to change anything. So we stand for one of the few remaining homes of first settlers in this region. Come in. You are very welcome to what we have. Mrs. Comstock stepped forward and took the lead. She had a bowl of soft water and a pair of boots to offer for the heavy waiters, for outer comfort, a glass of cold buttermilk and a bench on which to rest, and the circular arbor until dinner was ready. Philip Ammon splashed in the water. He followed to the stable and exchanged boots there. He was ravenous for the buttermilk, and when he stretched on the bench in the arbor, the flickering patches of sunlight so tantalized his tired eyes, while the bees made such splendid music, he was soon sound asleep. When Elnor and her mother came out with the table, they stood a short time looking at him. It is probable Mrs. Comstock voiced a united thought when she said, "'What a refined, decent-looking young man! How proud his mother must be of him!' We must be careful what we let him eat. Then they returned to the kitchen, where Mrs. Comstock proceeded to be careful. She broiled ham of her own sugar curing, creamed potatoes, served asparagus on toast, and made a delicious strawberry shortcake. As she cooked dandelions with bacon, she feared to serve them to him, so she made an excuse that it took too long to prepare them, blanched some, and made a salad. When everything was ready, she touched Ammon's sleeve. "'Best have something to eat, lad, before you get too hungry,' she said." "'Please hurry,' he begged laughingly as he held a plate toward her to be filled. "'I thought I had enough self-restraint to start out alone, but I see I was mistaken. "'If you would allow me just now, I am afraid I should start a fever again. "'I never did smell food so good as this. "'It's mighty kind of you to take me in. "'I hope I will be man enough in a few days to do something worth while in return.' Spots of sunshine fell on the white cloth and blue china. The bees and an occasional stray butterfly came searching for food. A rose-breasted grosbeak, released from a three-hour siege of brooding, while his independent mate took her bath in recreation, mounted the top branch of a maple in the west woods, from which he serenaded the dinner party with a joyful chorus and celebration of his freedom. Ammon's eyes strained to the beautiful cabin, to the mixture of flowers and vegetables stretching down to the road, and to the singing bird with his red-splotched breast of white, and he said, "'I can't realize now that I ever lay in ice packs in a hospital.' How I wish all the sick folks could come here to grow strong. The grass beaks sang on. A big turnus butterfly sailed through the arbor and posed over the table. Elnora held up a lump of sugar, and the butterfly, clinging to her fingers, tasted daintily. With eager eyes and parted lips, the girl held steadily. When at last it wavered away, That made a picture, said Ammon. Ask me some other time how I lost my illusions concerning butterflies. I always thought of them in connection with sunshine, flower pollen, and fruit nectar, until one sad day. I know, laughed Elnor. I've seen that too, but it didn't destroy any illusion for me. I think just as much of the butterflies as ever. 
Then they talked of flowers, moths, dragonflies, Indian relics, and all the natural wonders the swamp afforded, straying from those subjects to books and schoolwork. When they cleared the table, Ammon assisted, carrying several tray loads to the kitchen. He and Elnora mounted specimens while Mrs. Comstock washed the dishes. Then she came out with a ruffle she was embroidering. "'I wonder if I did not see a picture of you and Onabasha last night,' Ammon said to Elnora. "'Aunt Anna took me to call Miss Brown Lee. She was showing me her crowd. "'Of course it was you, but it didn't have to do you justice, although it looked the nearest human of any of them. "'Miss Brown Lee is very fond of you. She said the finest things.' Then they talked of commencement, and at last Ammon said he must go, or his friends would become anxious about him. Mrs. Comstock brought him a blue bowl of creamy milk and a plate of bread. She stopped a passing team and secured a ride to the city for him, as his exercise in the morning had been a little too violent, and he was forced to admit he was tired. "'May I come tomorrow afternoon and chase Ma's a while?' he asked Mrs. Comstock as he arose. "'We will sugar a tree and put a light by it, if I can get stuff to make the preparation.' "'Possibly we can take some that way. "'I always enjoy moth-hunting. "'I like to help Miss Elnor, and it would be a charity to me. "'I've got to remain outdoors some place, "'and I'm quite sure I'd get well faster here than anywhere else. "'Please say I might come.' "'I have no objections if Elnor really would like help,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'In her heart she wished he would not. "'She wanted her newly found treasure all to herself for a time at least. "'But Elnor's were eager, shining eyes.' She thought it would be splendid to have help and great fun to try book methods for taking moths, so it was arranged. As Ammon rode away, Mrs. Comstock's eyes followed him. "'What a nice young man,' she said. "'He seems fine,' agreed Elnora. "'He comes of a good family, too. I've often heard of his father. He is a great lawyer.' "'I am glad he likes it here. I need help. Possibly—possibly possibly what?' "'We can get a great many moths. "'What did he mean about the butterflies?' that he always had connected them with sunshine, flowers, and fruits, and thought of them as the most exquisite of creations. Then one day he found some clustering thickly over carrion. Come to think of it, I have seen butterflies. So had he, laughed Elnor, and that's what he meant. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Wherein a new position is tendered Elnora, and Philip Ammon is shown Limberlost Violets. The next morning Mrs. Comstock called to Elnora. The mail carrier stopped at our box. Elnora ran down the walk and came back carrying an official-looking letter. She tore it open and read, My dear Miss Comstock, At the weekly meeting of the Onabasha School Board last night, it was decided to add the position of lecturer on natural history to our corps of city teachers. It will be the duty of this person to spend two hours a week in each of the grade schools exhibiting and explaining specimens of the most prominent objects in nature. Animals, birds, insects, flowers, vines, shrubs, bushes, and trees. These specimens and lectures should be appropriate to the seasons and the comprehension of the grades. This position was unanimously voted to you. I think you will find the work delightful and much easier than the routine grind of the other teachers. It is my advice that you accept and begin to prepare yourself at once. Your salary will be $750 a year and you will be allowed $200 for expenses in procuring specimens and books. Let us know at once if you want the position as it is going to be difficult to fill satisfactorily if you do not. Very truly yours, David Thompson, President, Onabasha Schools. I hardly understand, marveled Mrs. Comstock. It is a new position. They never have had anything like it before. I suspect it arose from the help I've been giving the grade teachers in their nature work. They are trying to teach the children something, and half the instructors don't know a blue jay from a kingfisher, a beech leaf from an elm, or a wasp from a hornet. Well, do you? anxiously inquired Mrs. Comstock. Indeed I do, laughed Elnor, and several other things beside. When Freckles bequeathed me the swamp, he gave me a bigger inheritance than he knew. While you have thought I was wandering aimlessly, I have been following a definite plan, studying hard, and storing up the stuff that will earn these seven hundred and fifty dollars. Mother dear, I am going to accept this, of course. The work will be a delight. I love it most of anything in teaching. You must help me. We must find nests, eggs, leaves, queer formations and plants, and rare flowers. 
I must have flower boxes made for each of the rooms and filled with wild things. I should begin to gather specimens this very day. Elnora was on her feet. Her face was flushed and her eyes bright. Oh, what great work that will be, she cried. You must go with me so you can see the little faces when I tell them how the goldfinch builds its nest and how the bees make honey. So Elnora and her mother went into the woods behind the cabin to study nature. I think, said Elnora, the idea is to begin with fall things in the fall, keeping to the seasons throughout the year. What are fall things? inquired Mrs. Comstock. Oh, French gentians, asters, ironwort, every fall flower, leaves from every tree and vine, what makes them change color, abandoned bird nests, winter quarters of caterpillars and insects, what becomes of the butterflies and grasshoppers, just myriads of stuff. I never can use the half there will be to show. I shall have to be very wise to select the things that will be most beneficial for the children to learn. Can I really help you? Mrs. Comstock's strong face was pathetic. "'Indeed, yes,' cried Elnor. "'I never can get through it alone. "'There will be an immense amount of work "'connected with securing and preparing specimens.' "'Mrs. Comstock lifted her head proudly "'and began doing business at once. "'Her sharp eyes ranged from earth to heaven. "'She investigated everything, "'asking innumerable questions. "'By noon she was as eager and interested as Elnora. "'The morning was filled with happiness for both of them.' Near noon, Mrs. Comstock took the specimens they had collected and went to prepare dinner, while Elnora followed the woods down to Sentence to show her letter. She had to explain what became of her moths and why college would have to be abandoned for that year, but Margaret and Wesley vowed not to tell. Wesley waved the letter excitedly, explaining it to Margaret as if it was a personal possession. Margaret was deeply impressed, while Billy volunteered first aid in gathering material. "'Now anything you want in the ground, Snap can dig it out,' he said. "'Uncle Wesley and I found a hole three times as big as Snap that he dug at the roots of a tree.' "'We will chain him to hunt pupa cases,' said Elnora. "'Are you going to the woods this afternoon?' asked Billy. "'Yes,' answered Elnora. "'Dr. Ammon's nephew from Chicago is visiting in Onabasha. "'He is going to show me how men put some sort of compound on a tree, "'hang a light by it, and take moths that way. "'It will be interesting to watch and learn.' "'May I come?' asked Billy. "'Of course you may come,' answered Elnor. "'Is this nephew of Dr. Ammon a young man?' inquired Margaret. "'About twenty-six, I should think,' said Elnor. "'He said he had been out of college and at work in his father's law office three years.' "'Does he seem nice?' asked Margaret, and Wesley smiled. "'Finest kind of a person,' said Elnor. "'He can teach me so much. "'It is very interesting to hear him talk. "'He knows considerable about moths that will be a help to me.' He had a fever, and he has to stay outdoors until he grows strong again. "'Billy, I guess you'd better help me this afternoon,' said Margaret. "'Maybe Elnora had rather not bother with you.' "'There's no reason on earth why Billy should not come,' cried Elnora, and Wesley smiled again. "'I must hurry home and get my dinner, or I won't be ready,' she added. "'I thought you never would come,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'If you don't hurry, Mr. Ammon will be here before you get dressed.' "'I forgot about him until just now,' said Elnor. "'I am not going to dress. He's not coming to visit. "'We are only going to the woods for more specimens. "'I can't wear anything that requires care. "'The limbs take the most dreadful liberties with hair and clothing.' "'Mrs. Comstock opened her lips, looked at Elnor, and closed them. "'In her heart she was pleased that the girl was so interested in her work "'that she had forgotten Philip Ammon's coming.' but it did seem to her that such a pleasant young man should have been greeted by a girl in a fresh dress. "'If she isn't disposed to primp at the coming of a man, heaven forbid that I should be the one to start her,' thought Mrs. Comstock. So she did the primping in honor of the occasion. It consisted of a fresh gingham dress and hair coiled a little more loosely than usual. Ammon came whistling down the walk between the cinnamon pinks, pansies, and strawberries. He carried several packages while his face flushed with more color than on the previous day. "'Only see what has happened to me,' cried Elnor, offering her letter. "'I'll wager I know,' answered Ammon. "'Isn't it great? Everyone in Onabasha is talking about it. At last there is something new under the sun. All of them are pleased. They think you'll make a big success. This will give an incentive to work. In a few days more I'll be myself again and won't overturn the fields and woods around here.' He went on to congratulate Mrs. Comstock. "'Aren't you proud of her, though?' he asked. "'You should hear what folks are saying. "'They say she created the necessity for the position, "'and everyone seems to feel that it is a necessity. 
Now, if she succeeds, and she will, all of the other city schools will have such departments, and first thing you know, she will have made the whole world just a little better. Let me rest a few seconds. My feet are acting up again. Then we will cook the compound and put it to cool. He laughed as he sat breathing shortly. It doesn't seem possible that a fellow could lose his strength like this. My knees are actually trembling, but I'll be all right in a minute. Uncle Doc said I could come. I told him how you took care of me, and he said I would be safe here. Then he began unwrapping packages and explaining to Mrs. Comstock how to cook the compound to attract the moths. He followed her into the kitchen, kindled the fire, and stirred the preparation as he talked. While the mixture cooled, he and Elnor walked through the vegetable garden behind the cabin and strayed from there into the woods. "'What about college?' he asked. "'Miss Brownlee said you were going.' "'I had hoped to,' replied Elnor. "'But I had a streak of dreadful luck, so I'll have to wait until next year. "'If you won't speak of it, I'll tell you.' Ammon promised, and Elnor recited the history of the Yellow Emperor. She was so interested in doing the Emperor justice, she did not notice how many personalities went into the story. A few pertinent questions told Ammon the rest. He looked at the girl in wonder. In face and form, she was as lovely as any one of her age and type he ever had seen. Her schoolwork far surpassed that of most girls of her age he knew. She differed in other ways. This vast store of learning she had gathered from field and forest was a wealth of attraction no other girl possessed. Her frank, matter-of-fact manner was an inheritance from her mother, but there was something more. Once, as they talked, he thought sympathy was the word to describe it, and again comprehension. She seemed to possess a large sense of brotherhood for all human and animate creatures. She spoke to him as if she had known him all her life. She talked to the Grosbeak in exactly the same manner as she laid strawberries and potato bugs on the fence for his family. She did not swerve an inch from her way when a snake slid by her, while the squirrels came down from the trees and took corn from her fingers. She might as well have been a boy, so lacking was she in any touch of feminine coquetry toward him. He studied her wonderingly. As they went along the path, they reached a large slime-covered pool surrounded by decaying stumps and logs, thickly covered with water hyacinths and blue flags. Ammon stopped. Is that the place? he asked. Elnora assented. The doctor told you. Yes, it was tragic. Is that pool really bottomless? So far as we ever have been able to discover. Ammon stood looking at the water while the long, sweet grasses, thickly sprinkled with blue flag bloom, over which wild beasts clambered, swayed around his feet. Then he turned to the girl. She had worked hard. The same lavender dress she had worn the previous day clung to her in limp condition but she was as evenly colored and of as fine grain as a wild rose petal. Her hair was really brown, but never was such hair touched with a redder glory, while her heavy arching brows added a look of strength to her big gray-blue eyes. "'And you were born here?' He had not intended to voice that thought. "'Yes,' she said, looking into his eyes, "'just in time to prevent my mother from saving the life of my father. She came near never forgiving me.' "'Ah, oh, cruel!' cried Ammon. I find a great deal in life that is cruel from our standpoint, said Elnor. It takes the large wisdom of the unfathomable, the philosophy of the Almighty, to bear some of it. But there is always right somewhere, and at last it seems to come. Will it come to you? asked Ammon, who found himself suffering intensely. It has come, said the girl serenely. It came a week ago. It came in fullest measure when my mother ceased to regret that I had been born. Now work that I love has come that should constitute happiness. A little farther along is my violet bed. I want you to see it. As Philip Ammon followed, he definitely settled upon the name of the unusual feature of Elnora's face. It should be called experience. She had known hard experiences early in life. Suffering had been her familiar more than joy. He watched her with intense earnestness, his heart deeply moved. She led him into a swampy, half-open space in the woods, stopped and stepped aside. Ammon uttered a cry of surprised delight. A few decaying logs were scattered around, the grass grew in tufts long and fine. Blue flags waved, clusters of cowslips nodded gold heads, but the whole earth was purple with the thick blank of the violets, nodding from stems a foot in length. Elnora knelt, and slipping her fingers through the leaves and grasses to the roots, gathered a few violets and gave them to Philip. Can your city greenhouses surpass them? she asked. Ammon sat on the log to examine the blooms. 
They are superb, he said. I never saw such length of stem or such rank leaves. While the flowers are the deepest blue, the truest violet I ever saw growing wild. They are colored exactly like the eyes of the girl I am going to marry. Elnora handed him several others to add to those he held. She must have wonderful eyes, she commented. No other blue eyes are quite so beautiful, he said. In fact, she is altogether lovely. It is customary for a man to think the girl he is going to marry lovely. I wonder if I should find her so. You would, said Ammon. No one ever fails to. She is tall as you, very slender, but perfectly rounded. You know about her eyes. Her hair is black and wavy, while her complexion is clear and flushed with red. Elnora knelt among the flowers as she looked at him. Why, she must be the most beautiful girl in the whole world, she cried. Ammon laughed. No, indeed, he said. She is not a particle better looking in her way than you are in yours. She is a type of dark beauty, but you are just as perfect. She is unusual in her combination of black hair and violent eyes, although everyone thinks them black in a little distance. You are quite as unusual with your fair face, black brows, and brown hair. Indeed, I know many people who would prefer your bright head to her dark one. It's all a question of taste, and being engaged to the girl, he added. That would be likely to prejudice one, laughed Elnora. Edith has a birthday soon. If these last, will you let me have a box of them to send her? I will help gather and pack them for you so they will carry nicely. Does she hunt moths with you? Back went Philip Ammon's head in a gale of laughter. No, he cried. She says they are creepy. She would scream herself into a spasm if she were compelled to touch those young caterpillars I saw you handling yesterday. Why would she? marveled Elnor. Haven't you told her that they are perfectly clean, helpless, and harmless as so much animate velvet? No, I've not told her. She wouldn't care enough about caterpillars to listen. In what is she interested? What interests Edith Carr? Let me think. First, I believe she takes pride in being just a little handsomer and better dressed than any girl of her set. She is interested in having a beautiful home, fine appointments about her, and being petted, praised, and the acknowledged leader of society. She likes to find new things which amuse her, and to always and in all circumstances have her own way about everything. Good gracious, cried Elnor, staring at him. But what does she do? How does she spend her time? Spend her time, repeated Ammon. Well, she would call that a joke. Her days are never long enough. There is endless shopping to find the pretty things. Regular visits to the dressmakers, calls, parties, theaters, entertainments. She is always fresh. I never get to see half as much of her as I would like. But I mean work, persisted Elnor. In what is she interested that is useful to the world? Me, cried Ammon promptly. I can understand that, laughed Elnor. What I can't understand is how you can be in... She stopped short in confusion, but she saw that he had finished the sentence as she had intended. I beg your pardon, she cried. I didn't mean to say that. But I cannot understand these people I hear about who live only for their own amusement. Perhaps it is very great. I'll never have a chance to know. To me it seems the only pleasure in this world worth having is the joy we get out of living for those we love and those we can help. I hope you are not angry with me. Ammon sat silently, looking far away, with deep thought in his eyes. "'You are angry,' faltered Elnora. His look came back to her as she knelt before him among the flowers, and he gazed at her steadily. "'No doubt I should be,' he said. "'But the fact is, I am not. I cannot understand a life purely for personal pleasure myself. But she is only a girl, and this is her playtime. When she is a woman in her own home, then she will be different, will she not?' Elnora never resembled her mother so closely as when she answered that question. I would have to be well acquainted with her to know, but I should hope so. To make a real home for a tired business man is a very different kind of work from that required to be a leader of society. It demands different talent and education. Of course she means to change, or she would not have promised to make a home for you. I suspect our dope is cool now. Let's go try for some butterflies. As they went back along the path together, Elnora talked of many things, but Ammon answered absently. Evidently, he was thinking of something else. But the moth bait recalled him, and he was ready for work as they made their way back to the woods. He wanted to try the Limberlost, but Elnora was firm about keeping on home ground. She did not tell him that lights hung in the swamp would be a signal to call up a band of men whose presence she dreaded. So they set out, Ammon carrying the dope, Elnora the net, Billy and Mrs. Comstock falling with cyanide boxes and lanterns. 
First, they tried for butterflies and captured several fine ones with little trouble. They also called swarms of ants, beetles, bees, and flies. When it grew dusk, Mrs. Comstock and Ammon went to prepare supper. All Nora and Billy remained until the butterflies went to bed. Then they lighted the lanterns, repainted the trees, and followed the home trail. "'Do you expect you'll get just a lot of moths?' asked Billy as he walked beside Elnora. "'I am sure I hardly know,' said the girl. "'This is a new way for me. Perhaps they will come to the lights, but few moths eat, and I have some doubt about those which the lights attract settling on the right trees. Maybe the smell of that dope will draw them. Between us, Billy, I think I like the old way best. If I can find a hidden moth, slip up and catch it unawares, or take it in full flight, it's my captive, and I can keep it until it dies naturally.' but this way you seem to get it under false pretenses it has no chance and it will probably ruin its wings struggling for freedom before morning well any moth ought to be proud to be taken anyway by you said billy just look what you do you can make everybody love them people even quit hating caterpillars when they see you handle them and hear you tell all about them you just must have some to show people how they are it's not like killing things to see if you can or because you want to eat them the way most men kill birds I think it is right for you to take enough for collections, to show city people, and to illustrate the bird woman's books. You go on and take them. The moths don't care. They're glad to have you. They like it. Billy, I see your future, said Elnora. We will educate you and send you up to Mr. Ammon to make a great lawyer. You beat the world as a special pleader. You actually make me feel that I am doing the moths a kindness to take them. And so you are, cried Billy. Why, just from what you have taught them, Uncle Wesley and Aunt Margaret never think of killing a caterpillar until they look whether it's the beautiful June moth kind or the horrid tent ones. That's what you can do. You just go ahead. Billy, you are a jewel, cried Elnora, throwing her arm across his shoulders as they came down the path. My, I was scared, said Billy with a deep breath. Scared? questioned Elnora. Yes, sirree. Aunt Margaret scared me. May I ask you a question? Of course you may. Is that man going to be your beau? Billy, no. What made you think such a thing? Aunt Margaret said likely he would fall in love with you and you won't want me around any more. Oh, but I was scared. It isn't so, is it? Indeed, no. I am your beau, ain't I? Surely you are, said Elnora, tightening her arm. I do hope Aunt Kate has ginger cookies, said Billy with a little skip of delight. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of A Girl the Limbo Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, wherein Mrs. Comstock faces the Almighty and Philip Ammon writes a letter. Mrs. Comstock and Elnora were finishing breakfast the next morning when they heard a cheery whistle down the road. Elnora, with surprised eyes, looked at her mother. Could that be Mr. Ammon? She questioned. I did not expect him so soon, commented Mrs. Comstock. It was just sunrise, but the musician was Philip Ammon. He looked stronger than yesterday. I hope I'm not too early, he said. I'm consumed with anxiety to learn if we have made a catch. If we have, we should beat the birds to it. I promised Uncle Doc to pawn my waders and keep dry for a few days yet when I go to the woods. Let's hurry. I'm afraid of crows. There might be a rare moth. The sun was topping the limberlost when they started. As they neared the place, Ammon stopped. Now we must use great caution, he said. The lights and the odors always attract numbers that don't settle on the baited trees. Every bush, shrub, and limb may hide a specimen we want. So they approached with much care. There is something anyway, cried Ammon, who was leading the way. There are moths. I can see them, exulted Elnora. Those you see are fast enough. It's the ones for which you must search that will get away. The grasses are dripping, and I have boots, so you look along the path while I take the outside, suggested Amon. Mrs. Comstock wanted to hunt moths, but she was timid about making a wrong movement, so she wisely sat on the log and watched Ammon and Elnora to learn how they proceeded. Back in the deep woods, a hermit thrush was singing his chant to the rising sun. Orioles were sowing the pure, sweet air with notes of gold, poured out while on wing. The robins were only chirping now, for their morning songs had awakened all the other birds an hour ago. Scolding red wings tilted on half the bushes. Excepting late species of haws, tree bloom was almost gone, but wild flowers made the path border and all the wood floor a riot of color. Elnor, born among such scenes, worked eagerly, 
but to the city man, shortly from a hospital, they seemed too good to miss. He frequently stooped to examine the flower face, paused to listen intently to the thrush, or lifted his head to see the gold flash which accompanied the oriole's trailing notes. So Elnora uttered the first cry as she softly lifted branches and peered among the grasses. "'My fine!' she called. "'Bring the box, mother!' Ammon came hurrying also. When they reached her, she stood on the path holding a pair of moths. Her eyes were wide with excitement, her cheeks pink, her red lips parted, and on the hand she held out to them clung a pair of delicate blue-green moths with white bodies and touches of lavender and straw color. All about her lay flower-brocaded grasses behind the deep green background of the forest, while the sun slowly sifted gold from heaven to burnish her hair. Mrs. Comstock heard a sharp breath behind her. "'Oh, what a picture!' exulted Ammon at her shoulder. "'She is absolutely and altogether lovely. "'I'd give a small fortune for that faithfully set on canvas.' He picked the box from Mrs. Comstock's fingers and slowly advanced with it. Elnora held down her hand and transferred the moths. Ammon closed the box carefully, but the watching mother saw that his eyes were following the girl's face. He was not making the slightest attempt to conceal what he felt. I wonder if a woman ever did anything lovelier than to find a pair of luna moths on a forest path early on a perfect June morning, he said to Mrs. Comstock as he returned the box. She glanced at Elnora. The girl had gone back to work and was intently searching the bushes. Look here, young man, said Mrs. Comstock. You seem to find that girl of mine about right. I could suggest no improvement, said Ammon. I never saw a more attractive girl anywhere. She seems absolutely perfect to me. "'Then suppose you don't start any scheme calculated to spoil her,' suggested Mrs. Comstock dryly. "'I don't think you can, or that any man could, but I'm not taking any risks. "'You asked to come here to help in this work. "'We are both glad to have you, if you can find yourself to work. "'But it's the least you can do to leave us as you find us.' "'I beg your pardon,' said Ammon. "'I intended no offense. "'I admire her as I admire any perfect creation.' "'And nothing in all this world spoils the average girl so quickly and so surely,' said Mrs. Comstock. She raised her voice. "'Elnora, fasten up that tag of hair over your left ear. These bushes must do so you remind me of a sheep poking its nose through a hedge fence.' Mrs. Comstock started down the path toward her log again, and as she reached it, she called sharply, "'Elnora, come here. I believe I have found something myself.' The something was a Citheronia regalis which had just emerged from its case on the soft earth by the log. It climbed up the wood, its stout legs dragging a big pursy body, while it wildly flapped tiny wings the size of a man's thumbnail. Elnor gave one look and a cry which brought Ammon. "'That's the rarest moth in America,' he announced. "'Mrs. Comstock, you've gone up head. You can put that in a box with a screen cover tonight and attract a half-dozen, possibly.' "'Is it rare, Elnor?' inquired Mrs. Comstock, as if no one else knew. "'It surely is,' answered Elnor. "'If we can find it a mate tonight, we'll lay from two hundred and fifty to three hundred eggs tomorrow. "'With any luck at all, I can raise two hundred caterpillars from them. "'I did once before, and they are worth a dollar apiece.' "'Was the one I killed like that?' gasped Mrs. Comstock. "'No, that was a different moth, but its life processes were the same as this.' The bird woman calls this the king of the poets. Why does she? Because it is named for Citheron, who was a poet, and Regalis refers to king. You mustn't touch it, or you may stunt wing development. You watch and don't let that moth out of sight or anything come near it. When the wings are expanded and hardened, we will put it in the box. I'm afraid it will race itself to death, objected Mrs. Comstock. That's a part of the game, said Ammon. It is starting circulation now. When the right moment comes, it will stop and develop its wings. If you watch closely, you can see them expand. Presently, the moth found a rough projection of bark and clung with its feet back down, its wings hanging. The body was an unusual orange-red. The tiny wings were gray, striped with the red and splotched here and there with markings of canary yellow. Mrs. Comstock watched breathlessly. Presently, she slipped off the log and knelt to get a better view. Are its wings growing? called Elnor. They are getting larger and the markings coming stronger every minute. Let's watch too, said Elnora to Ammon. They came and looked over Mrs. Comstock's shoulder. Lower drooped the gray wings, wider they spread, brighter grew the markings as if laid off in geometrical patterns. They could hear Mrs. Comstock's tense breath and see her absorbed expression. Young people, she said solemnly, if your studying science and the elements has ever led you to feel that things just happen, kind of evolved by chance as it were, this sight will be good for you. 
Maybe earth and air accumulate, but it takes the wisdom of the Almighty God to devise the wings of a moth. If there ever was a miracle, this whole process is one. Now, as I understand it, this creature is going to keep on spreading those wings until they grow to size and harden to strength sufficient to bear its body. Then it flies away, mates with its kind, lays its eggs on the leaves of a certain tree, and the eggs hatch tiny caterpillars which eat just that kind of leaves, and the worms grow and grow and take on different forms and colors, until at last they are big caterpillars, six inches long with large horns. Then they burrow into the earth, build a house around themselves from material which is inside them, and lie through rain and freezing cold for months. A year from egg laying they would come out like this and begin the process all over again. They don't eat. They don't see distinctly. They live but a few days and fly only at night. Then they drop off easy. But the process goes on. A shivering movement went over the moth. The wings drooped and spread wider. Mrs. Comstock fell into soft, awed tones. There never was a moment in my life, she said, when I felt so in the presence as I do now. I feel as if the Almighty was so real and so near that I could reach out and touch him, as I could this wonderful work of his, if I dared. I feel like saying to him, To the extent of my brain power, I realize your presence and all it is in me to comprehend of your power. Help me to learn, even this late, the lessons of your wonderful creations. Help me to unshackle and expand my soul to the fullest realization of your wonders. Almighty God, make me bigger, make me broader. The moth climbed to the end of the projection, up it a little way, then suddenly reversed its wings, turning the hidden sides out and dropping them along its abdomen, like a great fly. The outside of the wings thus exposed was far richer color, more exquisite texture than the under, and they slowly half-lifted and drooped again. Mrs. Comstock turned her face to Ammon. "'Am I an old fool, or do you feel it too?' she half-whispered. "'You are wiser than you ever have been before,' answered Ammon. "'I feel it too.' "'I also,' breathed Elnora. The moth spread its wings, shivered them tremulously, opening and closing them rapidly. Ammon handed the box to Elnora. She shook her head. "'I can't take that one,' she said. "'Let her go.' "'But Elnora,' protested Mrs. Comstock, "'I don't want to let her go. She's mine.' She's the first one I ever found this way. Can't you put her in a big box and let her live without hurting her? I can't bear to let her go. I want to learn all about her. Then watch while we get these on the trees, said Elnora. We will take her home until night and then decide what to do. She won't fly for a long time yet. Mrs. Comstock settled on the ground, an elbow on her knee, her chin in her palm, gazing at the moth. Elnora and Ammon went to the bathed trees, placing several large moths and a number of smaller ones in the cyanide jar, and searching the bushes beyond, where they found several paired specimens of differing families. When they returned, Elnora showed her mother how to hold her hand before the moth so that it would climb upon her fingers. Then they started back to the cabin, Elnora and Ammon leading the way. Mrs. Comstock followed slowly, stepping with great care lest she stumble and jar the moth. Her face wore a look of comprehension. In her eyes was an exalted light. On she came to the blue-bordered pool lying beside her path. A turtle scrambled from a log and splashed into the water, while a red wing shouted, Oh, gully! to her. Mrs. Comstock paused and looked intently at the slime-covered quagmire, framed in a flower riot and homed over by sweet-voiced birds. Then she gazed at the thing of incomparable beauty clinging to her fingers and said softly, if you had known about wonders like these in the days of your youth, Robert Comstock, could you ever have done what you did? Elnora missed her mother, and turning to look for her, saw her standing beside the pool. Would the old fascination return? A panic of fear seized the girl. She went back swiftly. Are you afraid she is going? Elnora asked. If you are, cup your other hand over her for shelter. Carrying her through this air and in the hot sunshine will dry her wings and make them ready for flight very quickly. You can't trust her in such air and light as you can in the cool, dark woods. As she talked, she took hold of her mother's sleeve, anxiously smiling a pitiful little smile that Mrs. Comstock understood. Ammon set his load at the back door, returning to hold open the garden gate for Elnora and Mrs. Comstock. He reached it just in time to see them standing together beside the pool. The mother bent swiftly and kissed the girl on the lips. Ammon wheeled and was busily hunting moths on the raspberry bushes when they reached the gate. And so excellent are the rewards of attending your own business that he found a splendid promethea on the lilac in a corner, a moth of such rare, wine-colored, velvety shades that almost sent Mrs. Comstock to her knees again. 
but this one was fully developed, able to fly, and had to be taken into the cabin hurriedly. Mrs. Comstock stood in the middle of the room, holding up her regalis. "'Now what must I do?' she asked. El Nora glanced at Philip Ammon. Their eyes met, and both of them smiled. He, with amusement at the tall, spare figure with dark eyes and white crown, asking the childish question so confidingly, and El Nora with exultant pride. The girl was beginning to appreciate the greatness of her mother. "'How would you like to sit and see your finished development?' "'I'll get dinner,' proposed the girl." After they had dined, Ammon and El Nora carried the dishes to the kitchen, brought out boxes, sheets of cork, pins, ink, paper for slips, and everything necessary for mounting and classifying the moths they had taken. When the housework was finished, Mrs. Comstock brought her ruffle and sat near, watching and listening. She remembered all they said that she understood, and when uncertain, she asked questions. Occasionally, she laid down her work to straighten some flower which needed attention, or to go to the garden for a bug for the grosbeak. In one of these absences, Elnora said to Ammon, These replaced quite a number of the moths I lost for the man of India. With a week of such luck, I could almost begin to talk college again. There is no reason why you should not have the week and the luck, said Ammon. I have taken moths until the middle of August, though I suspect one is more apt to find late ones in the north, where it is colder than here. The next week is hay time, but we can count on a few double brooders and strays, and by working the exchange method for all it is worth, I think we can complete the collection again. "'You almost make me hope,' said Elnor. "'But I must not allow myself. "'I don't truly think I can replace all I lost, "'not even with your help. "'If I could, I can't see my way clear "'to leave Mother this winter. "'I have found her so recently, and she is so precious, "'I can't risk losing her again. "'I am going to take the nature position "'in the Onabasha schools, "'and I shall be most happy doing the work. "'Only these are a temptation. "'I wish you might go to college this fall "'with the other girls,' said Ammon. "'I feel that if you don't, you never will. Isn't there some way? I can't see it if there is, and I really don't want to leave Mother. Well, Mother is mighty glad to hear it, said Mrs. Comstock, entering the arbor. Ammon noticed that her face was pale, her lips quivering, her voice cold. I was just saying to your daughter that she should go to college this winter, he explained, but she says she don't want to leave you. If she wants to go, I wish she could, said Mrs. Comstock, a look of relief spreading over her face. "'Oh, all girls want to go to college,' said Ammon. "'It's the only proper place to learn bridge and embroidery, "'not to mention midnight lunches and mixed pickles and fruit cake "'and all the delights of the sororities.' "'I've thought a great deal about going to college,' said Elnor, "'but I never thought of any of those things.' "'That is because your education in fudge and bridge "'has been sadly neglected,' said Ammon. "'You should hear my sister Polly. "'This was her last year. "'Lunches and sororities were all I heard her mention "'until Tom Levering came on deck. "'Now he is the leading subject.' I can't see from her daily conversation that she knows half as much really worth knowing as you do, but she can beat you miles on fun. Oh, we had some good times in the high school, said Elnor. Life hasn't been all work and study. Is Edith Carr a college girl? No, she is the very selectest kind of a private boarding school girl. Who is she? asked Mrs. Comstock. Ammon opened his lips. She is a girl in Chicago that Mr. Ammon knows very well, said Elnora. She is beautiful and rich, and a friend of his sister's. Or didn't you say that? I don't remember, but she is, said Ammon. This moth needs an alcohol bath to take off the dope. Won't the down come too? asked Elnora anxiously. No, you watch and you will see it come out, as Polly would say, a perfectly good moth. Is your sister younger than you? inquired Elnora. "'Yes,' said Ammon, "'but she is three years older than you. "'She is the dearest sister in all the world. "'I'd love to see her now.' "'Why don't you send for her?' suggested Elnor. "'Perhaps she'd like to help us catch moths.' "'Yes, I think Polly in a Varro hat, "'Picot embroidered frock, and three-inch heels "'would take more moths than any one "'that ever struck the liberal loss,' laughed Ammon. "'Well, you get lots of them, and you are her brother.' "'Yes, but that is different. "'Father was raised in Onabasha, and he loved the country.' He trained me his way, and Mother took charge of Polly. I don't just understand it. Mother is a great homebody herself, but she did succeed in making Polly strictly ornamental. Does Tom Levering need a strictly ornamental girl? You are too matter-of-fact, too strictly material. He needs a darling girl who will love him plenty, and Polly is that. Well, then, does the Limberloss need a strictly ornamental girl? No, cried Ammon. You are ornament enough for the Limberloss. I've changed my mind. I don't want Polly here. She would not enjoy catching moths or anything we do. She might, persisted Elnor. You are her brother, and surely you care for these things. 
The argument does not hold, said Amon. Polly and I do not like the same things when we are at home, but we are very fond of each other. The member of my family who would go crazy about this is my father. I wish he could come, if only for a week. I'd send for him, but he is tied up in preparing some papers for a great corporation case this summer. He likes the country. It was his vote that brought me here. Ammon leaned back in the arbor, watching the grass beak as it hunted food between the tomato vine and the daylily. Elnora set him to making labels, and when he finished them, he asked permission to write a letter. He took no pains to conceal his page, and from where she sat opposite him, Elnora could not look his way without reading, My dearest Edith. He wrote busily for a time, and then sat staring out across the garden. Have you run out of material so quickly? asked Elnora. That's about it, said Ammon. I've said that I'm getting well as rapidly as possible, that the air is fine, the folks at Uncle Doc's all well, and entirely too good to me, that I'm spending most of my time in the country helping catch moths for collection, which is splendid exercise. Now I can't think of another thing that will be interesting. There was a burst of exquisite notes in the maple. Put in the grass beak, suggested Elnora. Tell her you are so friendly with him you feed him potato bugs. Ammon dropped the pen to the sheet, bent forward, then hesitated. "'Blessed if I do,' he cried. "'She'd think a grosbeak was a depraved person with a large nose. "'She never dreamed that it was a black-robed lover with a breast of snow and a crimson heart. "'She don't care for hungry babies and potato bugs. "'I shall write that to father. He will find it exquisite.' Elnora deftly picked up a moth, pinned it, and placed its wings. She straightened the antennae, drew each leg into position, and set it in perfectly lifelike manner. As she lifted her work to see if she had it right, she glanced at Ammon. He was still frowning and hesitating over the paper. "'I dare you to let me dictate a couple of paragraphs,' she said. "'Done!' cried Ammon. "'Go slowly enough that I can write it.' Elnora laughed softly. "'I am writing this,' she began, "'in an old grape arbor in the country, near a log cabin where I had my dinner. "'From where I sit I can see directly into the house of the next-door neighbor on the west. "'His name is R. B. Grosbeek.' From all I have seen of him, he is a gentleman of the old school, the oldest school there is, no doubt. He always wears a black suit and cap and a white vest, decorated with one large red heart, which I think must be the emblem of some ancient order. I have been here a number of times, and I never have seen him wear anything else, or his wife appear in other than a brown dress with touches of white. It has appeared to me at times that she was a shade neglectful of her home duties, but he does not seem to see it that way. He cheerfully stays about the sitting room while she is away having a good time and sings as he cares for the four small children. I must tell you about his music. I'm sure he never saw inside a conservatory. I think he merely picked up what he knows by ear and without vocal training, but there is a tenderness in his tones, a depth of pure melody that I never have heard surpassed. It may be that I think more of his music than that of some other good vocalists hereabout, because I see more of him and appreciate his devotion to his home life. I just had an encounter with him at the west fence and induced him to carry a small gift to his children. When I see the perfect harmony in which he lives and the depth of content he and the brown lady find in life, I am almost persuaded to— Now this is going to be poetry, said Elnora. Move your pen over here and begin with a quote and a cap. Ammon's face had been an interesting study as he took down her sentences. Now he gravely set the pen where she indicated and Elnora dictated buy a nice little home in the country, and settle down there for life. That's the truth, cried Ammon. It's as big a temptation as I ever had. Go on. That's all, said Elnor. You can finish. The moths are done. I'm going hunting for whatever I can find for the grades. Wait a minute, begged Ammon. I'm going too. No, you stay with Mother and finish your letter. It is done. I couldn't add anything to that. All right, sign your name and come on. But I forget to tell you all the bargain. Maybe you won't send the letter when you hear that. The rest is that you show me the reply to my part of it. Oh, that's easy. I won't have the slightest objection to showing you the whole letter. He signed his name, folded the sheets, and slipped them into his pocket. Where are we going, and what do we take? Will you go, mother? asked Elnor. I have a little work that should be done, said Mrs. Comstock. Could you spare me? Where do you want to go? We will go down to Aunt Margaret's and see her a few minutes and get Billy. We will be back in time for supper. Mrs. Comstock smiled as she watched them down the road. What a splendid-looking pair of young creatures they were! How finely proportioned! How full of vitality! Then her face grew troubled as she saw them in earnest conversation. Just as she was wishing she had not trusted her precious girl with so much of a stranger, she saw Elnora stoop to lift a branch and peer under. 
The mother grew content. All Nora was thinking only of her work. She was to be trusted utterly. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of a Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, wherein the Limberlost sings for Ammon and the Talking Trees tell great secrets. A few days later, Ammon handed Elnora a sheet of paper, and she read, "In your condition, I should think the moth hunting and life at the cabin would be very good for you. But for any sake, keep away from that grosbeak person and don't come home with your head full of Granger ideas." No doubt he has a remarkable voice, but I can't bear untrained singers. And don't you get the idea that a June song is perennial? You are not hearing the music he will make when the four babies get the scarlet fever and the measles, and the catting wife leaves him at her home to care for them then. Poor soul, I pity her. How she exists where rampant cows bellow at you, frogs croak, mosquitoes consume you, the butter goes to oil in the summer and bricks in winter, while the pump freezes every day and there is no earthly amusement and no society. Poor things, can't you influence him to move? No wonder she gads when she has a chance. I should die. If you are thinking of settling in the country, think also of a woman who is satisfied with white and brown to accompany you. Brown, of old deadly colors. I should go mad in brown. Elnora laughed as she read. Her face was dimpling as she handed back the sheet. Who's ahead? she asked. Who do you think? he parried. She is, said Elnora. Are you going to tell her in your next that R. B. Grosbeak is a bird and that he probably will spend the winter in a wild plum thicket in Tennessee? No, said Ammon. I shall tell her that I understand her ideas of life perfectly, and of course I never shall ask her to deal with oily butter and frozen pumps and measly babies, interpolated Elnora. Exactly, said Ammon. Just the same, I find so much to counterbalance those things that I should not object to bearing them myself, in view of the recompense. Where do we go and what do we do today? We will have to wander along the roads and around the edge of the Limberlost today, said Elnora. Mother is making strawberry preserves and she can't come until she finishes. Suppose we go down to the swamp and I'll show you what is left of the flower room that Terenzo Moore, the big lumberman of Great Rapids, made when he was a homeless boy here. Of course you have heard the story. Yes, and I've met the O'Moores who are frequently in Chicago society. They have friends there. I think them one ideal couple. That sounds like they might be the only one or close to it, said Elnor, and indeed they are not. I know dozens. Aunt Margaret and Uncle Wesley are another, the Brown Lees another, and my mathematics professor and his wife. The world is full of happy people, but no one ever hears of them. You have to fight and make a scandal to get into the papers. No one knows about all the happy people. I am happy myself, and just look how perfectly inconspicuous I am. You only need go where you will be seen, began Ammon, when he remembered and finished. What do we take today? Ourselves, said Elnor. I have a vagabond streak in my blood, and it's in evidence. I'm going to show you where real flowers grow, real birds sing, and if I feel fright right about it, perhaps I shall raise a note or two myself. Oh, do you sing? asked Damon politely. At times, answered Elnor. As do the birds, because I must, but don't be scared. The mood does not possess me often. Perhaps I shan't raise a note when we get there. They went down the road to the swamp, climbed the snake fence, followed the path to the old trail, and then turned south along it. Elnora indicated to Ammon the trail with remnants of sagging barbed wire. It was ten years ago, she said. I was just a little schoolgirl, but I wandered widely even then, and no one cared. I saw him often. He had been in the city instruction all his life when he took the job of keeping timber thieves out of the swamp before many trees had been cut. It was strong man's work, and he was a frail boy, but he grew hardier as he lived out of doors. This trail we are on is the path his feet first wore in those days when he was insane with fear and eaten up with loneliness, but he stuck to his work and went out. I used to come down to the road and creep in among the bushes as far as I dared to watch him pass. He walked mostly. Sometimes he rode a wheel. Some days his face was dreadfully sad. Some days it was so determined a little child could see the force in it, and once it was radiant. That day the swamp angel was with him. I can't tell you what she was like. I never saw anyone who resembled her. He stopped near her to show her a bird's nest. Then they went on to a sort of flower room he had made, and he sang for her. By the time he left, I had gotten bold enough to come out on the trail, and I met the big Scotchman Freckles lived with. He saw me catching moths and butterflies, so he took me to the flower room and gave me everything there. 
I don't dare come alone often, and so I can't keep it up as he did, but you can see something of how it was. El Nora led the way and Ammon followed. The outlines of the room were not distinct because many of the trees were gone, but El Nora showed how it had been as nearly as she could. The swamp is almost ruined now, she said. The maples, walnuts, and cherries are all gone. The talking trees are the only things left worth while. The talking trees? I don't understand, commented Ammon. No wonder, laughed Elnor. They are my discovery. You know, all trees whisper and talk during the summer, but there are two that have so much to say they keep on the whole winter when the others are silent. The beeches and oaks so love to talk they cling to their dead, dry leaves. In the winter the winds are stiffest and blow most, so these trees whisper, chatter, sob, laugh, and at times roar until the sound is deafening. They never cease until new leaves come out in the spring to push off the old ones. I love to stand beneath them with my ear to the great trunks, interpreting what they say to fit my moods. The beeches branch low and their leaves are small, so they only know common earthly things. But the oaks run straight above almost all other trees before they branch. Their arms are mighty, their leaves large. They meet the winds that travel around the globe and from them learn the big things. Ammon studied the girl's face. What do the beeches tell you, Elnor? he asked gently. To be patient to be unselfish, to do unto others as I would have them do to me. And the oaks? They say, be true, live a clean life, send your soul up here and let the winds of the world teach you what honor achieves. Wonderful secrets, those, marveled Ammon. Are they telling them now? Could I hear? No, they are only gossiping now. This is playtime. They tell the big secrets to a white world when the music inspires them. The music? All of the trees are harps in the winter. Their trunks are the frames, their branches the strings, the winds the musicians. When the air is cold and clear, the world very white and the harp music swelling, then the talking trees tell the strengthening, uplifting things. You wonderful girl, cried Ammon. What a woman you will be. If I am a woman at all worth while, it will be because I have had such wonderful opportunities, said Elnor. Not every girl is driven to the forest to learn what God has to say there. Here are the remains of Freckles' room. The time the angel came here, he sang to her, and I listened. I never heard music like that. No wonder she loved him. Everyone who knew him did, and they do yet. Try that log. It makes a fairly good seat. This old store box was this treasure house, just as it's now mine. I will show you my dearest possession. I do not dare take it home because Mother can't overcome her dislike for it. It was my father's, and in some ways I am like him. This is the strongest." Elnora lifted the violin and began to play. She wore a school dress of green gingham, with the sleeves rolled to the elbows. She seemed to part the setting all around her. Her head shone like a small dark sun, and her face never had seemed so rose-fleshed and fair. From the instant she drew the bow, her lips parted, and her eyes fastened on something far away in the swamp, and never did she give more of that impression of feeling for her notes and repeating something audible only to her. Ammon was too near to get the best effect. He arose and stepped back several yards, leaning against a large tree, looking and listening with all his soul. As he changed position, he saw that Mrs. Comstock had followed them, and was standing on the trail, where she could not have helped hearing everything Elnora had said. So to Ammon before her, and the mother watching on the trail, Elnora played the song of the Limberlost. It seemed as if the swamp hushed all its other voices, and spoke only through her dancing bow. The mother out on the trail and heard it all once before from the girl, many times from her father. To the man it was a revelation. He stood so stunned he forgot Mrs. Comstock. He tried to realize what a great city audience would say to that music from such a player, with a like background, and he could not imagine. He was wondering what he dared say, how much he might express, when the last note fell and the girl laid the violin in the case, closed the door, locked it, and hid the key in the rotting wood at the end of a log. Then she came to him. Ammon stood looking at her curiously. "'I wonder,' he said, "'what people would say to that.' "'I did it in public once,' said Elnor. "'I think they liked it fairly well. "'I had a note yesterday offering me the leadership of the high school orchestra in Onabasha. "'I can take it as well as not. "'None of my talks to the grades come the first thing in the morning. "'I can play a few minutes in the orchestra and reach the rooms in plenty of time. "'It will be more work than I love and like finding the money.' I would gladly pay for nothing just to be able to express myself. With some people it makes a regular battlefield of the human heart, the struggle for self-expression, said Amon. You are going to do beautiful work in the world and do it well. 
When I realized that your violin belonged to your father, that he played it before you were born, and it no doubt affected your mother strongly, and then coupled with that the years you have roamed these fields and swamps finding in nature all you had to lavish your great heart upon, I can see how you evolved. I understand what you mean by self-expression. I know something of what you have to express. The world never so wanted your message as it does now. It is hungry for the things you know. I can see easily how your position came to you. What you have to give is taught in no college. I am not sure, but you would spoil yourself if you try to run your mind through a set groove with hundreds of others. I never thought I should say such a thing to anyone, but I do say to you, and I honestly believe it. Give up the college idea. Your mind does not need that sort of development. It is far past it. Stick close to your work in the woods. You are getting so infinitely greater on it than the best college student I ever knew, that there is no comparison. When you have money to spend, take that violin and go to one of the world's greatest masters and let the Limberlost sing to him. If he thinks you can improve it, very well. I have my doubts. Do you really mean that you would give up all idea of going to college if you were me? I really mean it, said Ammon. If I now held the money to send you in my hands and could give it to you in some way you would accept, I would tear it up and throw it away first. I do not know why it is the lot of the world always to want something different from what life gives them. If you only could realize it, my girl, you are in college and have been always. You are in the school of experience and has taught you to think and given you a heart. God knows I envy the man who wins it. You have been in the college of the Limberlost all your life, and I never met a graduate from any other institution who could begin to compare with you in sanity, clarity, and interesting knowledge. I wouldn't even advise you to read too many books on your lines. You get your stuff firsthand, and you know that you are right. What you should do is to begin early to practice self-expression. Don't wait too long to tell us about the woods as you know them. Follow the course of the bird woman, you mean, asked Elnor. In your own way, with your own light, she won't live forever. You are younger, and you will be ready to begin where she ends. The swamp has given you all you need so far. Now you give it to the world in payment. College be confounded. Go to work and show people what there is in you. Not until then did he remember that Mrs. Comstock was somewhere very near. Should we go out to the trail and see if your mother is coming? he asked. Here she is now, said Elnor. Gracious, it's a mercy I got that violin put away in time. I didn't expect you so soon, whispered the girl as she turned and went toward her mother. Mrs. Comstock's face was a study as she looked at Elnora. I forgot that you were making some preserves and they didn't require much cooking, she said. We should have waited for you. Not at all, answered Mrs. Comstock. Have you found anything yet? Nothing that I can show you, said Elnora. I am not sure, but I found an idea that will revolutionize the whole course of my work, thought, and ambitions. "'Ambitions! My, what a hefty word!' laughed Mrs. Comstock. "'Now who would suspect a little red-haired country girl of harboring such a deadly germ in her body? "'Can you tell Mother about it?' "'Not if you talk to me that way, I can't,' said Elnora. "'Well, I guess we better let ambition lie. I've always heard it was safest to sleep. "'If you ever get a bona fide attack, it will be time to attend it. "'Let's hunt specimens. It is June. Philip and I are in the grades.' You have an hour to put an idea into our heads that will stick for a lifetime and grow for good. That's the way I look at your job. Now what are you going to give us? We don't want any old silly stuff that's been hashed over and over. We want a big new idea to plant in our hearts. Come on, Miss Teacher, what is the boiled down, double distilled essence of June? Give it to us strong. We are large enough to furnish it developing ground. Hurry up, time is short and we are waiting. What is the miracle of June? What one thing epitomizes the whole month and makes it just a little different from any other? The birth of these big night moths, said Elnora promptly. Ammon clapped his hands. The tears started in Mrs. Comstock's eyes. She took Elnora in her arms and kissed her forehead. You'll do, she said. June is June, not because it has bloom, bird, fruit, or flower exclusive to it alone. It's half May and half July in all of them. But as I figure it, it's just June when it comes to these great velvet-winged night moths which sweep its moonlit skies, consummating their scheme of creation and dropping like a bloomed-out flower. Give them moths for June. Then make that the basis of your year's work. Find the distinctive feature of each month, the one thing which marks it a time apart, and hit them squarely between the eyes with it. Even the babies of the lowest grades can comprehend moths when they see a few emerge and learn their history as it can be lived before them. You should show your specimens in pairs, then their eggs, the growing caterpillars, and then the cocoons. You want to dig out the red heart of every month in the year and hold it pulsing before them. I can't name all of them offhand, but I think of one more right now. February belongs to our winter birds. It is then the great horned owl, the swamp courts his mate, the big hawks pair, and even the crows begin to take notice. 
These are truly our birds. Like the poor, we have them always with us. You should hear the musicians of the swamp in February, Philip, on a mellow night. Oh, but they are in earnest. For twenty-one years I've listened by night to the great owls, all the smaller sizes, the foxes, coons, and every resident left in these woods, and by day to the hawks, yellow hammers, sapsuckers, titmice, crows, and all our winter birds. Only just now it's come to me that the distinctive feature of February is not linen bleaching nor sugar making, it's the love month of our very own birds. Give them hawks and owls for February, Elnora. The girl looked at Ammon with flashing eyes. How's that, she said. Don't you think I will make it with such help? You should hear the concert she is talking about. It is simply indescribable when the ground is covered with snow and the moonlight white. It's about the best music we have, said Mrs. Comstock. I just wonder if you couldn't copy that alone and make a strong original piece out of it for your violin, Elnora. There was one tense breath, then. I could try, said Elnora simply. Ammon rushed to the rescue. We must go to work, he said, and began examining a walnut branch for Luna moth eggs. Elnora joined him while Mrs. Comstock drew her embroidery from her pocket and sat on the log. She said she was tired. They could come for her when they were ready to go. She could hear their voices all around her until she called them at supper time. When they came to her, she stood waiting on the trail, the sewing in one hand, the violin in the other. Elnora became very white, but took the trail without a word. Ammon, unable to see a woman carry a heavier load than he, reached for the instrument. Mrs. Comstock shook her head. She carried the violin home, took it into her room, and closed the door. Elnora turned to Ammon. "'If she destroys that, I will die,' cried the girl. "'She won't,' said Ammon. "'You misunderstand her. She wouldn't have said what she did about the owls if she had meant to. She is your mother. No one loves you as she does. Trust her. Myself, I think she's simply great.' Mrs. Comstock returned with serene face and all of them helped with the supper. When it was over, Ammon and Elnor sorted and classified the afternoon specimens and made a trip to the woods to paint and light several trees for moths. When they came back, Mrs. Comstock sat in the arbor and they joined her. The moonlight was so intense, print could have been read by it. The damp night air held odors near to earth, making flower and tree perfume strong. A thousand insects were serenading, and in the maple the grosbeak occasionally sent a reassuring word to his wife, while she answered that all was well. A whippoorwill wailed in the swamp, and back by the blue-bordered pool, a chat complained disconsolately. Mrs. Comstock went into the cabin, but she returned almost instantly, laying the violin and bow across Elnora's lap. "'I wish you would give us a little music,' she said. End of chapter 16